Uncharted. It is one of my favorite franchises in all of gaming, so much so that I've spent two years playing through all of the games and making ridiculously comprehensive videos, breaking them all down. This video is the culmination of all of that work. Two years, five major releases in the franchise, and over eight hours of content, all collected here for your viewing pleasure. I've included timestamps in the description box below so you can jump around to whatever games you need to if you see fit. And the whole thing is also available for free on every major podcasting platform. You can even download the MP3 straight to your phone off of SoundCloud if you prefer. Links below. I just wanna say thank you to absolutely everybody for making this possible. I am living my dream, doing my dream job, and it wouldn't be possible without viewers like you, great sponsors that are willing to work with me and my crazy schedule and patrons who are very, very generous and want to support me more directly. The last thing I have to say before we get into it is if you have any ideas or suggestions for which franchise we should tackle next, please leave that in the comment section below. I would love to hear what you would like me to go after next because I will have a lot more time on my hands after this video goes live. And with that, we're gonna get into it. But first, I wanna say a big thank you to our sponsor, Salad. Salad is the groundbreaking technology company that's making sure your computer does work for you, whether you're AFK or not. Basically how it works is you'll download Salad onto your computer, and whenever you go AFK for a predetermined amount of time, Salad will use your computer hardware to solve complex complex equations that earn you rewards without having to do anything on your end. You can earn everything from gift cards to Amazon or GameStop or even directly redeem games from Steam. Now Salad has actually been a sponsor before and I've been using their services ever since. So much so that I was even able to pay for a copy of God of War on PC with credits I earned through the app. And I know this type of thing sounds a little bit sketchy and perhaps suspicious and Salad completely understands. All of their source code is completely open source for you to go and peruse if you see fit. And in addition to being a business partner of Discord, they also have phenomenal ratings on Trustpilot. So you don't have to just take my word for it, you can do your own homework. And Salad encourages you to do so. Check them out today at the link in the video description box below and use promo code LUKE2 so they know I sent you. Uncharted marked a huge shift for Naughty Dog. In my estimation, it was their first foray into what could be deemed as adult entertainment. Not that kind of adult entertainment, the like actual meaning of the word, like entertainment for adults. That's not better, is it? Point being, the goal was to appeal to people over the age of 18 primarily, or at the very least, teenagers and up. They weren't trying to make kids games or preteen games. They were trying to make games that appealed to more mature audiences. Its goal was to tell a more mature story with darker themes, romance, wit, and even comedy. Cut to the chase, would you? <sighs> Man only interested in the climax. He must be a real hit with the ladies. Never had any complaints. All told, the game was... Okay, it was clearly a new thing for the team, and despite their best efforts, there were a lot of problems. However, as I'm sure you know by now, Naughty Dog eventually figured it out and were able to put out some of the most critically acclaimed titles ever released under the banner of Uncharted. I don't know why I'm such a big fan of finger quotes today, but I... I guess that's the thing we're doing now. Now this video is the first in a series of critiques I'm going to be doing on the series. We're gonna start at the first game, work all the way up through The Lost Legacy. This is one of my favorite franchises that's ever been released by any developer, ever. As a result, I have a lot of personal opinions about the franchise that I think I can back up and defend. But as always, I'm totally open to hearing whatever your thoughts are down in the comment section below. So yes, we're going to be going through Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Among Thieves, Drake's Deception, A Thief's End, and lastly, we're gonna wrap up with The Lost Legacy, an Uncharted game that released as a standalone title, but everyone seems to either forget or try to actively bury even Naughty Dog and their creative director, Neil Druckmann. But that's all beside the point. That's something we'll talk about when we get to that game 
whenever we get to it. And lastly, I'm sure it goes without saying, but I'm going to be spoiling pretty much every single thing about all of the games in each of the subsequent videos. So if you haven't played Uncharted Drake's Fortune, make sure to play that before you watch this, because I'm going to be going through the whole thing, the whole story, all the gameplay, everything. But with our obligatory spoiler warning out of the way, we're down to get started. So let's do it. Do you have any Parting words, villain Trenton Mirth, or should we just get into it? No? No? You're good? Good. He's my new bearded dragon. His name is Villain Trenton Mirth. You can call him Vil or V. It really doesn't matter. Anyway, he's going to be joining us throughout these videos, so I guess get used to him. To begin, I think that this game is a product of its time. It's big, bold, and filled with zombie Nazis. It doesn't take itself very seriously at all, which is actually probably a good thing given its story's content. The concept was pretty simple. They wanted to tell an action-adventure story with likable characters who have interesting interpersonal relationships. And to be honest, it's actually such a bland description that it can apply to pretty much any Naughty Dog title from the last 10 to 15 years. I say almost any Naughty Dog title from the last 10 to 15 years because Lost Legacy exists, which if you don't follow me on Twitter or Instagram, by the way, you should do that. You might not know that I, uh, I, d I don't like Lost Legacy at all. I think it's it's rubbish. But again, we'll get to that. And I think it's important to state this because this is the foundation upon which Naughty Dog is building the game. They're not building it off of a really interesting or unique gameplay system or off of some sort of intense narrative idea. They're building it off of the hope that it's a lighthearted action adventure popcorn flick style thing. It's not supposed to be hugely emotionally taxing. It's not supposed to make you rack your brain trying to solve puzzles and things. It's pretty light and easy to consume. And to be honest, it's pretty obvious that this is the starting point because the second you start to play Uncharted, you'll realize that it doesn't do anything particularly well except for the story, the graphics, the animations, and attention to detail, which in and of themselves are accomplishments that very few studios are able to pull off and, and do well. So that's good, but it means that the gameplay is severely lacking, which is something you'll see the second I start showing you footage. How about right now? It's a basic third-person cover-based shooter with some scarce puzzles and a lot of arenas. This was something that was really big back in 2007, 8, and 9, where you'd have a third-person shooter and developers were basically like, eh, well, we'll just throw you in a room and keep dropping enemies in and that'll be the game. No need for anything else, we're done here. And it's something that used to be acceptable. It's something that a lot of different companies did all over the industry, but in 2020, it looks pretty lazy. Now the combat isn't great, but it serves the purpose of what they're trying to do, which is basically to pad out game time, give you space between narrative sections. Unfortunately, Naughty Dog sort of runs out of ideas later on in the game, and they end up literally throwing zombie Nazis at you. The reality is that the story is, and even at the time was, grossly outdated, as we'll discuss in just a moment in more detail. Furthermore, the gameplay is also highly repetitive. Despite what Greg Miller said back at the time, this game has zero replay value as far as I'm concerned. But the thing about Uncharted is there's excellent, amazing replay value here. If anything, there's very little play value in 2020. In fact, I'm sure many of you who are watching this right now are watching this because you don't want to bother playing through the six or so hour campaign because it just it hasn't aged well. So you might as well get the Uncharted scratch here, get it explained, analyzed, so you can form your own opinions given the data without having to subject yourselves to grossly outdated gameplay systems, graphics, writing that's pretty cringy. Need I go on? And I don't think you're wrong to do that, by the way. I think if you're gonna start with Uncharted, you should probably watch a video like this, get the first game out of the way, and start at Uncharted 2. The reason is because Uncharted 2 is a mile ahead of this first game. They really took the burner, turned the knob all the way up, and then ripped it off. They did a phenomenal job with it, which is why I'm so excited to talk about it. Again, subscribe if you wanna get notified of when that comes out. Now at the time, I'm sure that this game was groundbreaking and majestic in every way possible, but right now, heading into the next generation of gaming consoles and amazing technology, we've frankly outgrown it, and I don't see a problem with 
people absorbing its story, its message, its design passively through a medium such as a video, as opposed to playing it yourself. But what exactly is this game even about? Well, sit back, we're gonna break it down, go through the whole thing. Now, as I said before, the goal of this game was to be an action flick. It was supposed to be lighthearted and easy to consume. After all, the main inspiration, according to the developers, were things such as Indiana Jones, National Treasure, and Tomb Raider. And the first game is actually a pretty even split across all of these. You can see that they were trying on all sorts of different hats and seeing what worked. And by the time they got to the second and third games, they really got into their groove and knew what they were gonna do for the games moving on. The opening scene of the game confirms this. There's some light jokes and jabs, and it's all pretty fun, nothing particularly hilarious, but it sets the tone. Immediately after this, a gunfight breaks out. Apparently pirates are storming the ship, and Nate seems very used to this. He doesn't really freak out at all. And because of this total lack of panic on Nate's part, you can infer as the viewer that he's done this before. This is not a new occurrence. He's used to dangerous situations and he seems adequately capable of dealing with them. However, there are a few implications to this that you have to consider at the outset. Either he's totally insane and a murderous psychopath, he's killed so many pirates that he's totally desensitized to it, or we're not supposed to think about it at all and rather just enjoy the ride. And I think that the latter is probably the case. It's the same debate that's been had time and time again over something called ludonarrative dissonance, which is a term that was coined in a paper a few years back. Basically, the idea behind it is that there's a character who in cutscenes is a very loving, caring individual who's supposed to be the good guy, and then in gameplay sequences, he's massacring hundreds or thousands of people seemingly without any remorse at all. The question is, how do you resolve these two dichotomies, these two polar opposite things, into a cohesive character. For many people, they aren't really able to do that. They just have to sort of compartmentalize everything. This is the gameplay sequence, and then the cutscenes are where you actually see how people work, what their true nature is. It's an interesting discussion, but I think at the end of the day, the developers are counting on you just sort of passing it from one ear out the other. Don't think about it too much because again, it's it's a video game, you know? It's the classic excuse. If something ridiculous happens in a movie and you start to get upset that that doesn't make any sense and then the person sitting next to you just whispers over, it's just a movie. It's the same exact thing. It's the get out of jail free card that lazy writers have been using for decades. I get it, I understand why, but it's something that I hope to see Naughty Dog actively take steps to resolving in future titles because it does really start to butt heads with the character development that they're trying to put forward. And you'll see this the more we break down this game and analyze it, critique it throughout this video, and even in future videos when we go through the rest of the series, these games are not built in a way where they can withstand immense pressure being placed upon them. They're meant to be lighthearted, and as a result, if you try to inflict any sort of literary pressure or anything, analytical pressure, they collapse instantly. It's like trying to do a literary analysis of Barney. It just doesn't work because it wasn't written or created to be analyzed in that way. But the point is that in my estimation, you're supposed to take everything that this game throws at you with a grain of salt the size of a cantaloupe. And the brilliant thing is that this does get Naughty Dog out of a lot of critical trouble because they can always just revert back to this excuse. Do you have an issue with zombie Nazis coming out of nowhere in the third act of the game? Well, don't worry about it. It's a cheesy action flick get over it. Do you not like Nate killing hundreds of pirates in just six to eight hours of gameplay time to get some treasure that he doesn't actually end up keeping? Well, it's just a game. Stop whining. See, it can kind of be used for everything, but there are some problems I don't think it excuses. A lot of them in the form of gameplay, but don't worry, we're gonna get to that in just a bit. So the game starts with Nathan Drake, a self-described treasure hunter pulling a coffin from the ocean. It's supposed to house the remains of Sir Francis Drake, who is Nate's namesake. However, inside there is no body, but instead there's a diary describing the location of El Dorado. And in case you don't know, El Dorado is basically just a generic term that translates directly to the golden one. It's been used to describe everything from the city of gold to a king who had a gold throne to a gold statue. It, it can really mean almost anything that is gold and is singular. 
Now, after finding this diary, pirates attack Nate and Elena, as we discussed earlier. Now, Elena is the reporter and journalist that's with Nathan in this moment. She's filming a piece for some report. Who knows? They don't ever really go into it in much detail. What we know is that she's a majournalist, and that's what she's doing, because my journalism. Now this sequence serves as the game's combat tutorial and it introduces you to the one type of shooting and level design that this game will use from start to finish, arena cover shootouts. It works okay, but playing nowadays you'll notice immediately that we've come a long way. From all of the reviews from the time, however, apparently this was actually pretty good as far as shooting systems went. It was par for the course, in other words. Now after a while, you're rescued by Sully, who seems to be a close friend of Nate's. Immediately we get the vibe that Sully is the one that's seeking the treasure for the sake of the monetary award, while Nate is in it for the reward of following Francis Drake's trail. It's an interesting pairing of motivations, something that's echoed directly in Uncharted 4 between Sam and Nate, but in this first game, not much is said. There are some small arguments here and there, but everything is resolved before it grows into real conflict. And this is something that switches in the later games to a certain extent, but we'll discuss that in later critiques. Again, like I've said before, blah, 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 subscribe for blah, blah, blah. Now, after escaping, Sully and Nate drop off Elena on a small island before heading off to pursue the treasure by following the diary's instructions, abandoning her, leaving her with no way to find them. But if you've played any Uncharted game before, you know that she will magically and somehow make a reappearance shortly. I just paused to check the script. Look, look at Vil. What are you doing? He's just running back and forth in the background of the video. He's meant for the camera. He just wants to get on camera. That's what it is. Attention hog. After this, Nate and Sully find out that El Dorado is not actually a city of gold or anything close. It's actually far more underwhelming. Instead, it's a large idol that's covered in gold and diamonds. And this is actually something they're going to do a lot in the series. They talk about this massive treasure, and it's pretty much always remarkably underwhelming across the board. The only real exception to this could be the treasure in Uncharted 4, but we'll get to it. After a bunch of platforming and exploration with our old buddy and pal Sully, I almost said Sally, <laughs> Nate and Sully come across a U-boat, and it's been landlocked somehow and is actually really impressive. It's the first truly memorable set piece of the series as far as I'm concerned. This picture has been permanently ingrained in my mind as I'm sure it is in many people's minds who played it at launch. And I gotta say Naughty Dog is really good at this. They design these beautiful vistas that don't look like they should be possible with current technology but they always manage to pull it off and this will not be the only time that this happens in this game. Considering that they released this game in 2000 seven for the PS3, it's really damn impressive how far they're able to come throughout the generation. I mean, bear in mind, The Last of Us released on the exact same hardware that this game is releasing on. That's silly. But all that is beside the point. Nate decides to explore the U-boat, and Naughty Dog shows off some really impressive animation and scripting during this sequence. Eventually, Nate makes it back out after accidentally setting off several torpedoes and after finding a map that they're going to use to further narrow down the treasure's location. Again, this is all pretty par for the course as far as action, adventure, movies, and stories are concerned. And then, because this is an action flick, the bad guy shows up. He's a self-titled bad boy Gabriel Roman, and he's holding soul hostage with several grunts and his lieutenant, Atak Navarro, which apparently has some previous relationship with Sully and Nate, but again, it's never really explained. Now, because he's so bad for my bad guy reasons, he decides that he's going to pull a gun out and because there's nothing else to do, shoot Sully in the chest at almost point blank range. And this sets up the first instance of Naughty Dog's non-committal writing that we're gonna see time and time again throughout the course of this franchise. More on this a little bit later. Just remember that Sully, an old man, was just shot point blank in the chest while wearing what is effectively a Hawaiian shirt. Remember that. Now, despite this, Nate escapes, and we head to another island that's been outlined in the map and diary that we've obtained up to this point. And here, Naughty Dog pairs Nate back with Elena, who has rediscovered him somehow. 
Again, they do this time and time again in all of these games. Elena gets separated somehow or isn't participating and then magically makes a reappearance. And I don't actually have a problem with this. I really like Elena, to be perfectly honest, as a character. I think she's well-performed, well-written, et cetera, et cetera. Compliments. My point is that when she comes out of nowhere for seemingly no reason, it really does come off to the player as though they're just pulling her, placing her here because they need somebody to pair off with Nate. I get it. I understand it. I think it's necessary because in these games, you'll notice that Nate is almost always paired with somebody else. This allows him to have banter back and forth with them, to talk with each other. That builds the characters. It helps with the more complicated puzzles and things. It works across the board. It's a good thing. But sometimes they're kind of lazy with how they justify those other characters arriving. Now, once they've reconnected, Elena insists on completing her journalism project. And Nate insists on the contract to continuing the pursuit of the treasure. And eventually they realize that this actually could work in tandem. She could document him going after the treasure. It helps both people. Furthermore, you would expect Nate to feel extreme guilt or sadness over the death of Sully, his effective business partner, somebody who's apparently known since he was very, very young. That's all we've been told at this point in the story but they don't really address it very much. They have a couple lines where he throws off sort of a, a sad memory of Sully and then they go about their business. I would have expected at least a dedicated scene where they pontificate and elaborate on Nate's inner feelings about the loss of Sully, somebody who was very close with who just got murdered in front of him. But again, this is Naughty Dog's first foray. You wouldn't expect them to nail it on their first attempt out. But I can guarantee you if this game were remade today, there would be a sequence like that. Now they decide to fly to this new island, but once they get close, some random mercenaries who are employed by Gabriel Roman decide to start shooting the plane down because that's a rational response. Now this also bears the question, if you are flying into what you thought was a pretty desolate island in a plane, and then you start getting attacked with anti-aircraft missiles and mortar fire, you would assume that a rational human being would look at that and say, hmm, I might be outnumbered here. This might be a bad idea even if I need to search for some little idol that's gonna be worth a lot of money, maybe I should come back with reinforcements because clearly I'm outnumbered. Not Nathan Drake. After all of these shots come in, he decides to parachute out of the plane with Elena. The plane blows up and they are left separated and stranded. I, I, yeah. But again, if you have a problem with this sort of hyper irrational decision making that Nate is employing, you can always just say, well, it's a video game or eh, it's supposed to be an action flick. Again, you can just swat it off like a bug. It doesn't matter. Just uh, don't think about it that much. It's just play the game. Just play the game. You can do it with pretty much anything. Now, after they've bailed from the plane, this is the first time in the game when Nate is alone and when the player is free from another NPC. And unfortunately, this is where the game starts to crumble under its own weight. And it's because Naughty Dog didn't really have a lot by way of gameplay systems to hold up these big gaps between narrative beats. All they really have are shooting galleries and some light puzzles. Guess what? These suck. They suck now, and in my opinion, they sucked just as much in 2007. Most critics, well, everyone except Greg Miller, saw this and criticized the game for it. The combat was so damn repetitive that it sucks out any replay value and makes it a trudge to finish. Reviewers in general liked these shooting galleries when they were paired with the narrative they thought altogether it was a cohesive package. But as a standalone, the fighting and the gunplay was almost universally panned, or at the very least referred to as painfully average. Don't take my word for it. Look up the reviews yourself. You can go back in the Way Way Back machine. You can look it up. It's usually even still on GameSpot, IGN's websites. This was not considered great even at the time, except for a few separate reviewers. So we fight through a bunch of arenas and solve some puzzles. Eventually we find Elena, and while moving to a new location yet again, we find out that Sully is still alive. Don't forget to stop on the dock. And... Hello. He's alive. Her. Yeah, somehow he survived the gunshot 
point blank to his chest while wearing a Hawaiian shirt and being a septuagenarian. Okay, maybe he's not actually that old, but at the very least he's in his 50s or 60s. This is an older gentleman who just took a bullet point blank to the chest in a Hawaiian shirt. I, I don't care how he survived or what the explanation is. Even wearing a bulletproof vest that's been known to trigger heart attacks or even other health issues because it's such a severe force. I don't feel like I need to justify that. I find that kind of ridiculous, a little far-fetched that he survived it. Whatever, it's a coincidence. Again, it's a lighthearted action flick. Don't think about it, right? What's even more infuriating about it is that we find out later that he was saved when the bullet hit a small book in his pocket. But Nate doesn't know this at the time, and as far as he can tell, it looks like Sully is helping the bad guys. So as far as he's thinking, it might be that Sully was shot with a fake bullet to fake Nate out, get him to lead them to the next location, at which point Sully is going to help them get the rest of the way there. We find out later that Sully survived by the way of this old book that was in his pocket that somehow made him impervious to bullets, and now Sully is trying to slow down the bad guys so Nate has time to find the treasure before they do. And this is another trope of action movies. I don't know if you've noticed it before, but the bad guy is always incompetent and incapable of finding the treasure by himself. He always needs the good guy to help him find it. Why can't we have an action flick or a game where the bad guy is the one that's way better at finding the treasure than the good guys and the good guys are having to try to steal the secrets and knowledge of the bad guys to find it. Even in something like Uncharted 4, Raish is going through and basically just blowing up everything instead of actually looking for it in a tactful manner. Or even in Uncharted The Lost Legacy, you have Nadine and Chloe looking for the treasure and the bad guys are following them and trying to cut them off before they can get to it. In some cases, the bad guys are ahead of the curve, but usually not. Regardless, it's all beside the point. After this bit, there's a car sequence that was really impressive for the time. Tons of data is streaming in and out of here. It's actually pretty insane that Naughty Dog was able to get this working this well back in 2007, and they deserve all the praise they received for it. After this, there are a few hours of platforming, a few puzzles, and a ton of arenas, yet again. Seriously, I know I just said it, but trying to play through this game in one session is miserable. It gets so damn repetitive, it's ridiculous. I mean, all of the locations look alike. The enemies are painfully dumb. The shooting mechanics feel like you're using water guns. It gets so old, so fast. Eventually, you find the body of Captain Drake, realizing that he died on the island while searching for the treasure or doing something with the treasure. You gotta love coincidences, right? Then we see a bunch of zombies. Yeah, I know that they're not called that, but I mean, come on, these are zombies. So you fight your way out of the bunker and push off all of the zombies while fighting through yet more arenas. Little bigger arenas, I grant you, and the zombies have different movesets that are a little bit more aggressive, which shakes it up, makes it a little more interesting, but still, they're just arenas. Nate and Elena eventually end up in a Nazi bunker because this is 2007 and every bad guy is a Nazi. And it's at this point that you find out that Nazi leadership was actually looking for the treasure itself, but they found out that the statue was cursed in some mysterious way, which caused them to turn into these zombie creatures. And this is actually why Sir Francis Drake died on the island. He was trying to keep the idol here to save thousands of innocent lives. Sir Francis Drake destroyed all of the ships that could have been used to remove the idol from the island and eventually even flooded the city itself wherein it was contained to prevent it from leaving. But because bad guys never learn, Roman, our resident bad boy doing bad stuff for my bad reasons because he's still a bad guy, is going to try and take it himself. Now, at this point, I think I should clarify that I don't inherently have a problem with supernatural elements in action stories. In fact, I think that often supernatural elements can make the story more interesting if done correctly. Hell, look at the latest Batman games from Rocksteady. Almost all of the villains and even some of the heroes in that franchise, in the stories, the comics, and the games, possess what could be defined as supernatural characteristics. Does that make the characters less relatable or the story less interesting? Absolutely not. 
In that case, I think that it actually enhances the story, the gameplay, and even the experience more generally. My problem with Uncharted Drake's fortune is that Naughty Dog chickened out at the last minute, instead of committing to an ancient curse that changes Nazis into zombies that crawl around on all fours, they decided to back out and explain it away in a naturalistic manner. And the reason that I have a problem with this is because it makes both explanations seem half-assed. What I'm referring to is that at the end of the game, Navarro is able to trick Roman into opening the sarcophagus that's described as the treasure. Put aside how underwhelming this treasure seems to be, Roman opens the sarcophagus, which to me seems pretty clearly a sarcophagus, even though this is meant to be some sort of grand reveal, and upon its opening, Roman is overcome with a mummified corpse that's contained within. You see, this mummy is infected with some sort of virus, and this virus is what's turning all of these people into these terrifying creatures. Navarro quickly takes the helm, kills Roman, assumes command of all of the mercenaries, and takes off with the sarcophagus, and the mummy contained inside to sell it as a biological weapon on the black market. Because again, my bad guys do my bad guy stuff. Why any bad guy or morally deficient human being would feel the need to do this, I don't know. This type of plotline has been used in many action movies before. It's like bad guys think that they're immune to the virus they're transporting and attempting to sell. I, I really don't know why the writers of these stories are unable to craft a villain that's even slightly concerned about the potential devastation that something like this could inflict in society. Seriously, why can't we have a bad guy that's just interested in the money but actually does care about killing innocent people? Why do they have to be both apathetic to human life and the value of it and also totally obsessed with the biggest paycheck possible? I think it'd be way more interesting to have a bad guy who's primarily interested in getting money for this terrifying virus, but also doesn't want strangers or innocent people to die as a result of it. I think that could be an interesting thing to put those two in conflict, but for whatever reason, nobody ever seems to take those steps. After all, to me, the most interesting villains are the ones with which you can agree, at least to some extent. If a story is written properly, in my estimation, the viewer should be unsure of which side to take. I've said it many times before, conflict is the heart of entertainment itself. To me, the height of entertainment is when order overcomes chaos, or more specifically, when some activity or character walks the thin line between chaos and order. Now, in the context of Drake's fortune, when a bad guy is doing bad things for bad reasons, it's painfully monochromatic. There's no tempering of chaos here. This is one-sided entirely. Bad guy wants to do a bad thing because he's bad and wants money because he's bad. It's a tired trope that makes its way through not just video games, but also novels, films, and popular culture more broadly. I accept that money is a motivating factor for many people, even most, but in the context of a story, that being the only motivation or driving factor for anyone's choices is lazy. People are more complicated than that. Even the most greedy capitalist scum bag you could possibly think of has other motivations, whether it's power, getting back at a girlfriend who dumped them in high school, proving to their dad that they're actually worth being loved and receiving admiration, anything. To rest on the laurels of greed and greed alone is, in my mind, the height of laziness in writing. And so, while I would like to say that Naughty Dog sticks the landing in Drake's fortune, they really don't. They end with a fake out of villains swapping one out for the other and justifying that mutiny with a poorly thought through double cross. Navarro rides the helicopter carrying the statue to a ship just offshore that's waiting to take him off of the island. After a short gunfight and yet another arena, Nathan sends the idol into the ocean with Navarro caught in the rope dragging him to the bottom of the sea. Sully shows up out of nowhere and takes Elena and Nate off of the island with several large chests of treasure at their disposal to fund whatever adventure comes next. And that's it. That's the whole game. 
Now for their first foray into the action adventure genre, I think it's actually a pretty impressive attempt, despite all of the issues. And it's also important to remember the context of the times. In 2007, while most of us, it might seem like it was yesterday, it was actually a long time ago. The Xbox 360 and PS3 had just launched and were less than a year old. George Bush was still president and American Idol was at the top of the TV charts. Video games have changed a lot since then. They're much more cinematic now, and they demand much better writing than we received back in the late 2000s. Most of that has been driven, actually, by Naughty Dog themselves. And I think that's the legacy of Drake's fortune. It laid the foundation for what was to come, and what was to come were some of the most impressively interactive and engrossing video game narratives, performances, and presentations that the world had ever seen. There are a lot of problems with this Uncharted game. There really are. Most of them gameplay related. They try to salvage it with some extra little things where you can collect little trinkets that you find hidden in crannies of levels, or they try to have secret dialogue options if you're standing in certain locations. But all told, the game is what it is. I think they laid a phenomenal foundation, and seeing what came out of that foundation in the form of Uncharted 2, I think shows just how much they learned while working on this game. Even as impressive as it was, the first Uncharted game was merely a proof of concept. The sequel is where the franchise actually gets off to a running start and where Naughty Dog starts to dominate the narrative action adventure gaming genre. But again, we're gonna be going through all of that in the next video when we discuss Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. But before we get to the next game, a quick thank you to our sponsor, Privacy.com. Privacy.com allows you to control where, when, and how much you can be charged, no matter where you are in the world or what you're doing. Privacy allows you to create virtual payment cards instead of using your regular debit or credit card for each place that you shop online. What this means is that you can have one card that's created virtually to use for Netflix or for Amazon or YouTube Premium, whatever it may be, so if there's ever any any sort of compromise, that card number is relegated just to that. It's not like you're losing your debit card or your main credit card. Everything is relegated to their respective services. Furthermore, you can create a spending limit on each virtual card that's created, which means that you can block hidden fees or double charges on recurring expenses. And if a transaction ever goes over the limit, it will automatically decline, meaning that you don't have to spend the money if you didn't approve of it. And I, for one, know that I could have really benefited from this. All of those times I signed up for a subscription that I only needed to use for a week or two, only to forget that I signed up for it and to be slapped with another charge in a month or six months or even a full year later. With privacy.com, you never have to worry about that because you can set a virtual card for that payment, set it to not renew and to decline any further charges, and then you're set. You don't have to worry about it. Complete peace of mind. It'll save you money and make your life a hell of a lot easier. Check them out at the link in the description box below. A common accusation levied against Naughty Dog is that their games are only as powerful and effective as their narratives. This makes sense on the outset, considering that their games usually rely on character development, flashy graphics, and high-budget action sequences that make you feel as though you're playing through an interactive summer blockbuster. However, since we're going back through the Uncharted games for these critiques, I can't help but feel as though this estimation is limited. What I mean is that there's a lot more to Naughty Dog's games than just the narrative, and I think that Uncharted 2 is a perfect example of this. You see, Uncharted 2's story is crap. In addition, the original Uncharted story is also crap. These games did not claw their way into gamers' hearts and memories by way of magnificent storytelling. It was something more. You see, over the last few weeks as I prepared for this video, I went back through and played the entirety of Uncharted 1 and through all of Uncharted 2. I dug through a plethora of Reddit postings from the time of the game's releases and then also more contemporary examples, and I also consulted with many viewers, just like you, on Twitter and Instagram. After doing all of this, one thing is very clear. Uncharted 2 is successful in spite of its narrative, not because of its narrative. Now, to be honest, at the start of this project wherein I am critiquing every game in the Uncharted series from Naughty Dog's primary studio, I did not think that this would be the case. 
Perhaps I have rose-tinted glasses, remembering these games more fondly than they deserve, or I was simply too young to comprehend all of the myriad issues present in these games. But having revisited them for the series, it's clear to me that there are a lot of problems present in Uncharted 2, the one game in this franchise that the majority of people seem to claim as their favorite. Now don't get me wrong, Uncharted 2 is uniquely Uncharted. In fact, it's the first game in the franchise which actually feels like an Uncharted game. This should, of course, come as no surprise considering that it's only the second entry and considering the fact that the original game was more like a hodgepodge of 15 different ideas than it was a coherent thought out presentation of one creative genius's vision. The sequel though, Uncharted 2, has some of the most memorable action sequences of any of these games. It's the first time you really feel as though Nathan Drake is a human being with whom you can relate, and it marks the first time that Naughty Dog as a studio focused on character arcs and interaction. Part of the reason that the latter is the case is due to the fact that for the majority of the game, Nathan Drake is going to be exploring areas of the game world with another character. Naughty Dog calls these companion sections. In effect, Naughty Dog can do a lot more by way of character development, exposition, and interaction if they pair Nathan Drake with somebody else. In Uncharted 2, you're paired with people like Chloe, Elena, or even this guy. His name is Tenzin, and he's a remarkable example of the power that gameplay can have in building a relationship with a character, because you see, Tenzin doesn't speak English. He speaks some sort of Tibetan tongue, meaning that the only way by which he can communicate with Nate, and therefore the player, is with either simple gesticulations or by leading the way himself. I actually think that these Tenzin sections are responsible for much of the success that we saw with The Last of Us. When you play that game, you'll realize that the overwhelming majority of gameplay time pairs the player with another character. And this is something that Naughty Dog has done consistently in every game since Uncharted 2. And of course, there's one simple reason why they do it because it works. The fact that Tenzin serves as proof of concept that the player and Nate can build relationships without so much as words being spoken simply by way of gameplay mechanics and interaction, I think, is remarkable. And truly, throughout future Naughty Dog games such as The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Uncharted 3, they will very carefully pair the player and player character with other NPCs to alter the mood, emotion, and stress levels of the player. The point of this whole diatribe is to communicate just how important Uncharted 2 was for Naughty Dog as a studio. In the original game, there were certainly attempts at doing these things. However, in my opinion, none of those attempts were particularly successful. While I do have a lot of problems with Uncharted 2, and I think in many ways it hasn't aged well in comparison with other later Naughty Dog games, which I do recognize is a somewhat stupid thing to say considering that those games are newer and have therefore aged better since they have not aged as much, I still think that this game is probably the most important one that Naughty Dog ever created. You could argue that The Last of Us was the most important and transformative game that they ever made, considering it marked a real shift in their development process, and also that it marked the first time Neil Druckmann took a leadership position and he is now the vice president of Naughty Dog and the creative director on seemingly all of their future projects. However, I would argue that The Last of Us would never have happened unless the progress that was made in Uncharted 2 was made. If I had to explain it succinctly, I would say that Uncharted 2 is the first time that it feels as though the Naughty Dog of today got its feet under itself and began to bear its own weight. The original game was ambitious and actually suffered a lot because of it. There were so many ideas going around that nothing was done well, but many things were done even still. As the saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none. In other words, you can put on 10 different hats, but they probably look better individually as opposed to all mashed together. But to go back to the original statement at the top of this video, Uncharted 2 is successful in spite of its story, not because of its story. Yes, this is the first game that Naughty Dog seems to have ever created focused entirely on the narrative and character development. Which is why it's all the more confusing that the story is so bad. I understand that this was only their second outing trying to make a game like this, but even considering how cringy the end product resulted being, the game is still lauded today as one of, if not the best in the franchise. And in fact, most people seem to cite the story as the reason for this exceptionalism. They may love the setting, have particularly fond memories of the building collapsing in Nepal, or for the picturesque train sequence at the beginning of the game, or the relationship that's built with Chloe, or one of the most infuriating boss battles of the entire PlayStation 3 generation. Whatever it 
is that they connected with. People are truly connected with it. This game means a lot to a lot of people, including myself. I've had very positive memories of Uncharted 2 for years. I didn't play it anywhere near launch, but when I did play it, at first I was blown away. However, after replaying it this most recent time for this video specifically, I can't help but feel as though I overlooked many shortcomings or outright ignored them. The game is almost entrancing in that way. It pulls people in and makes them fall in love with it, but when you look at the minutiae of the game, there are many, many problems. Remarkably, however, the game works when consumed as a complete package. And this is actually one of the most frustrating things about making these videos for me as the creator, and perhaps even frustrating for you. You see, playing through games as critically and skeptically as possible can be fun at first. You're nitpicking every single glitch, poorly designed level, cringy joke, everything. And when you call these things out, it can make you feel as though you're more intelligent or perhaps even that your opinion is worth more than somebody else's opinion simply because you're criticizing the thing that they love. But after playing through Uncharted 2 again, I've realized that this is simply not the case. Uncharted 2 is ripe with gameplay, narrative, and level design issues, and it's really easy to nitpick each of those problems and come to the conclusion that the game must be terrible as a result. After all, how can a game be good and have so many issues. Yet, remarkably, I think Uncharted 2 is a game that is more than the sum of its parts. In the same way that a human being is simply a collection of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and a bunch of other smaller proportioned elements, yet is still worth more than the sum of those individual elements, I think that Uncharted 2 as an experience is worth more than the sum of its levels, gameplay mechanics, and writing. In many ways, I think that this is probably true for most games, and especially most great games. Maybe it's that they play into the cultural climate of the time, or connect with players on an emotional level that can't be quantified by the smaller individual parts, but regardless, the experience of the game is something more than would be predicted if hyper-analyzed. Now, the point of this video is not to discuss the philosophical implications of game design, as much as I would love to make false comparisons between video games and human body compositions for an hour, you likely came here for something else, an honest and impartial look at this game that so many people hold dear. And don't worry, I'm going to deliver that beginning in just a moment, but I just wanted to take this time and explain why I don't think that breaking things down in this way gives you a complete picture of what this game has to offer. In the same way that reading a Sparks notebook lit on a novel doesn't give you the same experience or knowledge as though you read the novel yourself. It may make you feel as though you're equipped to make or echo the criticisms that you've learned from the critique, but it certainly doesn't equip you to form an honest and fair opinion yourself. In other words, this is the world's longest spoiler warning. If you haven't played Uncharted 2, you should. The game is only around 10 to 11 hours long, and if you own a PS4, chances are you have it for free because it was listed under the PlayStation Plus free game of the month a little while back. And if you are like me, you likely saved it and downloaded it to your library even though you might not have had the intention of playing it immediately. I mean free is free. Don't worry, this video will still be available to you once you've completed it over the course of a weekend, or knowing some of you, a single evening. But with all of that being said, we're going to go through a good number of my primary criticisms and frustrations with Uncharted 2. I'm going to go through the entire story start to finish, so once again, spoiler warning, and we're going to have the video broken up into four main acts. The intro, which is what you've been watching up until this point, the narrative, the gameplay, and the conclusion. And as always, I'll have timestamps included below. But with all of that said, let's get started. I want to begin by discussing the narrative of the game. As I said previously, this is what most people tend to cite as their reason for loving the game so much. They may point out the great action sequences or the characters that they connected with, but usually at the core they're referencing the story and the plot. So, I'm going to run through a brief synopsis of the entire story from start to finish to refresh your memory if it's been a while since you played the game, or if you've never played the game at all and have no intention of doing so. Now, as difficult as it's going to be, I'm going to desperately try and restrain my commentary until after I've gone through the entire game. To begin, 
Uncharted 2 takes place roughly two years after the events of the first game. We open up in a snowy mountainside with a train hanging off a cliff and Nathan Drake hanging out inside, clearly injured and abandoned, but the sequence only takes place for a couple minutes before we cut away into the main backstory of the game. We cut back in time to a tropical bar where Nathan Drake is approached by a former associate of his named Harry Flynn. But effectively, for the entirety of the story, they're just going to call him Flynn, so that's what I'm going to call him from now on. There's also a girl with him, named Chloe Frazier. She's going to be very important, especially in future videos when we go through Uncharted The Lost Legacy, so keep her in mind. But as for right now, she just seems to be a sidekick or girlfriend of Flynn's. These two petition Nathan Drake, somebody they previously worked with, to help them steal an old oil lamp that was apparently involved in some way, shape, or form in Marco Polo's doomed 1292 voyage from China. They talk about working for a wealthy benefactor that they're going to double cross, meaning that that they want Nathan Drake to help them get it so that they can double cross somebody else and share the profits. It's pretty standard as far as action movie plots go. Damn it, I'm already interjecting my opinions into the synopsis. Okay, uh, moving on. Nathan hesitates but eventually agrees to help these two. We have a couple of other cutaway sequences, one of which we see Chloe convince Nate, somebody with whom she previously had a romantic relationship with, to leave with her once they get their share of the treasure, and to basically double-cross Flynn in the process of double-crossing their wealthy benefactor. And no, this second double-crossing is not the last double-crossing that will take place over the course of this story. We cut forward to a museum in Istanbul, where Nate and Flynn are trying to break in to find and steal the lamp. And inside is a flammable resin that illuminates a message on the map that was also contained within, showing that Marco Polo's fleet was eventually shipped wrecked in the middle of the voyage someplace in Borneo. Furthermore, it's also revealed that they were likely carrying the Chintamani Stone. Now we could go into a lot of the historical and legendary ramifications and implications of the Chintamani Stone, but basically all you need to know is that it's a massive sapphire from Shambhala and apparently whoever wields it has unlimited power and can conquer the world. Again, it's pretty ordinary as far as action stories go. And of course, because we know that this is going to grant unlimited power Power to whoever wields it, there's definitely going to be a bad guy that's trying to wield this power to control the world. But rest assured, we'll run into him soon enough. After this revelation is revealed to both Nate and to the player, Flynn double-crosses Nate in what could only be described as the most predictable double-crossing ever. But rest assured, if you love double-crossing, this is the story for you. Crisscross. This third double-crossing is not the final one. So Flynn double-crosses Nate, leaves him to be arrested, and we jump forward a few months, at which point we see Nate in a prison, sitting and going a little crazy. It's at this point we're reintroduced to Victor Sullivan from the original game, who has been summoned by Chloe to help free Nate from the prison. We get some exposition here, basically saying that Flynn double-crossed Nate and Chloe because he's working for Lazarevich. Lazarevich being a Serbian war criminal who's looking for the stone to help him in his pursuits of controlling and ruling the world. We don't get a lot of backstory with Lazarevich, but it seems as though he has some sort of delusion of grandeur where he believes that he has to serve some broader purpose to help bring order to the chaos that exists within the planet. Again, these are pretty ordinary plot points as far as action movies go and action stories go. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. All I ask for in an action story with this type of villain is to give the villain the chance to argue their case to the viewer, or in this case, the player. In a movie such as Avengers Endgame, Thanos has a real argument for why he's doing what he's doing. Not saying it's a good argument, but it is an argument nonetheless. And the filmmakers made sure to give Thanos a chance to explain his case to the viewer so that they feel at least somewhat conflicted as to which side to take. In Uncharted 2, Lazarevich is hidden from the player for the majority of the story. There are a couple of minutes wherein he calls out Nathan Drake towards the end of the game, but don't worry, we'll get to that. Again, I'm really bad at not interjecting while giving a synopsis. Moving on. Nathan and Sully decide that they're going to infiltrate one of Lazarevich's camps in Borneo with Chloe as a secret agent of sorts within Lazarevich's group. After several gameplay sections, Nathan eventually discovers that the stone likely never left Shambhala in the first place. And Nate also finds a Furba and a map with a message that its carrier will be able to gain access to Shambhala through a temple that's located in Nepal. Flynn shows up with a bunch of angry men, they get spooked off, and naturally Nate and Sully both escape. 
Now at this point, the game developers felt that they needed to shake it up and to break up the monotony of Nate and Sully by pairing Nate and Chloe together. So they find some arbitrary reason for Sully to back out of the story and to give the player the chance to pair with Chloe. The two travel to Nepal and find that Lazarevich has already been there searching for the temple. During the course of going through these levels where we're being chased by Lazarevich's mercenaries, the player runs into Nate's ex-girlfriend from the first game, Elena Fisher. She's traveling with a cameraman who's just known as Jeff. Don't worry, it's not important. You'll find out why in just a little bit. And they are apparently tracking Lazarevich for some sort of story. Like I said in the last critique, this is something that's going to happen time and time again throughout the franchise. Nathan will be all alone at the beginning of the game with no mention of Elena, no explanation as to where she went, and then suddenly she'll reappear out of nowhere with everything seemingly being the same as always. Regardless, it's the same old, same old, and it's something we're going to be seeing a lot more of, so get used to it. After reconnecting with Elena and her new cameraman, boyfriend, hubby, whatever the hell he is, he's just a dude to be honest, we eventually progress with Nate and Chloe, Elena, and the cameraman to the temple. They use the weird dagger thing as a key to uncover Shambhala's real location in the Himalayan mountains. They start working their way back out but are ambushed, and during the course of this ambush, Jeff, the cameraman, is shot. There's a quick little debate that happens between Nate, Elena, and Chloe, where they're all arguing over whether or not to abandon the cameraman to escape. Chloe insists that they abandon him because he's already shot, likely going to die regardless, and Nate and Elena probably don't stand a decent chance of surviving if they stay behind with him. Elena, of course, is outraged at this proposition, and Nate, taking the side of his previous girlfriend, decides to help the cameraman, even though it likely means that they're going to die. And I really can't stress this enough. Like, he is walking this guy, carrying him on his shoulder. I mean, look at this. Like, he should be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, you go through a couple sequences that are pretty clunky, and eventually Nate and Elena are caught by Lazarevich, who walks right up and kills Jeff. This seems like it was meant to be some sort of big reveal that Lazarevich is evil and a bad guy, but just judging by his look, we can tell he's the bad guy, and shooting an already dying character who we had no connection with doesn't really do much by way of convincing us that a character is evil for evil's sake. And it's too bad, because all this really would have taken was a couple scenes where Jeff the cameraman was given the chance to be a human being and to build a relationship with the player. But of course, this is too much to ask in these early Naughty Dog games. Also in this sequence, because Chloe is still believed to be working with Lazarevich, she does a faux double cross to start working with Lazarevich to keep her cover. This isn't made super clear to the player or to Nate. In fact, Elena seems to think that Chloe is an outright double crosser and is actually working with Lazarevich and push them into this situation. Even though that doesn't really make a lot of sense because Chloe even said that she was trying to save everybody by leaving Jeff the cameraman behind. It it's it's just it's lame. <laughs> Can you tell I ran out of words? there. <laughs> it's lame. After all of this, Nate escapes from Flynn and Lazarevich with Elena. After a brief argument, Nate and Elena decide to catch up to Lazarevich's train using a stolen jeep to try and help Chloe. This is probably the most memorable sequence of the entire game, at least for me. Climbing along and running atop the train through a vast mountain range is really really cool. I don't know how they managed to do this so well, but it seems as though it's fluid and it's effortless. Really, other than this tunnel sequence, there's never a moment where it feels as though Naughty Dog is trying to give you the runaround or is trying to stall so that the player can move up the train to keep in line with the amount of track that's left. I don't really know how they did this, but their sleight of hand is phenomenal, and they were able to make sure that the player felt as though this was all organic, and when the train eventually crashes, it crashed because it just happened to crash, and not because the story was on strict tracks. In all likelihood, the way they got this working was probably using a dynamic speed on the train to make sure that it didn't move too fast to reach the end of the track before the player was ready, and also the train was was so long that the player, no matter how fast they were moving, could never reach the front of the train before the giant explosion happened thanks to the helicopter. But all that's beside the point. The point is, this is awesome. 
and even today it's impressive, which just goes to show you how crazy impressive it must have been at launch. So Nate fights his way through the train trying to find Chloe, but after finding her, she refuses to leave with him because she feels as though she can't trust him anymore. Flynn shows up out of nowhere and decides to shoot Nate. Trapped and dying, Nate decides to cause an explosion that's going to derail the entire train, a very reasonable thing to do. The train flies off the cliff and he escapes just barely while hanging onto the train car. And this is where the game opened up. It's like in one of those old 1990s comedy movies where they open up the movie with some clip and they say, oh, I bet you're wondering how I got here. And then they only reveal later how they got there. And it's, it's kind of a fun cliche, but I don't know. It doesn't do much for me. You climb back up the train car just like you did at the beginning of the game, but you get some new dialogue and quirky jabs, and some stuff has been slightly altered to a more realistic version, considering that they didn't have to dumb it down for the intro anymore. You get to the top of the train, you climb through the snow, and you start walking through the sequence, at which point Nate passes out due to all of the blood loss. Nate's found by a Tibetan Sherpa named Tenzin, the guy we talked about earlier, who brings Nate back to the village where he's based out of to help him recover. Here, Nate's reunited with Elena, and we are introduced to an explorer named Carl Schaefer, who's apparently some sort of German an explorer that's been living here for a while. Schaefer's probably the weirdest character in this entire story because he doesn't have really anything particularly likable about him. He just kind of shows up, offers some explanation, says that Lazarevich must be stopped at all costs, and then uses Tenzin to send Nate off on a fetch quest effectively to find out why Lazarevich actually must be stopped at all costs. You see, Schaefer sent an expedition of people to try and find the stone apparently decades ago, even though the condition of the bodies is not quite decades old. It's weird. Regardless, doesn't really matter. You travel through some ice caves doing a lot of platforming and fighting off these really strange monsters that are heavily implied to be yetis. Don't worry, these things will really piss you off in just a little bit. They're jumping up walls. They have superpowers. They can apparently withstand any number of bullets. They're one of the most infuriating NPCs in the entirety of the franchise. I can't stand them at all. I'm moving on. After finding the slaughtered expedition, you find out that Schaefer was actually working for and originated his resources from the Nazi think tank, the Ananurbe. This was a group founded by Heinrich Himmler in July of 1935. It's an actual group that actually existed. Basically, the Nazis were convinced that a bunch of pseudoscientific things existed all throughout the world. They were super, super pseudoscientific with regards to a lot of things, and they sent out groups and explorers to find all of these mythical places and sources of power. It, it's, it's crazy. I highly suggest you read into it. It's super interesting just how crazy these people actually were. Like for real, the Nazis were so superstitious. It's hilarious. But regardless, that's where Schaefer came from. And apparently he also killed his own men to protect the world from the Chintamani stone being released because it had this unknowable and uncontrollable power. I, you know what? Nazis have to be in an uncharted game, I guess. It's just, it's what you need, because Nazis, <laughs> that's it, because Nazis. We'll talk more about this in a little bit, but for now, we'll just leave it there. Nate and Tenzin return to the village at which they started to find that Lazarevich's men have arrived and have started tearing the place apart. Schaefer has been kidnapped and the Furba, the little dagger thing, has been stolen. Elena thankfully is safe, so she and Nate follow Lazarevich's convoy to a monastery at the top of the mountain where a mortally wounded Schaefer tells Nate that he must destroy the Chintamani stone before Lazarevich can obtain its power. He also heavily suggests that Nate should kill anybody that gets in the way because he was also willing to kill his own men that got in the way of preventing the power from escaping. This is one of those topics that I could talk about for hours and we're going to discuss in a little bit the idea that Nathan Drake is actually a terrible person who's actually the bad guy throughout this entire story even though he's presented as the hero and not the anti hero. It's something that even Lazarevich will call him out on towards the end of the game, but its entire discussion is limited to a single sentence that isn't responded to. But don't worry, 
We'll get there. Nate runs back into Chloe while chasing Lazarevich, and they come to a decent understanding, and Nate regains the little dagger key thing. Seriously, I, I looked it up. It's called a fur, but I, I just, that sounds weird. It's like a Furby, but a knife. I. I don't like the name, I'm just gonna call it dagger thing. Nate and Elena eventually figure out the passageway to Shambhala by doing some basic puzzles, but they run into Lazarevich. Lazarevich takes Chloe and Elena hostage, realizing that Chloe has been an undercover agent this entire time, and he forces Nate and Flynn to open the pathway to Shambhala. Those super stupid monsters come out of nowhere again, but are eventually pushed off, and at that point he takes off the head of one in what I was expecting to be a very great gruesome display, but turns out they're just dudes. Yeah, these are the superhuman guardian people that apparently guard Shimbala and have superpowers, felt the need to cover themselves and disguise themselves as Yeti to keep people away for some reason. I, I don't really know why they needed to cover up and make themselves look like yetis when they could just look like people and that would probably do the job, but regardless, it's a thing. Furthermore, this is also one of the most underwhelming reveals in the entire franchise because they take this head off and they're just like, oh, it's dudes. Cool. Nobody's questioning how they got these superhuman powers to the point where they're able to jump 20, 30 feet in the air, where they can withstand literal clips of ammunition shoved into their heads. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but everyone just kind of rolls over and accepts that it must be due to the power of the Chintamani stone. And if you're anything like me, you likely saw this reveal and immediately realized that the final boss battle was likely going to be Lazarevich hopped up on the same stuff. Moving on, the gate is open open to Shambhala. More guards come out of nowhere, attacking everybody, but this provides enough cover for Nate, Elena, and Chloe to escape from Lazarevich. You fight off a few guardians in some really frustrating arena battles. Like, for real, these guys, they have a DPS that's so high, you basically have to immediately run to cover and then spam them with some cheap attacks on their ankles. It's not really fun. It doesn't seem to require skill. It's purely a matter of finding an exploit and taking advantage of it. But Nate, Elena, and Chloe keep pushing through the city towards the main shrine at the center. Once they arrive there, they realize that the Chintamani stone is actually a giant ball of resin, and it's taken from the sap of this ancient tree of life that's at the center of the city. And apparently at the base of the tree, within the root system, there's a liquefied version of the sap that if you drink it, makes you effectively invincible. Or maybe I should say almost effectively invincible because it clearly doesn't make everybody invincible considering all of the guardians that you kill in the sequence leading up to this. Right after this reveal, Flynn shows up out of nowhere having been beaten and left for dead by Lazarevich because he screwed everything up and let Nate get away. Flynn has a grenade that he has unpinned and drops once he shows up, trying to commit some sort of suicide bombing on the group for reasons, I guess. Everybody seems perfectly fine despite all of the shrapnel flying everywhere, except for Elena, who seems to have absorbed most of the blow. Even still, she seems to just look like she fell down a flight of stairs. She doesn't really seem to have absorbed a lot of shrapnel that cut her up and is causing her to bleed to death but regardless, we'll look past it. Now I immediately thought, okay, Elena's dying. Surely we're gonna get her to the base of the tree, give her some of the sap and she'll be fine. But I guess Naughty Dog's writers didn't wanna be that predictable in this individual instance of the game. So instead, Nate decides that he's going to push on to stop Lazarevich from getting to the sap, not because he needs it to heal Elena, but rather because he simply wants to defeat Lazarevich. It's a weird conflict of motivations because it seems as though Nate would be much more justified in going down to the base of the tree to get the sap to heal Elena, saying screw it to Lazarevich because Elena's more important to him than anything else. But because they flipped the motivations, Nate now is seemingly abandoning Elena and Chloe, putting them both in 
what I would argue is a moderate amount of danger, considering we've seen all of these guardians jumping and flying around in this very area where he leaves them. Also, he can just go and try to stop Lazarevich from drinking some tree sap. It's a small problem to have, perhaps, but it does seem as though this must have been a conscious choice on the part of the writers, to have Nate motivated by stopping Lazarevich as opposed to saving Elena. I don't know which I like more, because on the one hand, I think they felt that Lazarevich being stopped would perhaps be read as the more noble pursuit, but if they had flipped it and decided that Elena was definitely going to die without drinking some of the sap and Nate needs to collect that sap in order to save her, at which point he runs into Lazarevich and they have this fight out where Lazarevich happens to die and the tree is destroyed in the process, they could have achieved literally all of the same things while motivating Nate's actions by the saving of this love interest. It makes me think as though Naughty Dog didn't actually plan on Nate and Elena reconnecting when they were initially writing these the sequence, but the game ends with them together anyway, so I really don't know what to make of it. It's just weird to me. If you have any thoughts on this, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Nate travels down to the base of the tree within the root system and finds Lazarevich, who's drinking the tree sap, becoming nearly invincible, totally roided out. And it's in this small arena that the most frustrating boss fight of the entire franchise takes place. Really, playing back through this for this video was an absolute trudge. I forgot how terrible this was. I, I really am baffled at how stupid this is. Let's just all take a minute to be silent and appreciate that this type of crap is not a mainstay of the industry nowadays. Okay, we're good. You run around, shoot little pockets of resin that explode near Lazarevich, which deals damage to him, or you can just unload all of your ammo into him, but that seems to do very little damage comparatively. So you run around shooting little pockets of resin, blowing up in his face. You repeat this process time and time again for about 10 minutes, and eventually, Nate's killed him, and he leaves him to be devoured and torn apart by the Guardians. The most important sequence here, though, is what Lazarevich says to Nate in this little moment of transparency where the writers seem to be admitting one of the major plot holes of this franchise. You think I am a monster, but you're no different from me, Blake. How many men have you killed? How many just today? That's it, boy. No compassion, no mercy. Do it! No. <laughs> Nate doesn't have a response to this, and it begs the question, why was this thrown out by the main villain at the end of the game if it's never really resolved? Seriously, this could have led to some really cool moments leading into the conclusion of the story, where Nate is totally torn as to whether or not he did the right thing or if he's the actual villain in all of this. Maybe Lazarevich actually could have done some good by obtaining the power of the Chintamani Stone, and maybe the hundreds of people that Nate killed in the process of chasing down this stone wasn't actually worth it. Maybe that made him a worse individual than everybody else. Now, over the last few months, I've been rereading the Witcher books. They're all fantastic and I recommend them fully, but in the very first book, we're exposed to Geralt's philosophy with regards to gradations of good and evil. During the story of how Geralt became the Butcher of Blaviken, we find out that Geralt is constantly presented with the offer to choose between one of two evils. The argument usually goes like this. Here's an option. Here's another option. One is less terrible than the other, therefore it's only moral to choose the less terrible option. One of the things you need to know about Geralt as a character is that he rejects this premise. He says that choosing between the lesser of two evils is a false dichotomy. It's a choice that you don't have to make. And this is actually a common thread throughout all of the Witcher books. This struggle that Geralt has trying to decide whether or not he should choose between the lesser of two evils, even though he is fundamentally and emphatically opposed to the premises of that argument. That's an interesting discussion to have. That's an interesting struggle for a character to be wrestling with. You compare that to Nathan Drake, who basically never deals with any of these problems throughout the entire franchise. Like I said in the last critique, a lot of these problems can be adequately explained away to most people by simply saying, it's a video game, or it's an action game. It's not meant to be super serious. You're not meant to question a lot of these things. But that to me seems like a really lazy excuse, because if you're asking 
asking the player to connect with these characters, you need to at least have a somewhat decent explanation as to why they're committing these crimes. But you know what, I've discussed this time and time again. I don't think it's something that Naughty Dog will ever resolve in the Uncharted series, simply because I don't think it's important to them. I would love to see them tackle it, but I just don't think it's going to happen. And having played through all of the games developed by the primary studio at Naughty Dog, it doesn't seem like something they ever really addressed. The Last of Us Part 2 shows that they're capable of handling this discussion, because they're showing very actively, because the overarching premise of that game is that evil begets evil, and the actions of one character are not contained within a vacuum. They must be considered as individual moral actions. But as far as Uncharted is concerned, for the most part, what happens in cutscenes is canon and should be considered within the character evaluation of an individual, not the gameplay sequences, which occur in a sort of alternate realm. Regardless, the game ends as the city crumbles under the collapse of the tree, with all of the exploding resin that Nate caused. After escaping the collapsing Shambhala, Nate and Chloe have drug Elena to the top of this set of stairs. Naughty Dog is clearly trying to imply that she is dying here, or at least almost about to die, I guess, and Nate starts freaking out and crying, and it's very emotional. Everybody watching this is convinced that this fade in is meant to be some sort of funeral service. At the very least, Nate appears to be paying respects to a deceased individual, and based on what they just did, it seems as though that individual should be Elena. But it's not. This is actually a memorial for Schaefer. Yeah, the old German Nazi guy, that's, that's his memorial and it's it's not Elena. Elena's fine and uh, they talk, share some cute couple tidbits and then they kind of kiss and hang out and then the game's over. That's it. And this is what I mean by Naughty Dog always chickening out with this franchise. In the first game it seemed as though they were killing off Sully. They chickened out, brought him back to life after being shot in the chest with a small booklet that somehow stopped a bullet. This time around, Elena survived a grenade launch to the face simply because they wanted to have a cute couple scene at the end of the game. Nate literally abandoned Elena and Chloe to go back down to the base of the tree to try and stop the acquisition of unlimited power by an evil character. Sometimes, doing the right thing has a cost. If Naughty Dog had committed to that principle and killed off Elena here, that could have proven the point. Nate saved the world, or at least he thinks he did, but he lost his true love in the process. And this is a question that Naughty Dog is very capable of asking the player because they do so in The Last of Us. That's literally the whole point of the end of the game. I understand it's not really the tone that they're going for in Uncharted, but still, it leaves me frustrated that they couldn't have some more serious subject matter within the game. And, and that's it. That is the actual end of the game. It's pretty underwhelming, if you ask me. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could discuss with regards to this. We could talk about the Nazi tie-in, their kind of dependency on bringing those characters in wherever they can, which is one thing that you kind of just do which I think is actually forgivable for the most part, even if it does start to get a little tired. The one thing I can't forgive though is Naughty Dog's lack of commitment to any sort of serious consequence as a result of Nate's actions. There are multiple points in Uncharted 2 where Chloe and or Elena are held at gunpoint and are almost killed because of something Nate did directly. However, instead of the universe actually punishing Nate, they decide to give him a free pass so that he effectively never has to learn his lesson. They sort of address this in Uncharted 4 where they sort of kill off Nate's brother in a cutscene that took place in the past, but as we all know who have played through that game, the brother reappears and is absolutely fine, so that doesn't count. And this is probably my single biggest problem with the franchise that happens time and time again. Nate is horrifically irresponsible. He does a lot of very stupid things, and there are many times, especially in these early games, where he's doing things seemingly just for the laugh that endanger everyone around him. He's arrogant, he's cocky, he's full of himself, and he pushes those around him into dangerous situations. Even if his motivations are sound, such as at the end of Uncharted 2 when he pushes in to stop Lazarevich, it still means that he's endangering those around him, and if he's actually doing that, there should be some sort of consequence. Show the player and Nate that there's a cost to moral action. 
But regardless, the story serves a broad purpose to bring the player along for an action-packed ride. We can nitpick all of these small little details, such as the strange use of Yeti costumes for these superhero level guardians to scare off strangers from Shambhala, even though that doesn't seem to be necessary. I mean, I think you could just have regular looking people that have superpowers doing the job and people would be terrified. Like, I don't... I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I still don't know why this was necessary. Or the fact that you are in a vast mountainscape, you go through these stairs, and then all of a sudden you come out to Shimbala, which seems to just be within a mountain valley, and has the sky completely open to it. Like, for real, did they not have helicopters to just fly over the mountain? I mean, they had helicopters like 10 minutes before this happened, so surely they were able to fly and find Shambhala this way. Why did they have to go underground? Is this whole thing underground with a fake sky? If so, how did that happen? Like, there's so many questions that we could bring up. It's just not important. And I don't think it's important because I don't think there's any good answer to it. The broader point of this section of the video is just that the narrative isn't very good. The character development isn't very good, though it is better than the previous game, and the individual minutia of characters interacting with each other is interesting, but the broader implications of those interactions are cut off before anything interesting develops. So what else does the game have to offer? Well, it's gameplay. Over the course of Uncharted 2, there's a lot of crazy scenes. The ones that I remember most fondly would be the helicopter and train sequence, the opening sequence on the train, and the building collapsing, which I know for many people was the first thing that they ever saw about Uncharted 2 in the original demo at E3 back in the day, and even still, it's remarkably impressive, especially when you consider the hardware that this game was running on. However, in spite of these massive set pieces, there is a real lack of polish that I noticed while playing back through the game recently. There seems to be a lack of attention to detail in smaller areas within the gameplay sequences. Cutscenes are always great, and big story beat moments are always polished to high hell. However, within smaller gameplay sequences, it seems as though they didn't focus test these very much at all. Granted, these are all small things, but when added together, it makes the game feel as though there wasn't much care put into it, at least when compared to Naughty Dog of just a few years later. For example, I was able to climb onto this ladder early before Chloe showed up simply because I jumped on this desk and was able to get on the ladder from there. This wasn't supposed to happen. Seriously, you climb to the top of the ladder and you can't get through because that door has to be opened by Chloe once you climb to the top of the ladder with her. Or we could look at this moment where we're running through the temple with Chloe, we fall into a trap and the ceiling closes down. We're locked in a cold dark room, scary enough. However, Spikes appear, and the roof starts slowly collapsing in. This could have been a moment that instilled a lot of stress and fear in me, the player. But it was completely negated by what was supposed to be a helpful tip from the game. You see, when I critique and review games, I try to play through them in the way that most people will play through them. That usually means that I'll approach them with the normal difficulty and go back through later with higher levels of difficulty. I will also leave most settings on the default option, at least for the majority of the game, so once again, I play through the game in the same way that the majority of players will experience it. This meant that for Uncharted 2, I left most of the tutorial hints on. And this is one of those moments where I'm both glad and disappointed that I did. I'm glad I did because now I can call out what is a horribly optimized tip in this moment. And I'm frustrated because this tip that popped up completely spoiled the entirety of this sequence. Like I said, we just fell in a trap. Spikes appeared out of nowhere and the ceiling is collapsing in on us. This should be a scary moment. But instead, a little tutorial hint popped up immediately suggesting that I throw a grenade. This means that instead of being resourceful, thinking outside the box, and connecting that, ooh, maybe I should break down those gears that seem to be operating the ceiling mechanism. At which point I would probably start shooting at it and hucking grenades in that general direction, solving the puzzle for myself. But instead, a tutorial popped up immediately spoiling the solution to the puzzle from the outset. This totally ruined the entire moment for me, making it so the entire experience was over before I knew it. 
really, really disappointing. Or I could point out this really poorly placed cart. We need to push this over a little bit to jump on it. And how you do that is by going to a particular side and, and pressing circle in order to crouch next to it, at which point you can push against it into the right position. However, I pressed circle twice. So I ran around this corner, I got to the cart, pressed circle, and immediately jumped to the ledge and then fell off. It happened so quick, I didn't even really process what happened until I went back and watched the footage over again. All they needed to do was extend the floor a little bit so that this wouldn't happen, or to put a simple script in place so that the player would not be able to go to the ledge when a cart is that close to it. Or even just a small barrier along this edge, really, it wouldn't have taken much. It just makes me think that they didn't test this enough to realize that this could potentially be a problem. And there's a lot of problems throughout the game like this. But even still, there are also a lot of moments where the attention to detail is really impressive and where you can tell a lot of care was given. Something like Nate's notebook I find super cool and I find it to be a really impressive improvement over the previous game. The fact that you can find little notes that Nate's written to himself helps you get in the mind of the character and I think it's super cool. But there's also a lot of decisions that were made in the game design of Uncharted 2 that seem to be just strange. The most notable one would probably be in the free climbing. This is something I see a lot of people talk about, and it's something I had completely forgotten about before returning to the game for this video. You see, there's very little or no markings at all indicating where you can or should free climb. Usually the extent of your indications are just small stones sticking out of a wall. You as the player have to see these stones and infer from that information that you can climb along that wall. Now this could be an understandable design choice as it targets realism, but it does cause more frustration than not because it isn't consistent. You don't need to add markings to indicate where you can free climb if those markings are reductive, or if those markings don't serve a reasonable purpose or pull the player out of the game. In a game like Assassin's Creed, there is really no need for any sort of these indications because you can effectively climb on anything, so these indications would be needless. However, because in Uncharted 2, there are very specific areas you can and can't climb, this just leads to more frustration. Compare it to something like Uncharted 4, where there are markings. These markings are discreet enough that you do have to look for them, but they make it so if the player processes that they need to climb in a given level, they know what to look for. Because you can't climb everything in Uncharted 4, you start just looking for these markings which indicate what you are allowed to climb. And because they're minimalistic, I feel as though these markings aren't intrusive or unimmersive. Not to mention, I think it's pretty clear that the return of these markings in Uncharted 4 and Lost Legacy really shows that Naughty Dog listened to the criticism and decided that the lack of markings, while an interesting design choice, targeting realism really wasn't worth the immersion that they were trying to achieve as a result. There were multiple times where I was confused as to where I was supposed to go because I didn't connect that I was supposed to jump onto this thing that wasn't marked. Most things in Uncharted, even the majority of things, in Uncharted that aren't marked, you cannot interact with. So the assumption follows through all gameplay systems, where if something is not specialty marked, it isn't interactive. The fact that these street signs are climbable is something you aren't going to know unless you try jumping for them. After you do this the first time, you'll eventually learn that these street signs can be climbed, but that's something you have to experiment with first. This means that there were also multiple times where I tried jumping at things to climb them which weren't interactive, because they also were not marked, so I assumed that maybe I just needed to try it in order to learn that you could climb them. I mean, just in explaining this, I find myself getting a headache because it seems so needlessly complicated, and I think that that's the main point. It's good they were trying to target realism and remove these unnecessary markings. The problem is, that they're necessary. Lastly, within the gameplay systems, there's a real lack of dynamism. Naughty Dog games have always been linear. You're always expected to continue on set paths and do what the developers intended you to do. That's not a bad thing. In fact, you can have a lot of amazing sequences that are carefully designed by the developers that are set up this way. However, there needs to be a sleight of hand. You need to convince the player that they have the free will to do what they want to do even though they're actually living their life in accordance with your dictum. For example, in Uncharted 4 there's the famous car sequence which was shown off at E3. 
Here you're running away from an armored car. You're driving through the city and taking all sorts of detours to try and avoid that car that's chasing you. The player really does feel as though they have the free will to turn in any direction, go through any alleyway they want, but because they're so rushed and pushed by the impending danger of the armored car, they find themselves just driving downhill as fast as they can. This is remarkably well done because it doesn't make the player feel as though they're on train tracks, but in reality, they are. No matter which corners you turn, no matter where you spin around, you will always end up in the same place, and the same cutscene will play at the end of the chase no matter what. That's why you'll hear a lot of developers talk about funneling wide. You open up a wide area for the player to go through, but you eventually funnel them into one small area that you dictate. The key is to make sure that the player doesn't realize they're being funneled into this singular point. In Uncharted 2, they don't do a very good job of this. For instance, here, Nathan is wounded and he is fighting for his life. He's surrounded by a bunch of armed gunmen, so I naturally thought that if I could stealth my way out of the level, climbing to safety, that would be fine. I don't have to kill unnecessarily, and I can get to safety where I will be able to recover from my injuries. But once you get to this area, you climb up the ledge, no matter who you've killed, no matter whether or not you are visible in this moment, you will immediately face a kill screen. People will show up out of nowhere and shoot you. This means that the player is forced to kill all of these people, even though within the game itself, it's not necessary. Furthermore, within the narrative itself, it doesn't make sense for Nate to kill these people because he's injured and likely doesn't stand a chance if he were to engage with them. So it would beg the question, why engage? Why not stealth your way out if you can? And this example is really frustrating, especially because there isn't really a reason that Naughty Dog needed to force the player to kill these characters. There's a couple waves that come in, but eventually you still climb up this same ledge. The same cutscene plays whether or not you killed 10 people behind you or 200 people behind you. Furthermore, I wish there were more realistic puzzles. I understand that this is an artifact of these kind of action adventure games where you just have to do these kind of outrageous puzzles where you're climbing on limbs of statues to alter their arrangement and then you're also climbing along these giant levers to pull them into place and then moving these small little statues onto set pillars to make sure that everything is lined up it like i get it i i get it you have to have puzzles in these games i just wish that they put a little more effort into making those puzzles more realistic so if there were people ancient people that wanted to hide a treasure it would be more in line with what you would expect from them in hiding their treasure. But I do admit that this is likely just a pet peeve of mine, especially considering how many of these games I've played in the last few months. And lastly, the gunplay. There really isn't a major improvement over the previous game here. The shooting is still arena based, there's a wider variety of weapons, but for the most part, you're just running through levels, unloading clips into enemies, finding a new gun, unloading that clip into somebody, finding a new gun, and repeating the process over and over and over again. In Uncharted 3 and 4, we'll start to see some more stealth sequences becoming normative within these games, but it's just unfortunate that in Uncharted 2, they felt as though they needed to keep to this purely action genre where you have to shoot and kill everything. The one improvement I can admit they did make over the original game is they added a lot more verticality to these levels. Most of the shooting arenas have two or three levels to them that you have to all consider and run around. Later in the game, there's even free running that's implemented into the levels in which you're fighting. It's actually pretty cool. But all told, the gameplay itself isn't particularly remarkable at the end of the day. So, with all of that said, what is the takeaway from Uncharted 2? There seems to be a lot of problems. How could this game be so beloved by so many? That's a question I am having a lot of trouble answering right now. I even have very fond memories of Uncharted 2, like I said at the beginning of the video. But having replayed it for this video, I can't help but feel as though there's a real shortcoming here. There are so many gameplay and narrative shortfalls that it can't really be ignored. And yet, the game at the end of the day, once you've 
played it all the way through fills you with a decent amount of satisfaction and for the most part motivates players to come back for more. I don't really know how to resolve the idea in my mind. Maybe you have a very elegant way of thinking about it and describing it. I would love to hear that in the comment section or through direct messages on Twitter or Instagram. I think Uncharted 2 is a good game. Not great, but not bad. But after playing through it again, I think I can say confidently that it's not actually my favorite of the franchise. If it is your favorite of the franchise, I would actually really be interested in hearing when you played the game last, or if you played it through recently, and what you would say in response to these criticisms I've levied. The only conclusion I can draw is the one I brought up at the beginning that Uncharted 2 is more than the sum of its parts. A game like Uncharted is about the journey and the experience. It's not really about the individual destinations that you arrive at during the course of that journey. While that may seem like a cop-out, and it may very well be just that, I'm glad that I played Uncharted 2 once again, and I'm excited to play through the third game for the next critique. But before we tackle the next game, a big thank you to our sponsor, Aura. Aura is the new standard in digital security. In the digital age, you can never really take your identity security too seriously. Protection from identity theft and fraud is extremely important, and Aura makes it extremely easy. Once you're signed up, Aura will automatically notify you if they detect any issues with your online accounts, with passwords, or even social security number leaks that they found using their cutting edge tech. And to sweeten the deal, every member is backed by a $1 million insurance policy to cover eligible losses and fees due to identity theft and fraud. So no matter what, you can rest assured that Aura has got your back, protecting your data and notifying you if anything's going wrong so you can fix it in no time. Check them out at the link in the video description box below. Uncharted 3. It is for many people a standout title in this franchise. Perhaps not their favorite, for many people Uncharted 2 holds that title, but it still is one that people look on very fondly. Now this could of course be just nostalgic bias. I for one really enjoy Uncharted 4. It's probably my favorite of the franchise. Don't worry, we'll be critiquing that one in the very near future as well. But I'm very upfront and honest that that was my first game in this franchise that I actually played. And then I went back and played the others after the fact. And as a result, I probably have some nostalgia bias to 4 that I didn't have with 1, 2, and 3. You know, they say you never forget your first, and I think that that's true in many cases, especially video games. In all seriousness, though, people usually find the first game that they played in a franchise to be one of their favorites, if not their favorite. And in the case of Uncharted 3, this was a game that really took it up a notch above and beyond what all of the other titles in the franchise had done up to that point in terms of marketing, which is perhaps the most important piece here. Subway, where winners eat. Sure, Uncharted 1 did fairly well. Uncharted 2 was reviewed very highly and did very well after its release. But Uncharted 3 was the first game in this franchise where they poured tens of millions of dollars into the marketing campaigns. Magazine covers, TV commercials, online ads that were on every single gaming related website. You name it, they probably did it to promote this game. And as a result of those campaigns, the game sold very, very well and even in spite of that, was reviewed fairly well. Perhaps not as well as it could have been if certain steps were taken that we'll discuss over the course of this video, but still, it was fairly successful. And perhaps the most notable element of this game's entire creation is that it was the first time that Naughty Dog really made a concerted effort to shift away from the kitschy, campy, supernatural stories that they had in Uncharted 1 and 2 and focus instead on something more grounded in reality, although still kind of outlandish. Where you had zombie Nazis in Uncharted 1, here you're going to be focused on a chemical hallucinogenic agent that people attributed to the power of a djinn, and that is in effect the supernatural element, but with a naturalistic explanation. It also is the first time that we really see Naughty Dog and their writers make a concerted effort to tell stories 
that are much more believable and that aren't so focused on making out the main characters to be campy action heroes that are lovable but do things that are objectively insane but rather instead try and use them as characters within a story that's a little bit more meaningful and also believable however the most important and in my opinion interesting thing about uncharted 3 isn't the gameplay design it isn't the story it's not the action sequences that we get to play through it's the weird infighting that you can feel throughout the course of the entire game. Now, I don't mean between the characters that you'll interact with throughout the course of the story. What I mean is that it really seems as though developers and writers at Naughty Dog at this time disagreed very strongly as to where this game and franchise should go. On the one hand, you had a group of writers, developers, and even the game's director, Amy Hennig, that believed that Uncharted should retain its lighthearted feeling, shouldn't get too serious, could have, and perhaps should have, supernatural villains and elements within it, and they shouldn't burden themselves with the weight of having a realistic and grounded story. That's something that takes extra time and money and effort to write for, it's a headache, and it's not as fun, so you shouldn't bother with it. On the other side of the studio, you had other writers, developers, and in this case, the studio executives, not the game directors, that thought that Uncharted should become more grounded and should focus more on realistic stories, believable characters, things that aren't so drowned in supernatural explanations that don't really make any sense, perhaps less zombies. And these two groups fought pretty hard. And you can feel this tension all throughout the story. It feels like it's starting to break apart at the seams at certain points. And then at other points, it fully breaks apart and there's plot holes all over it because you can tell they had a supernatural explanation for this weird thing that happens. They decided to cut that supernatural explanation. So then there's just no explanation at all except you have something that's supernatural happening that isn't explained, which basically is just a supernatural element. So it, it just sucks. <laughs> there really isn't another way to put it other than that Uncharted 3 is a game rife with growing pains related to a huge transition in studio mentality and tactics. Naughty Dog was really good at making these fun, lighthearted adventure games with Uncharted 1 and 2, and even 3 to a certain extent, but in the middle of 3, perhaps as they were getting further and further into the ideation process and development process of The Last of Us, which would release just a couple of years later, they started to realize that a more grounded tone is something that they were more in favor of moving into the next generation of consoles, which was just a couple of years away. Seriously, the infighting and the two dueling design philosophies at play in this game all at one time make for a really fascinating case study on game development and narrative creation. However, it results in a game that is rife with plot holes, is pretty inconsistent in terms of quality, is glitchy even to this day in the remastered collection, and all told isn't particularly fun. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not gonna just say this stuff and then not back it up. So to prove all of my points, we're gonna go through the entire game start to finish, walk you through everything that happens, and point out all of the little eccentricities that come up over the course of this game's runtime. And of course, there are spoilers that will come up for Uncharted 1 and 2, so if you're weary of those, go watch my videos on those games first, then come back to this one. It'll still be here waiting for you. But with that, Let's get into it. So the game opens up with Nathan and Sully entering an English bar where they meet a man by the name of Talbot. I could say Talbot, Talbot, Talby, I don't know. I'm just gonna call him Talbot because everybody calls him that, but I understand there might be a better way of pronouncing it, so get wrecked. Nate and Sully begin a discussion with Talbot to trade Sir Francis Drake's ring for a suitcase full of cash. It's immediately clear that Talbot is working on behalf of somebody else. At this point, you don't know who he is. He could be a lawyer, he could be a bodyguard, or just an associate. 
it's not really clear. Now you'll notice immediately that this game has a totally different tone to it compared to Uncharted 2. In fact, both 1 and 2 started with bombastic sequences that were as campy as they were unrealistic. This contributed to the fun, lighthearted tone, but held back the franchise from serious dialogue and concepts. But Uncharted 3 marks the first time that Naughty Dog really tried to tell a story that for one, made sense, and secondly, was gritty enough to stand as its own PG-13 adventure drama. In effect, they were trying to transition from Johnny English to James Bond. Thematically, they're the same, I guess, but they are very, very different, and clearly one is way better. Johnny English. Like I said in the intro, the problem is that this shift in tone isn't felt throughout the whole game. There will be huge swaths of this title that feel directly akin to Uncharted 2 and others that have shadows of The Last of Us, but none of it is truly congruent. But for now, I like the setting. The bar is well decorated, it seems gritty and grounded. I, I like this opening, I'll be honest. That is until Nate and Sully figure out that the money is fake. They call BS and try to leave, but are immediately attacked by Talbot's men. And this is the first of many, many massive fist fights that the game is going to throw at you. Seriously, I don't know what it is about Uncharted 3 and Naughty Dog's insistent on these fist fights. They're not fun, they're clunky, and they lack any and all sort of depth. The only inputs for the player are attack with square and parry with triangle while moving around. That's it. It'd be one thing if these sequences were part of some larger quick time event, requiring occasional inputs in order to complete a small scripted sequence, but this is it. This is the scripted sequence. There are some cool finishers that can play out if you press triangle during an attack near certain objects, but that's really as flashy as these fights get. It's like Naughty Dog got these contextual animations working and said, you know what, that's great. Let's turn that into a mini game that the players have to do 20 times throughout the game, even though it's not fun. It's just bad to me. I know this game is a decade old and it's easy to nitpick things that have aged poorly in old games, but still. I don't think this was fun then, and it's not fun now. This also stands out to me as an example of a mechanic that shouldn't have been blown up to the scale it was. It's like the Batmobile in Arkham Knight, fun in small amounts and a chore in large doses. It really is like these fist fights, except that these are not fun either in small doses or large doses, so they just suck. After beating the crap out of a larger brute and being slammed into a urinal himself, Nate and Sully escape the bar. I guess it's in England, so it's a pub, I guess. However, immediately after exiting, they're surrounded by a bunch of armed henchmen. This is when we meet Talbot's boss, Marlo. She pulls up in the limo and takes the ring that you were supposedly trading for. And then one of Talbot's henchmen, a guy named Cutter, proceeds to shoot Nate and Sully Point blank. The game then immediately jumps into a flashback to 20 years earlier, where we see a young, early teens Nathan Drake looking at a Francis Drake exhibit within some museum. We also see a young Sully open up a briefcase that has this same ring that was just stolen by Marlowe 20 years later in it. This sequence then plays out basically as a parkour tutorial. The free climbing is actually really simplistic here, and all you have to do is pickpocket the ring for this case out of Sully's wallet. It's really unremarkable, except that Nate breaks into the museum, is able to steal the ring, and is chased off by a bunch of Marlowe's henchmen, only to be saved at the last second by Sully, who takes him in basically as a uh, second in command, an apprentice of sorts. And already we have a backstory to a relationship that we've seen play out over the course of the last two games. Previously, we had never seen where these people had come from. We didn't know where Nate and Sully met. We didn't know why they cared about each other or trusted each other so greatly. It was just out there. But now we're seeing an actual explanation being presented, yet another reflection of Naughty Dog trying to tell a more engaging and more effortful story compared to what they did previously. Even if the climbing sequence that it's set around isn't that interesting, I'm still very appreciative that this segment is within the story because it adds to the characters, it builds their relationship, it's really good. We then jump back to the present right after Nate and Sully are shot. Now, of course, it will come as a surprise to absolutely nobody who's ever seen any action title ever. They weren't actually shot. You see, Cutter is a double agent for 
some reason, and he decided that he was going to help Nathan and Sully by shooting them with squibs, basically fake bullets or fake blanks that then set off a squib within their shirts to make it look like they're bleeding out. Okay. <laughs> now, as a tactic, this is a little bizarre because of course nate and sully couldn't have known necessarily that they would be jumped the second that they left the bar after beating the crap out of all of talbot's men but even if they did know that they likely would have known that Marlowe wasn't one to just murder them in cold blood in the middle of a street which is why they don't respond positively to cutter when he shoots them so him shooting them is actually more suspicious than if they just like tied them up and took them off. It, it's, it just is overly dramatic because like Naughty Dog wanted to have this fake out where it looked as though they had killed Nate and Sully in the first minutes of the game. And then they didn't. <laughs> We'll see this many times throughout this story where it seems as though the writers or developers, whoever came up with this, had the initial thought of like, wouldn't it be cool if we opened the game and then immediately Nate and Sully are shot, but it turns out they were shot by a double agent and they're not actually dead. And that's as far as it goes. Like nobody thinks, well, why would they need to be shot by a double agent? Wouldn't that look weird to the double agent? or to the, the boss of the double agent, like, why did you just murder these people? Because it was shocking and cool. Like, that's really as far as it goes. This is the first of many of these moments where you'll see a kitschy, classic action story element presented and then just not explored or explained or thought through really at all. It's just there because somebody said that would be cool. And that's it. Right after all of this is revealed, Chloe shows up and you realize that she's working with Cutter, Sully, and Nate. It's not overly important, but basically they're trying to steal some artifact that Marlo has that will work with this ring for some purpose that we don't know yet. They figure out that Marlo's base is nearby, so they decide that they're going to break in. Now, while we're talking about Marlo, we should get a few basic elements and things out into the air because I think it's important to understand, once again, how much effort was put into Marlowe as a villain. You see, Marlowe is a member of a secret organization that's never really developed beyond the mere mention of it. This is actually really unfortunate because I really like Marlowe as an antagonist. I think she's kind of creepy. She seems magnanimous and has a lot of gravitas. She draws my attention in whenever she's on screen and I think she could have had a lot more. Perhaps it's just her accent and posh way of carrying herself, but I find her motivations intriguing beyond simply seeking out treasures and chemical weapons for the fun of it. But this is never developed. Marlowe's motivation is effectively that she's part of an organization that is supposed to do this one thing and she's doing it. This one thing, by the way, is finding that ring that Nathan stole when he was 14 years old and that they're just now taking back offering fake money for it, even though they presumably have real money. Uh, but even that isn't super clear. It's possible that the money that was offered in that opening sequence was actually legitimate and Sully and Nate never intended to actually sell the ring or present it. They just wanted to draw Marlo out into the open so that they could pursue her secret artifact that will do something we don't know yet. Furthermore, Marlo acts as though it's a very personal pursuit for her, but we never are given a reason to believe that it is personal for her. In addition, this organization to which she claims membership is only briefly described, even though they apparently have access to two incredibly potent hallucinogenic drugs. And as we'll discuss later, potentially even magic. They might have a wizard on their side. It's actually something that's brought up, but we'll get there. And of course, in what will surprise nobody, they have seemingly endless amounts of money, being able to hire countless mercenaries, even after hundreds and thousands of them are murdered by Nate over the course of the game. Don't worry, we're not going to be discussing ludonarrative dissonance too much in this video. We discussed it a lot in the Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 1 videos. I won't beat the horse dead once again in this video. All I will say is that Nate will continue to kill hundreds 
and thousands of people without any real consideration at all. And it's just something you have to accept as part of this franchise. Like there's just no getting around it. Now, the fact that Marlo and her organization are so interesting, you would think would present the writers an interesting opportunity to expand this backstory a little bit more, but they really just don't. They just tell you it's a big, scary organization that's been around for four centuries, and that's it. It's not brought up again in any of the other games with Uncharted 4 or The Lost Legacy. It's not mentioned at all. Yet another example of something that Naughty Dog didn't think through really at all in this game. They just thought it sounded cool to have a big scary organization that's been around for four centuries and they said cool let's just do that. <laughs> and then it, it never got developed any further than that. And as proof positive you can describe every element of the game's villains in effectively just a few words, very simple sentences, and it does a very accurate job of explaining everything that's going on, which is once again, proof positive of how simplistic the writing is. Uncharted 3 has a villain who's a member of a secret organization that has endless funds and resources. She also has a sidekick, an assistant named Talbot, who's incredibly powerful and capable of many of the same maneuvers and actions that the player is. Regardless, after breaking into Marlo's facility, you eventually push in, finding this artifact that you've been looking for. Turns out that this thing works together with Nathan Drake's ring that she's also been trying to steal, and it's used to translate the text within a book that Marlo also has. So they weren't just looking for one artifact, they were looking for two, and thankfully they were stored in the exact same place right next to each other. After translating the book, not much is learned, other than that Sir Francis Drake had been hired for some sort of secret project by Queen Elizabeth I way back when, and that it had something to do with the Atlantis of the Sands. Nate and the squad find out that they need two secret items in order to progress and find the Atlantis of the Sands for some reason, so they split up. One group heading to Syria and the other group heading to France, Nate being in the French group. So Nate and Sully head together to this big abandoned mansion castle thing in the middle of a jungle that's also in the middle of France. There's not much communicated to the player as to what they should expect to find here other than that it's an old abandoned castle palace thing and that it has something to do with your pursuits. The item you're seeking is likely here, at least according to some of the research that Nate has done. I know I sound like a broken record, but really not much thought was put into why the player needs to go here in this particular castle, why the item would be here. It seems much more as though they decided they wanted to have an old castle with a bunch of caves underneath it and that that was going to be a level. And then they found some way of getting the player there that was kind of arbitrary. It's honestly not that grave of an offense. It's something developers and writers and films do all of the time. You start with a set piece and you find a way to get the viewer, audience member, player, whoever it is there. I'm willing to forgive it. I think it's just a necessary evil in the entertainment industry. And even then, I'm not sure if it's necessarily an evil itself. I think it's just a way that writers work. So I'm not burdened by it. While Nate and Sully explore the castle, eventually they come across what seems to be an old fireplace. And while they push through it, Nate falls and lands in a cave system that's underneath the castle, which thankfully is actually where they need to be. One thing to note is that there's a bunch of spider webs everywhere and spiders crawling around the walls. It may seem as though this is simply an effect of caves because there are spiders in caves, but this will actually be important later because these little buggers are going to come up again. The player eventually finds the opening of a well. You climb up, fight some enemies, and land in the courtyard of the castle. And in what is the first, in my opinion, true shooting arena of Uncharted 3, the player pushes through multiple waves of enemies within this courtyard. Once again, I could complain ad nauseum about these shooting galleries and how lackluster the combat is, but I've done that plenty in Uncharted 1 and 2 in those videos, so I'm not going to beat the horse dead again, just like the other topics with Ludo Narrative Dissonance. I'm, I'm going to leave it here. The combat isn't great. It gets worse because of the level design later on, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. For now, all I will say is that it still is 
kind of sucky, but that's it. Now, after reuniting with Sully, the two come across this body. This is one of those instances that just isn't really explained. The body seems to have had its life force sucked out of it. So how could his body be in this horrible state, seemingly very decomposed at the very least, if they just got here? And this is such a standout, bizarre moment for Nate and Sully that Nate asks, Yeah, but what could have happened to him? I had no idea, but I sure as hell don't like it. But yeah, this is never mentioned again. Now remember those spiders? Those things do attack somebody in just a few minutes. However, we have no way of knowing if this is the result of what they do. Plus, those spiders are in the underground chambers. They don't like light. That's how you repel them. So how on earth are they in this upper floor, well-lit room killing this guy? I, I don't know if it's supposed to be the spiders that did this to him or if it's supposed to be some sort of weird talbot superpower we'll get to it later but it's it's weird i have another theory as to what happened to him but i won't discuss it just yet because it'll spoil something for later so as of right now just remember this guy and remember that this is never mentioned again and there's no explanation given as to how he died and had his life force sucked out of him. There's then a few basic puzzle sequences, such as walking on different platforms that have certain symbols on them, making sure that you don't fall into the pit below. And after that, Nate and Sully continued to push their way deeper in the catacombs, pushing a table out of the way to reveal a trapdoor underneath, and then eventually landing in a cavernous system that requires the use of a torch to light your path. Now, I've had a fair number of friends that have complained about this type of thing. They don't like the cavernous sections because they all look samey and they're just not that interesting. I actually don't have an issue with it, especially because this gives the game the opportunity to use some interesting puzzles to occupy the player's time. I'm okay with it, as long as it's not the entirety of the game or a large chunk of it, but all told, I, I think these sections are fine. You then have a fairly interesting puzzle where you have to match different symbols on this, I don't know what to call it, letter board? Maybe. I don't know if these qualify as letters, but you have to match them up on the right symbols based on things that you find throughout the course of the room. It's not too difficult, but it does require at least moderate attention and a little bit of thought, which in these games is pretty much all you can ask for. His sarcophagus is still sealed and inside they find the amulet which is the object that they came to find. However, this object doesn't tell them everything they need to know. They have to go and find the other half of the amulet in Syria, which is where Cutter and Chloe have been. You then exit the tomb, immediately greeted by Talbot and some of his henchmen. They take the amulet from you, but immediately upon doing so, there's a swarm of spiders that fills the room. It's right here that these spiders attack this one guy that just took the amulet. He nicely hands off the amulet before being devoured by the spiders or something. I really don't know how he dies. He just kind of lays down after the spiders start crawling on him. So maybe they sucked the soul out of him like the guy earlier. Maybe they didn't and just bit him and poisoned him to death. I, I really don't know. Talbot and his one surviving henchman immediately exit, leaving Nate and Sully to fend for themselves. And so as the spiders begin to swarm, they find an opening that they can climb out of. However, I will say Sully drops the torch here in order to climb up even though the light seems to be the only thing that protects him and Nate from the spiders. I guess expecting that they'll just figure it out as they climb their way through the darkness. Totally unnecessary. Could have just tossed the torch up the nine feet or whatever it is onto the ledge before climbing up. It, it's just like really dumb. <laughs> And I try, there's no way to pick up the torch because that would of course make sense. And the reason that you can't be holding the torch when you get to the upper level is because the game designers wanted to have this sequence where you're running through the caverns and tunnels away from the spiders as they chase you. But if you had the torch with you, which repels the spiders, they would have no sequence here. It would just be you walking down a tunnel and there wouldn't be a cool tunnel sequence. So again, it's just they started with the idea. And even though how they get there doesn't make any sense at all, especially with the characters and the actions that they're performing, they decided eh, it doesn't matter. This sequence will be cool. So 
get over yourself. Regardless, after escaping the caves, we have a little bit of platforming and then once again, more shooting galleries. Now, almost immediately upon combat beginning, the house catches a blaze and the whole palace, mansion, castle, house thing starts to go up in flames. Walls start collapsing, ceilings start collapsing. And even in spite of this, the building is still filled with Talbot's henchmen. None of them have the self-awareness or self-preservation drive to leave <laughs> and just exit the building and wait for Nathan and Sully, shoot them once they get out of the building, if they do, which is a long shot. But instead, they still post up and like get behind cover to shoot Nathan and Sully to provide more engagement as you escape the fire. Like, it's just kind of dumb. I mean, I get it. You can't have really smart or really grounded enemies all the time. It just doesn't work. You need some sort of engagement. You could have Nathan and Sully just escape the building and that's it but it's more engaging to be escaping the burning building while you're being shot at and while you have to shoot at enemies and fight your way out. I get it. It's it's just, it's still dumb. <laughs> Regardless, Nathan and Sully continue to push their way outside of the palace, eventually finding themselves on the roof after a few basic parkour systems. And this is the first large set piece that I found really memorable in this game. Specifically that the roof starts to collapse as the tower collapses as well, coming down on the roof right behind you. It's a really cool sequence visually, it runs really well, and considering that this game launched on the PS3, it's technically very impressive. But after all of this, Nathan and Sully escape the burning inferno and head off to Syria to save Cutter and Chloe, who they've not been able to contact, and who they are very worried about, especially considering that they were followed to this French castle by Talbot's men, which means that likely Chloe and Cutter were also followed, putting their lives in extreme danger. And considering that they can't contact them, it's reason for concern. In fact, the second you get to this location in Syria, Nathan tells Sully that he still can't get a hold of either one of them. To the player, to Sully, to Nate, this probably immediately should trigger the thought, they're probably dead, or at the very least they're being held and they've been captured. Like, it's one of the two. How on earth would they not be able to contact them, especially in between the time from France traveling all the way to Syria? Like, that's that's not a quick trip. At least, you know, a couple days of not communicating at all. Like, I, I would immediately assume something was horrifically wrong, but the explanation is pretty dumb, so just buckle up. Now, the suspense doesn't last long. You pretty much walk up to this old site in Syria, go through the front door, and immediately are greeted by Chloe. And right around the corner is Cutter. A cutscene begins where all four are talking. Nate obviously is kind of confused and also frustrated because they've been trying to reach them with no word whatsoever. And Cutter explains why they haven't been able to reach them. Oh, right, I need to top up my minutes. You're using a prepaid phone? Mate, those contracts are a complete ripoff. <laughs> what? Mine's broken. Again? Look, just forget all that. Yeah, yeah, so Cutter is a cheapskate and Chloe's phone is just broken for some reason. Like this really just doesn't make any sense to me at all. The whole reason that you have the characters at the point where they can't be contacted is because you want to build suspense with the viewer, the player, Nate, Sully, believing as though something could be really wrong. This instills a hustle, a concern, an emotion. But within 30 seconds, they immediately cut it off. Nope, there's Chloe and Cutter, so nothing's wrong. Why did we do that then? Ah, because contracts are a scam, mate. It's like the whole thing was just for this one joke where Cutter could say that cell phone contracts are a complete ripoff. And that's it. And then they're like, well, but Chloe, is she going to have the same excuse for her phone not working? That eh, no, we'll just say that she, uh, we'll just say that she like has a phone, like her phone's broken or something. We'll just say that. Like, seriously, that's all this is. They set up all of that for this one stupid joke. You can't make this up. 
The other problem with this is that it's effectively like crying wolf on the part of the writers. They're saying these characters are in a dangerous situation. We need to be concerned. You need to be worried and you need to have hustle. And then they immediately go back on it. Ah, just kidding. Got you. It's a joke. So funny. And that's it. They do this so many times throughout the course of this franchise that especially by the time we hit Uncharted 4, but also by the time we reach the later stages of Uncharted 3, whenever there's a serious threat or a serious concern relating to one of the characters, the player is not going to believe it's an actual threat. So the stakes are rock bottom. And it's because of crap like this, whenever there is reason for concern, the writers effectively mock the player and think it's funny that they just wasted that time for a stupid joke about cell phone contracts. Like, I can't even begin to explain or fathom or put into words just how dumb this is. I don't know who thought this would be a good idea, but once again, it's that conflicting design philosophy that we'll see and we've already seen but we'll continue to see it throughout the course of the rest of this video because one group of people think that these kitschy funny little moments were like yeah those cell phone contracts are a ripoff is where the game should be focused and then the other group are like oh no the characters are in danger that we can use that to create some more desperation in the player and maybe have some levels where there's extra tension involved and we could up the stakes a lot and they're like no 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 we're not going to do that like it, they, their phones are just dead it's fine and that's it it's infuriating <laughs> now while we're here why don't we also touch on cutter real quick cutter as a character is relatively interesting he's funny he's uh, got claustrophobia. He's somebody that actually can be a nerd in certain instances. And in general, he's kind of funny. For me, I immediately assumed that this likable character had been set up and put into the story purely for the purpose of being killed off. And I was relatively excited for this when I first played it. I was like, okay, the whole franchise, this whole franchise long has been avoiding killing main characters. They're just, they pussy out at the last second. They're about to kill him. They foreshadow it 15 times in Uncharted 2. They foreshadow it in Uncharted 1. In 4, they'll do it a ton. In Lost Legacy, they do it a ton. And they never pull the trigger, pun intended, to actually make something happen. I thought maybe this is it. Maybe they're gonna get rid of Cutter. And it's not that I just wanna see characters die. I just wanna see consequences for stupid actions or consequences to reckless action that proves there are actual stakes and that these characters are actually in danger. But uh, don't get your hopes up either because once again, Naughty Dog is going to, let's just say, pull the, the rug out from Undercutter in the stupidest way possible to avoid killing him. So just wait and see. The group pushes their way into this old castle, eventually climbing up a tower. There's an explosion once some of the henchmen show up that blows you outside the tower. You swing around the outside. You climb back in. There's a shooting gallery because of course there is. And after you fight your way through, you reach the top of the other tower that you manage to get to. Use the map and figure out where you have to go using the constellations in the sky. I mean, I'll just say it seems kind of stupid that you would need to climb this specific tower to look at a constellation and then look underneath it in order to figure out where you're gonna go especially because where you have to go is lit up in bright blue lights and is clearly a massive entrance to something important because there are large statues on either side of it it can't be that simple can it it really can be that simple and with their newfound destination, the crew begins to run that way, immediately ambushed by people with RPGs who you quickly take out with a sniper rifle that you can find nearby. Now, I don't love the combat in this game, but I will say the sniper rifles are way better than anything else that the game gives you because it's a one shot. You can get the whole combat sequence done quickly and move on. It's unfortunate that the game continues to rely on the same trope that it will use even for Uncharted 4 and The Lost Legacy, which is specifically that they will have many different guns available to the player, but you will run out of ammo quick enough that you'll have to swap to a different one so that you're constantly juggling and swapping different weapons around based on what has ammo. I understand why they do it. I get that it forces mobility within combat and makes the player move around, not just shooting from one specific section of the arena, but actually moving around to pick up different ammunition and weapons as they become available. I get it. 
I just think it's aged really poorly, and I would like to see an Uncharted game with some Last of Us mechanics, for instance, where you have a couple weapons that you can upgrade and use over the long term, and then you find ammunition to support those individual weapons, as opposed to having to swap the whole weapon out just to get new ammo. Anyway, the group continues to push on with Nate and Cutter eventually getting separated from Sully and Chloe. It's not particularly important as to why, because they are almost immediately reunited. Like literally, I think it was three minutes later within the gameplay that I was reunited. So I'm not sure if this was supposed to lead to some more difficult puzzle or more elaborate sequence where the two groups were separated, or perhaps it's purely set up here so that Nate and Cutter can share some funny, quirky dialogue. I really don't know, but they're not separated for very long. Once the group is reunited, Talbot shows back up out of absolutely nowhere, is able to shoot Cutter with a dart of some sort that seems to control his mind because Talbot's able to request his gun and the journal and Cutter acting like a dazed sheep hands it all over. Furthermore, Talbot tells Cutter that he shouldn't trust Nathan Drake. Now, it seems as though this substance that was on the dart that Cutter got shot with is some sort of mind control agent. He'll believe whatever he's told while he's under the influence of it, and he'll do whatever he's asked to do whenever he's under the influence of it. But weirdly, he'll only do what Talbot asks him to do when he's under the influence of this, I guess, compound is what you'd say. Now, the only reason Talbot was able to do this is because Cutter was separated from the group for just a moment. Basically, the other three were around a corner. He hadn't crossed the corner yet when he had been shot with this dart. However, right after Cutter hands Talbot the journal, Nathan comes back around the corner to check on Cutter, where he sees Talbot right there. Talbot walks slowly away, back around a corner. I'm not joking into a solid brick wall and disappears. Yet another thing that just is never explained at all. I'm not joking. Like, you would think of all of the things to explain, it would be a character in a cutscene, which is how you know it's canonical, seemingly disappearing into thin air. Like, if I wrote a story and a character seemed capable of teleportation, and I didn't explain it, I would consider that to be a major failing on my part. However, here it's just never explained at all. It's sort of implied that he might be some sort of teleporting wizard or that he might just be some sort of black ops operative that's able to walk through brick walls. Who knows? But this is the issue is that like, the story isn't finished. This is never explained at all. I have a theory as to what they were going to try and do to explain this away that we'll touch on in just a little bit after Talbot does even more crazy stuff. But until we get there, just remember these two simple things. One, the man whose life was sucked out of his body in the upper story of that chateau. And two, that Talbot seemingly can control minds using a very simple substance and that he can apparently teleport in and out of brick walls. So remember that. Now without the journal, it's gonna be a lot harder for the group to push inside of the castle, but they eventually find their way in. It's a tight and confined space, and as the group pushes through, Cutter, who has already expressed that he is very claustrophobic, begins to freak out, still under the effect of whatever hallucinogenic or mind-altering substance he was injected with. And upon pushing through, Cutter immediately starts freaking out and attacking Nate. And again, this is why I think that this substance isn't simply a mind control drug where somebody will just do whatever they're told because they tell him to stop fighting Nate many times and he doesn't. So for some reason, this substance makes it so Cutter can have his mind controlled, but only by Talbot for some reason. But anyway, Cutter and Nate fight it out for about 90 seconds, eventually with Cutter giving up and letting go after almost killing Nate. With the mind control substance seemingly wearing off, Cutter expresses confusion as to what just happened. I don't blame him. 
I'd be pretty confused too. But the group moves past it pretty quickly. You push into a simple puzzle room where you have to ignite some braziers which project lights onto a globe. And then we have another section with the spiders where you have to use these torches to light your path, pushing the spiders off of certain platforms before jumping onto them. To me, this serves as further evidence that the spiders didn't suck the soul out of that guy because if they really were some sort of hyper-powerful or supernatural spider that could do that to somebody, it's very unlikely that the exact same spiders would show up in Syria, whereas the other ones were in France, still like completely alive after 400 years. You could say maybe it was that uh, Sir... Francis Drake brought these spiders with him and kind of spread them all throughout the world and they just posted up. But the fact that they're still here after 400 years is a bit of a stretch. Or perhaps it's as simple as the team spent all of this time and effort developing this system for spiders being afraid of the light and attacking the player when they were in the darkness that they said, eh, we don't really want to use that for just one level. Let's use it for two. So they just copy and pasted it into a new level and new sequence a little bit later in the game. That's probably more likely the case, but still I can try and explain it away in a more clever way. At least I'm putting more effort into explaining these things than the developers did. Ugh. The other kind of sucky thing about this level is that because you have to use these torches to light the braziers, they have to infinitely replenish the torches, otherwise it's possible that you could miss your throw, it doesn't ignite, and then you're just soft locked and you're screwed. You can't progress unless you reload to a previous save. I actually think I would probably prefer that over just the infinite torches. Maybe there's a series of like three or four around each brazier, so you effectively have four attempts at getting the torch throws right. And if you screw it up, then the light slowly fades and then the spiders come up, eat you, and it reloads to the previous save when the torches were still there. I think something like that would at least be grounded, but I understand that maybe for some people they don't care that much and it just isn't important. Once you've done this, a spiral staircase drops down and you're able to climb up into the tomb, which contains the sarcophagus of yet another knight who possesses the other half of the medallion. Thankfully, Nathan sketched all of these pieces down in his notebook, so it doesn't actually matter that Talbot has the other half of the medallion now because they have the note containing the same information. Once they compare the two, they figure out exactly where they need to go in Yemen. However, in one of the most weirdly staged and stilted moments, probably of this entire game, Cutter interjects randomly to say that he's going to carry this half of the medallion out of the castle for some reason. Cutter, who just had a mind control substance used on him and he proved so susceptible to it that the bad guy was able to steal two different items from him in the span of about 10 seconds. That guy is the one that wants to carry this half of the medallion for some reason and nobody questions him on it at all. Nobody goes, eh, Cutter, buddy, you just had a mind control substance used on you. I'll take it until you're feeling better. Chloe could have said it. Nate could have said, screw you, man, I'm gonna carry it. Sully could have said it, but no, everybody's just like, okay, take it, sure, I don't care. It's pretty dumb, especially considering what's about to happen. The crew climbs out of the catacombs and Talbot presents himself with more henchmen. The two groups are separated by a large chasm after a bridge collapsed many, many years ago, and the two groups are at a standoff, both aiming their weapons at each other. However, almost immediately upon seeing Talbot, Cutter begins kind of freaking out, and then he turns and points the gun at Nathan. Talbot, very pleased that his mind control drug seems to still be working, tells the others in the group to drop their weapons. And with Nathan looking down the barrel of a gun, they all do so. Talbot, very pleased with himself, now commands Cutter to shoot Nathan. However, then Cutter turns and actually shoots Talbot. So he was faking being under the influence of some sort of mind control drug uh, in order to get his whole team to drop their weapons so that he could just shoot the bad guy and then the other henchmen would start to unload on them. 
I guess if he wanted to shoot Talbot, he could have just done it while he was aimed at him before and while his friends still had their guns in their hands. But instead, he gets all of his friends to throw away their weapons and then shoots the guy. And then all of the bullets start coming in. It just doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense other than to be like, oh, cool. Cutter like faked that he was still under the mind control substance so that he could take down the bad guy with his guard down. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, this whole moment was purely crafted, not because it makes sense for Cutter to do this. In fact, it's objectively a really dumb thing to do. Disarm your friends and then piss off the bad guys by shooting their leader. Doesn't make any sense at all. It was purely done to disarm the player so that right after this sequence happens, the player has to run through a very specific route triggering a cutscene where the player character, Nate, doesn't have a weapon in order to offer any sort of support to Cutter, who's going to be caught further behind. Again, the writers decided where they wanted this chapter to end, and then they fit everything around that pretty poorly. They needed Cutter to have the medallion on him, even though it objectively doesn't make sense for him to carry it when other people in the group are able to. And they also needed the player to be completely unarmed at the end of this sequence so that they couldn't interfere reasonably with anything else that was going on. And so that also Nathan in the middle of this cutscene would have no way of retaliating or fighting back the bad guys which were pushing up and would force Cutter to do something that's not great. What is that something? Well, the group runs to the top of a tower, leaps to a platform just below, but with Nathan landing on the platform, part of it collapses, being too far for Cutter to jump. This leaves Cutter standing on the tower all by himself, Talbot reappearing seemingly fine. Yet again, Talbot. Not only can he teleport and use mind control substances, but he also apparently can survive direct gunshot wounds to the chest, which granted is not anything new to this series. Sully is very familiar with that, but still we're getting kind of silly. Now the bullet definitely hit him, but there's no evidence of it hitting him at all. His suit isn't even moderately scuffed. And I thought maybe this was just because, you know what, it's a PS3 game. Maybe they just didn't do model swaps when a character got shot. But the opening to this game shows Nathan and Sully getting shot and immediately blood seeps through their shirts. So you know they got shot. In this case, Talbot gets shot and is fine to the point where there's not even a hole in his suit even though he was definitely hit by that bullet. So we're left with two possibilities. Either he has some sort of supernatural ability to survive gunshots and immediately repair not just himself, but also his clothes of gunshot wounds, or the bullet didn't hit him. And if the bullet didn't hit him, then he, for some reason, mimed this whole spin fall thing that he did for some reason, like both options suck and don't make any sense at all. But that's what we're left with. Regardless, Cutter loses the medallion because of course he did. And of course he was the one carrying it. And this had to happen because the writers needed Marlowe to have some reason or way of knowing where to go next. And as a cherry on top of the stupid pie, do you think they just kill Cutter? Even though that makes sense? No, no. They uh, bring out gas cans that Marlowe has had her henchmen bring up to the top of this tower preemptively, okay? They brought these up, they pour it out onto the wood slats on top of the tower, and then she lights a match, I guess, to kill him? Because the assumption would be that the fire will either engulf him lighting him on fire and killing him, or that he'll be forced to leap to his death. You know, bullets work pretty well too, but I guess this, you know, this is like the most passive aggressive way to kill somebody ever. Uh, it's ridiculous. I thought maybe this was because Marlowe has some sort of 
repulsion towards killing people or maybe like religiously or based on her beliefs and her organization, she can't directly kill somebody. So she has to basically push them into situations where they would kill themselves, if that makes sense. So instead of just shooting Cutter and killing him that way, she decided to light this platform on fire, which will force him to leap to his death, which would in effect kill him but it would be suicide so she's not actually to blame morally so she can get it like around that moral dilemma that way but, i mean it's still killing people <laughs> and at the very least that could be a fairly interesting narrative character element to explore especially at the end of the game where you could have marlo in a situation where her only way towards victory is to kill Nathan Drake and, and turn the player, but she can't do that according to her dogma and moral code. So instead, she finds some sort of obscure way of trying to force the player into a situation where they would kill themselves. That that way, you know, she's not morally responsible. That would be at least somewhat interesting. But if that is what's going on, it's never said or explored or spoken at all. It's just not. Instead, Marlo and Talbot decide to light this platform on fire, turning around and leaving before they find out what Cutter actually does. So they don't see him jump off. They don't see him burn to death. They just light this fire and leave, which means that they don't see what he does next, which is that he leaps to the bottom, which clearly this is a height that should probably kill you to be honest. I mean, this has to be 40, 50 feet. It, it's pretty high. But instead, he jumps off and just breaks his leg. A and that's it. Um, he's fine. <laughs> and the amazing thing is that Cutter isn't in the rest of the game. He's not. He's out after this. So they could have killed him off as a result of his stupidity for taking the medallion and being the last one on the tower. But instead they just don't, they break his leg and uh, you never see him again. It's mind blowing. Like seriously, they basically killed him off because you don't see him again and he's out of the story, but they didn't have the balls to actually kill him off. So instead they just break his leg and then he's out of commission. Like what? <laughs> And to finish it out, you have one last major shooting gallery while you escort Cutter out and on to the bus. In the bus, the group reevaluates their options but decides they need to push on. However, Cutter is going to be down for the count and out of commission. We then transition to Yemen, where Nate and Soli have just landed, and you're immediately greeted by Elena. She happens to be here doing some sort of reporting for some story that she's doing, which is how she gets these press passes to allow Nate and Soli into the depths of the city. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love Elena as a character. I think she's funny, witty, insightful, and she balances out some of the negative sides of Nate really, really well. Now, she doesn't do a whole lot in the course of this game, story she is here for a little bit but she definitely is not going to be a major character in the story so don't get your hopes up nonetheless elena shows you the ropes and nate and elena share some dialogue with each other the most important element of the conversation though is when elena and nate are talking about sully she specifically warns him that he would go to the ends of the earth for nate and that he shouldn't ask him to this is yet another occasion where naughty dog is very clearly signaling that Sully would kill himself, or at least put himself into extremely dangerous situations, in order to protect and serve Nathan. Nathan keeps asking him to do that, and eventually his luck will run out and those decisions will catch up to him. That's what any reasonable person would read into these statements. However, it's not going to go anywhere. I mean, for real. They chickened out killing off Cutter, who's not in the rest of the game at all, and who was only introduced, like, to the player, maybe five, six hours of gameplay before this. There's very little mental or emotional attachment there, and they couldn't kill him off. So do you really think they're going to kill Sully off? 
No. Again, it's crying wolf. When you do this repeatedly, you end up in these really sucky situations where the writers are trying to raise the stakes, but you just don't buy into it because they've done that so many times and it just has never worked. Anyway, Elena, Sully, and Nate begin to explore a bazaar. She's got the press pass, which allows you to explore the depths of the city in more detail than you would have been able to explore otherwise. And you get to see some pretty interesting set pieces, such as this one when you're on top of this building and you get to overlook the city. It's really beautiful. And you can see just how far Naughty Dog has come with regards to their world building. The fact that they can build out this city so well, it looks like an actual city, even though the section that you're gonna be able to actually explore is very, very minimal. Very early on, you see Talbot, who's also exploring the city. Upon seeing Talbot, Nate immediately breaks off from Elena and Sully. Why he felt the need to do this, I don't know, but he does it. And immediately upon doing so, he's ambushed by Talbot, who proceeds to beat the crap out of him. However, in the process of this beating, Nate is actually able to swipe Cutter's notebook that Talbot had just stolen in the chapter before. We're then presented with another fist fighting section, one of the plethora that you have to go through over the course of this game. You're then reunited with Sully and Elena, but now you have Cutter's notebook, which I guess is why Nathan needed to be separated. There's then a brief discussion that Nate, Sully, and Elena have specifically with regards to Cutter, who Elena knows fairly well. And the funniest thing about this is that the writers are so aware of how ridiculous it is that Cutter just broke his leg and then bowed out of the story. Even Nathan expresses that this is pretty unlikely. Wait, what was? He's not dead. No, no, him and Chloe. Wait, Chloe too? Yeah, but they both bowed out when Cutter broke his leg. He broke his leg? He's lucky he didn't break his damn neck or fall like that. He's fine. Just between that and burning to death, I think I would have jumped too. Again, I don't know why they would have these two conflicting things. Like, on the one hand, the characters think it's ridiculous that this thing just happened. And then on the other hand, the thing just happened. And it's almost like they're teasing and mocking each other at the same time. It really seems as though like the smaller level writers who are writing the individual dialogue for like this particular scene didn't like these big, broad decisions that were being made with regards to the story, likely by Amy Hennig, where it's like, we're going to kill off Cutter. He's going to jump and he's going to die after falling off the tower. She's like, no, 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 he's just going to break his leg and then he'll he'll get off. We don't want to do that. It's going to be, be too much of a downer. We don't want to do that. So the writer's like, okay, I mean, you make the decisions, but we're gonna tease it and make fun of it in a cutscene right after it happens. It's just really funny to me. So moving on. You eventually climb into yet another set of catacombs and there's a small puzzle where you have to stand on a particular stone and match up the pillars based on the perspective that's reflected on the paper itself. It's a pretty quick and easy puzzle. It's not too difficult, but again, it requires just a little bit of attention and mental effort. So it, it's better than most in this franchise, especially in the games prior to this one. So. I think it's fine. After solving this puzzle, you're led into the depths of the chamber. It seems to be some sort of temple or at the very least highly ornate chamber of some sort. Maybe I missed the dialogue expressing what this would have been used for. I usually like it in these games when there's an actual like purpose for what this clue or building is. Like in Uncharted 4 with the clock tower. Clearly that has a purpose and there's a reason for it to still exist and be used in a certain capacity. It just also happens to double as a clue. It's like hiding a clue for a treasure hunt in plain sight. I love that kind of thing. But in this case, this seems to be an incredibly ornate structure of some sort that exists purely to offer, I guess, direction to travelers looking for the Atlantis of the Sands. But again, this is just one of those things that you accept in these types of stories and games and films. You just acknowledge it and then move on. I mean, again, the whole premise doesn't make a lot of sense. So to nitpick it because it doesn't make a lot of sense is just pedantic. So I'm not going to do that. We'll just move on. There's also a super cool optical illusion in here. These statues have these inverted heads, which means that you have an optical illusion whenever you walk forward. It looks as though their heads are turning and staring at you. It made me do like a, a double, hell, even a triple take when I saw this because I thought their heads were moving to look at me. It's just 
really cool. I don't know why this is super memorable to me and stood out, but I thought that this was awesome. But after getting more information, figuring out where you need to go next, yet more spiders show up. Yeah, two locations wasn't enough, so Naughty Dog needed to throw these things in three separate locations to get their full use out of them. Like, it'd be one thing if these were super cool and engaging and fun, uh, or at the very least, if he did something more interesting with them, like they did in the Playtale Innocence with the rats. But in this case, they just kind of suck and you have to just deal with it because they're going to use them time and time and time again. Probably the worst part is once the torches go out, you have to start shooting clumps of them to get them off the walls and prevent them from coming and attacking Sully, Nate, and Elena as they deal with this door that's jammed. I just really hate this. It's not clear where you're supposed to shoot. It's not really clear whether the shotgun shells are actually doing anything to the spiders. And in reality, there's nothing that you have to do here other than just buy time. And it seems as though this sequence is timed specifically around you running out of ammo. So you have to get through the shotgun shells as quickly as you can. And once you do that, you're able to move on to the next cutscene and get your way under the door. But that's it. You just have to use all your ammo and then it triggers the next sequence. It It's just, it's stupid. <laughs> But either way, after you go under the door, you reach the upper level of the palace and find yourself in the center of a large bazaar. However, almost immediately upon entering the bazaar with Sully and Elena, Nate is shot with one of these same darts that hit Cutter. He tells Sully and Elena to run because he can feel himself freaking out. Now granted, considering how hard they've been trying to kill Nate over the course of this game, you would think that if they had a clear enough shot where they were able to shoot him dead in the back of the neck with a dart, surely a bullet would have done just as well. But no, 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 it's a it's a dart which makes him just kind of freak out and trip a little bit and that's it. The player and Nate then share what can only be described as an insane acid trip with the perspective shifting as you run through these different alleyways. It's initially kind of cool, but it goes on for an uncomfortably long amount of time. It, it Like, I actually thought I was soft locked when we were playing this on stream because it just kept going on and on and on. Like, maybe I was actually doing something wrong. Maybe there actually is a glitch where it just keeps cycling and spinning and spinning. Maybe I took a wrong turn and just kept going in a circle. I don't know. But it lasted uncomfortably long. It's like, again, they had this one cool thing, which was this cool camera shift to make it look like you were high. And then they're like, well, we don't want to just use this for 15 seconds, even though that's really all that feels good. So instead, let's use it for like a solid two minute sequence, which isn't that fun. And it's just kind of confusing because we want to show it off and not let it go to waste. Anyway, eventually you find the light and break out of this delusion. Nate wakes up with Marlowe sitting at a table with him, looking at the ring that he's been carrying around his neck all this time. But at this point, it's not actually important that she has this ring as far as I can tell, because the only reason she needed it was for that decoder, which would have led them to the two locations that would have the medallion. So at this point, the ring is not actually important other than just being a memento. So it's kind of a dick move to take it, but I digress. I mean, she did kind of like force someone to jump off of a roof trying to kill them. So I guess dick moves are not unknown to her. So it's not really a surprise, but still. Here she flexes some of her power, showing off a lot of the research that she did on Nathan Drake. There's all sorts of background checks, pictures of Elena, pictures of his booking photos from when he was a kid to when he was an adult, and she rattles off a bunch of information about his childhood. And it's here that she rattles off a bunch of harming and frustrating information for Nathan, things that he's not proud about, things that he doesn't want the public to know, things that he doesn't want Elena to know, things that he himself wishes he could forget. This sequence will be important to bring up when we discuss Uncharted 4 as well, because if anybody could have found out about Nathan's brother Sam and what actually happened to him, it would have been Marlo when she was doing all of this research, because after all, the only person that was able to figure it out in that game was Rafe, who also was only able to figure it out because he had a lot of money, which seemingly Marlo has as well. And if she's doing the same research on him that Rafe did, surely she'd be able to find out the same thing. But of course, this comes as no real surprise because, of course, Sam was likely only written into Uncharted 4 to give 
Troy Baker some reason to work with the studio once more to buy him over until they started work on The Last of Us Part Two. So it's not really a surprise, but still. After a brief conversation, Nate breaks away and starts chasing Talbot down the same city streets that he was just tripping through. I actually think that this is when Naughty Dog is at their best and specifically Uncharted is at their best when they have these larger sequences built around basic gameplay mechanics such as the parkour systems and light combat. They also get to flex their creativity with regards to level design and show off the beautiful attention to detail that their artists are able to employ. This whole sequence is super fluid. It's beautiful. It's interesting. It feels as though you're actually running through a lived in city. It's fantastic. After a long chase, eventually Nathan and Talbot end up by a fountain. Nathan knocks down Talbot, but is immediately knocked over the head with a two by four, incapacitating him. We then cut to black and wake up in a pirate ship. I'm not joking. Not like a, you know, ARG pirate ship, but like a Somalian, I'm the captain now pirate ship, that kind of thing. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. And uh, this will lead into one of the most bizarre moments I've had in any game in a while. You see this guy, Ramses, he's the pirate captain, and he's the one that kidnapped you. Apparently he was hired to kill you and take you out, but he's actually keeping you alive because he wants you to help lead him to this Atlantis of the seas because the fame and fortune will be cool. Now, over the course of this conversation with the pirate captain, he tells you that he's also kidnapped Sully and that Sully is likely going to die as a result of all of the torture they're inflicting on him. Once again, setting up the idea that Sully could die. And we get, once again, another hand-to-hand -hand fist fighting sequence that goes on entirely too long. Again, it could just be that I'm spoiled nowadays, but these sequences just really have not aged well. And after having a few discussions with people who played this game at launch, it seems as though even back then, those fans never actually thought that this was a good mechanic or one worthy of all of the time Naughty Dog gave it. I mean, especially when you compare the other hand-to-hand -hand combat systems that were in contemporary titles with similar budgets to this game, such as the Batman Arkham games, which were releasing around this time as well. Again, I get it. These games are not about the gameplay, but still, if you're going to put something in front of the player 15 times, you should at least make it somewhat enjoyable. But going back to the broader discussion of this sequence on these ships and what will eventually be a cruise ship, this whole part of the game feels remarkably out of place. It feels as though we were on track to make some real progress in the story. The stakes were rising. Nate and Elena were talking again, and we were even going to get some drama surrounding the main villain. But instead, the player randomly gets kidnapped by pirates who want their cut of the treasure in exchange for not killing you after being paid by Marlowe to do just that. You know, as I'm saying this out loud, I realize I'm just describing the plot of the mummy. So it could just be that that's all Uncharted 3 is, but, but still. It, it's just, it's stupid. I mean, I love Brendan Fraser just as much as the next guy, but that movie even felt kitschy in the 90s. I think it launched in 99. So for this game a decade later to be using the same exact plot line, like it's just not, it's not great. Also, by the way, if you want me to try a critique of a film, The Mummy would be a great one for us to tackle first. If you want to see that, let me know in the comment section below. We'd probably have to do it on Patreon just because of copyright stuff. I'd put it up on like Vimeo private access and then you could get access to it through the Patreon page. I don't know. We'd have to figure it out. But if you'd be interested in me critiquing more movies, TV shows, that type of thing, let me know. More than anything, I'm just dying for an excuse to talk about like the mummy movies. I think that'd be super fun. Anyway, Nathan pushes his way through an abandoned shipwreck yard. I mean, it's just a bunch of abandoned ships. All of the levels are super, I, I don't know how to even describe it, disjointed. Of course, with all of these being ships, everything is floating and shifting. The flat planes are waving back and forth in the water. It's cool and I'm sure it was really difficult to get this system working and playable, but it's done in a way 
where it just makes everything far more clunky than I think they meant it. Because all these platforms are constantly shifting, cover never really works properly, especially because if you're in cover here and then the water comes and drops you, you're no longer in cover because the person can shoot down on top of you. And the cover system isn't robust enough to account for that. There's no going prone, there's no higher cover for you to use. You're just kind of screwed if this happens. Furthermore, they encourage you to use a lot of verticality, climbing up the masts and different levels of these different ships as the water lifts them and lowers them accordingly. And because this leads to platforms being mismatched, you can find yourself hanging on a ledge with another ledge directly adjacent, raising up, clipping into you, which in some cases can cause you to fall through the map. In other cases, it can cause you to just jump when you don't mean to jump. It basically breaks the free climbing system. But regardless, they use this opening sequence in this junkyard to push the player into a situation where they would eventually be found on a cruise ship. But regardless, they use this whole section in this abandoned shipyard to get you onto a couple of boats that were sailing towards a large abandoned cruise ship that is occupied by these pirates. These shooting arenas that you have to fight through are the same as any other, except now they're moving. So worse <laughs> but eventually you're able to climb onto the cruise ship and i actually think that this is visually and in terms of design probably one of the most interesting moments of the game but in terms of where it fits in uncharted 3 as a game it's really out of place for one most of the rest of the story of uncharted 3 takes place within villages markets and ruins. It can all start to feel incredibly samey. Even the content directly prior to this chapter felt very samey to what we had seen in Uncharted 2 and in the opening of Uncharted 3. This cruise ship, however, is pretty interesting visually. Now, it could be that I just think of it as a pretty cool sequence because it comes after what I think is the worst moment of probably the first three Uncharted games, which is the shipwreck yard specifically. It could have been a cool series of levels and shooting galleries with the water constantly changing the levels of engagement, making traversal interesting, allowing for some really novel set piece changes. However, instead we ended up with, like I said, one of the most poorly optimized levels in any Naughty Dog game ever. Even in the Nathan Drake remastered collection, it's glitchy, it comes off as poorly thought through, it feels incredibly repetitive, and has an over-reliance on the free climbing sections that are also broken thanks to those changing levels that I just mentioned. Once Nathan actually reaches the cruise ship, it's a breath of fresh air. The structure is mostly intact, the floors are level, and there's far fewer glitches. Unfortunately, though, the game immediately throws you back into the same shooting arenas that they've been forcing down your throat for the last few hours. But thankfully, it doesn't take too long before you reach the bottom of the hold and you find who you think is Sully. Preparing for the worst, especially considering that Naughty Dog just braced the player and Nate repeatedly for the death of Sully, you take off the bag that's over this individual's head, expecting to see Sully's lifeless body. However, there's no head attached. It's not that he was beheaded, this this just isn't, this isn't a guy. Now just take a moment and think about this. The pirate captain said that he had Sully captured, which is how he was going to force Nate to help him. This makes sense after all. He's going to hold Sully's life against Nate so that Nate has to help him find the treasure. But it turns out that the captain never actually had Sully. He lied. And so we just ended up doing all of this for no reason at all. And I could see some gamers being peeved that they just went through the worst section of the game and possibly the worst series of levels that Naughty Dog has ever created for absolutely no reason. But I can forgive this. The idea that the pirate captain would lie to Nate makes sense to me. What I have trouble forgiving, though, is that the captain comes out of nowhere just to make this series of shipyard levels possible. And at the end of this sequence, Nate is literally going to wash up on a shore, go back to Elena, and then in the next sequence, you're going to chase down Sully, which will take place the following morning. Seriously, this whole series of chapters could have just been cut, and it literally would have changed nothing about the story. Like, at all. If the pirate captain showed up earlier in the story, or if he showed up later, still trying to get access to the treasure, I would be more forgiving. But the worst levels in this entire game are literally a waste of time for the player 
and Nate. Now, the other way you can forgive this type of thing is if the set piece is really cool. For instance, there's a ton of really cool set pieces in Uncharted 4 and The Lost Legacy that we'll discuss in those critiques in the coming weeks and months. The story justification for going to those set pieces is often really flimsy, if existent at all, but the set pieces are cool. So who cares? In this case, there's no impact on the story whatsoever. There is no reason for Nate to be at this shipyard, and there's no reason for this pirate to have any participation in this story. Furthermore, once you reach the bottom of the cruise ship's hold, you'll realize that Sully isn't actually there, and you need to evaluate a couple of things once this happens. For one, the pirate captain would have had to order his men to place a chair in the cargo hold, put clothes on it, stuffed with something to make it look like a person was slouched over in it and then prop up a paper bag on top of the Hawaiian shirt just so that it happens to look like something Sully would wear and pretend to tie up this imaginary person on that chair. The only reason that the pirate captain would do this would be to try and lure Nate to the cargo hold to get him close to that chair so that you could presumably get the jump on him if he happened to break free. And this only makes sense to do once Nate breaks out, which only leaves around 15 to 20 minutes for the pirate captain to decide that that's a good idea and order his men to do it instead of having those men stand guard or help try and take Nate down outside the cargo hold. And I know it's probably overkill to explain this in such great detail, but I want to highlight just how little sense this particular staging makes. There is no reason that the captain should have done this other than to get the jump on Nate. Why isn't the chair rigged with C4? We know that the pirates have it. They've used it just prior to this. Or why isn't there one of his men with a grenade launcher aimed at it, which again, we know that they have access to. That guy could have that rocket launcher aimed at Nate, ready to blow him to smithereens the second he got close to his stuffed friend. But instead, Nate gets close enough to take the head off, realize that Sully is not there, and then the pirate captain gives a long monologue in the traditional campy bad guy style only to have Nate throw a grenade that blows a hole in the ship. Oh, and shoot the captain. And break free while sinking the entire ship. I get it. You could just say that the pirates are idiots, and perhaps that's true. But at some point, the story stops making sense, and you're making excuses to push the characters in various directions to play out the story that you want them to tell. In this case, Amy Hennig and her team clearly wanted Nate to get into this cruise ship, cause it to sink, and have to escape it while it goes down. That was the entire basis for this quarter of the game. It doesn't matter that it makes no sense within the story itself. It doesn't matter that it's a total waste of time. It doesn't matter that it's a glitchy and unfun mess. And it doesn't matter that the characters specifically designed for this section of the game have to behave in a completely irrational way in order to achieve that outcome that they decided that they wanted. And this is the reason that Uncharted 4 will feel so different from Uncharted 3. After this game, and more notably after Amy Hennig had departed from Naughty Dog, these games will take a markedly different approach to the story outline and what they put the player through. They're not going to be a complete waste of the player's time just for sake of a set piece, except for in a couple very, very small instances. Whereas in Uncharted 3, these narrative detours can take up literally a quarter of the runtime of the title for no reason at all, as in this case. Seriously, nothing in the following games will even approach this level of carelessness. But with all of that said, the process of escaping the ship is actually pretty cool. It's a fun idea to literally take a level and flip it on its head. Climbing through these rooms where customers would have stayed when the ship was actually in operation, trying to escape, seeing the water levels rise through this massive skylight, it's all really cool. And it's certainly one of the most memorable parts of the game. It just sucks that for 30 seconds of novelty, they felt it was worth sacrificing a quarter of the game's runtime. And of course, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but if I were the game's developers, I probably would have cut this whole sequence out. It's cool and all, but to waste hours and hours of the player's time through countless bland and unfun levels just so that you can show off 30 seconds of cool visuals escaping a sinking ship, it's just unjustifiable in my mind. But regardless, Nate escapes the ship. He washes ashore in Yemen, having not drowned. 
thankfully and miraculously. He's able to find Elena somehow in this village that he washed up on and is soon informed that Sully was actually captured by Marlowe, but is actually part of her convoy on the way to the Atlantis of the Sands, not actually with the pirates. I mean, setting aside that it doesn't really make sense that Marlowe would take Sully and not Nate, because Nate seems to be the brains of the operation, or at the very least, it doesn't make sense why she wouldn't take both of them, why she would just hand off Nate to pirates to be killed, when again, she could have either killed Nate herself or just brought him along until they found the treasure and then killed him or given him to pirates. It's all very contrived. Nate and Elena share a pretty cute moment and exchange of dialogue where she allows him to rest while also comforting him. It's an innocent moment and it's one that's pretty sweet. They decide that the next morning they're going to try and become stowaways on this cargo plane, which will lead them to where Sully is being held. This whole sequence was of course spoiled in the trailers and the advertising before the game's launch, so I won't go into too much detail, but basically you get to ride on top of this Jeep that Elena is driving, climb onto the landing gear and become a stowaway on the plane as it takes off. It's actually a really cool sequence. It's done really, really well. It's visually engaging it, it just in general looks really cool and is fun so props and this transition of climbing onto the landing gear the camera lifting with the plane as it takes off you see elena slowly drift away into the distance it's all really really well done now climbing through the plane nate and a large brute get into a scruff the brute opens up the loading dock door at the back of the plane apparently to just throw nate off and out of the plane and once again we get a fist fighting sequence because naughty dog loves these in this game and after downing the brute you actually unlatch one of the cargo crates which flings off and knocks him out of the plane however this unlatches for some reason all of the cargo in the plane which in turn kicks nate out as well now lagging behind a plane that in all likelihood would have crashed long before it got this bad nate climbs back onto the plane by climbing up this long chain of cargo that's falling out again this was all spoiled if you looked at the physical copy of the game or if you looked at any of the marketing materials before the game's launch so it's not really surprising that the plane breaks apart and crashes and nate survives but it doesn't change the fact that this is a really cool sequence where nate drifts off to another piece of cargo is able to pull Pull the latch on the parachute in what can only be described as a vertigo laden nightmare and nate lands safely on the ground i will say however this was a cargo plane filled with cargo and nate doesn't take any cargo or even look around before leaving like you'd think at the very least he'd check around maybe get some extra food maybe some water like surely they have a, a first aid kit or something maybe one of the guys has sunscreen or even just a hoodie that he could wear to protect himself in the desert sun. Like, take five minutes, bro. Look around before you leave hiking through the desert. <laughs> like, come on. But no, they wanted to have these moments where you're wandering through the desert, hallucinating and seeing mirages and things. And that can't really happen if a character is really healthy and hydrated. So instead, they just have him not look through the plane at all, even though that's what literally anybody in their right mind would do you wander through the desert eventually coming up on a village after like a solid 10 minutes of just walking across dunes it's really bizarre how long it takes but you know what maybe they're just trying to make us sympathetic with nate and just as bored as he is walking across all this sand who knows by the time you get to the village nate is completely dehydrated starved and incredibly weak. However, you do find your way into an underground well and find a little puddle of water. You drink it up, which you think would rejuvenate you just a little bit, but Nate says it's undrinkable and stops drinking. But he's not going to drink anything else in the village, uh, like at all. And here, he's totally fine after all of this. Like, totally fine. They did this in Uncharted 2 as well, where Nate gets severely injured, but is still able to do superhuman things the second he needs to. I get it. It's a video game. You have to kind of have these bizarre rules of life being broken. Like if a game was fully grounded to the point where like you need to use the bathroom, you need to eat three square meals a day. 
it probably wouldn't be that fun. But still, I mean, I'm just saying if you're going to have an entire section of the plot set up around the fact that Nate is incredibly dehydrated and starving, and then you're just never going to address it or solve that issue for the character, it just comes off as like you forgot to handle it. You know, <laughs> like, oh no, Nathan Drake is starving and he's, he's super dehydrated. He's on death's door and he's hallucinating. Okay. We have a combat sequence. Oh, were we going to have him drink something? Eh, no, nah, screw that. We're just going to get back into it. The player will probably forget too. And then they move on again. It's just a very early two thousands. Like, eh, the player won't care that much. We'll just move on. It's that philosophy that I think has aged so poorly. We then have a ton of shooting arenas eventually with you finding somebody that is willing to help you escape for some reason and you ride off on a horse out into the desert further again i know it might just be me this is just so the mummy to me like the american bad boy archaeologist treasure hunter dude is here in the middle of nowhere and then this really specifically dressed arab that is like protecting this sacred location comes out to help him but also to fight him at the same time because he wants to protect that city it, like it's just so it's so mummy i don't know how else to put it now this guy basically explains what's going on at the city where you're headed to the atlantis of the sands and he tells you effectively that there is the power of a djinn there and it caused people to basically go insane. And that is likely why Marlowe and those people are going there because they want to take the djinn for themselves and use its power to rule the world. And um, for me, I, I thought immediately like, oh great, here we go again, more supernatural stuff. But you're gonna see that they, they even chicken out on that and they're not gonna pursue that explanation of what's happening so you ride with salim chasing the convoy this actually is the early ps3 version of what we would eventually see in the e3 trailer for uncharted 4 in the madagascar level you're jumping from truck to truck shooting and uh shifting platforms as you go and the set piece of course is constantly changing because the cars are driving along a set road it's pretty cool to see this thing running and the fact that this was designed for the ps3 is honestly very impressive but you fight your way up eventually coming across sully and saving him the newfound team eventually finds their way to a sandstorm and they're told to push on through this is sort of the gate that protects the city again this is so mummy i love it you push through, open the door, and see right there. There it is, the, the Atlantis of the Sands. Uh, huh, that was easy. This place is called Ubar. It's very well realized. It's a beautiful city. Lots of ornate decorations. It, it's just really visually very fascinating. Uh, again, it's the classic issue of... Uh, Uncharted, where these big cities with open air above them have never been discovered, even though people have looked for them very actively. It's like, guys, Google Maps exists. <laughs> you know, like satellites, planes, helicopters. This is probably a little high because you have to go over the sandstorm to get to it. But still, like, this would be found. But again, that's just one of these other little things you have to sort of hand wave away. You just have to accept it in order to have fun with these types of stories. And I'm willing to do that. It's just always funny to me how big the cities are, totally exposed up top. And don't get me wrong, this is not something that just Amy Hennig did. It's something that Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley will do in Uncharted 4 again. And of course, in The Lost Legacy, where these huge cities are totally exposed and could have been found very, very easily. You just kind of have to accept that they don't have access to Google Earth. Now, once you get into the city, Nathan and Sully walk forward and they find a fountain that's still flowing. And Nathan decides to drink from the fountain, but Sully doesn't. Now, of course, Nathan does exert a lot more physical energy I suppose, then Sully. So it makes sense that he might be more dehydrated and more driven to drink out of the fountain. However, the fact that Sully doesn't drink it seems kind of arbitrary. He doesn't really have a good reason not to. And you would think after being in the hot desert sun and just fighting your way through a sandstorm, you would at least want to wet your whistle. But you'll understand very shortly why Sully can't drink out of this fountain at the same time that Nate does. Again, it doesn't matter what makes sense. It matters what the writers wanted to have happen. You see, almost immediately after drinking this, there is a solar eclipse. Or is it a lunar eclipse? Let me look up the difference. Solar. Solar eclipse. I just wanted to be sure. It's a thing of when the moon moves in front of the sun and it makes a really cool 
like blackout sky. It's super awesome visually. But this happens right after Nate drinks from the fountain. And then he turns, sees Talbot and Marlowe across the way. And then Sully is shot in the back and drops dead. I know what you're thinking. Oh my God, they killed Sully. They actually did it. Well, just you wait a second. Right after this happens, we have a series of shooting galleries where every time you would kill somebody, their heads light up on fire, their eyes start glowing with fire. It's a little bit of a giveaway that something's off, uh, but in the context of what you were just told by Salim, it makes sense because he said that the enemies that you'll encounter in the city are overpowered with the curse of the jinn effectively so you just kind of hand wave it away mentally like oh it must be the jinn affecting these enemies that turns them into jack-o-lanterns and after one arena and then the next one and then the next one you start to have flashbacks where you begin to run through the same city streets that you ran through earlier and then you have a flashback and you start playing as a young nathan drake reliving the same sequence that you played earlier in the game when you were escaping from marlo's men initially it's a full-blown acid trip culminating in nathan drake throwing himself off a cliff and into a dried out pond or pool of some sort, it's immediately clear to anybody with any sense that Nathan tripped balls when he drank from the water. The water is contaminated in some way. And this is proven true when Nathan runs back into Sully and Sully is like, bro, you started like freaking out when you took that man, like you, you were on something. And they put it together that something is in the water that poisons people, causes them to lose their minds and go crazy and hallucinate like crazy. And that is the gin. I mean, to me, this is pretty believable. Gin does the same thing to me too. I don't know what they're talking about, why this is surprising. So the water and whatever chemical or compound is in it is what affected all of the citizens of the city, caused them to go crazy, and in turn, had the effect of the gin, basically. And this is what Marlowe and Talbot are going after because they will use that compound, I guess, to control people and cause them to go crazy, maybe turn it into a weapon, even though Marlowe is not like a Nadine character where she might be able to sell that particular compound to somebody for military purposes. She just wants it for some reason. Now, what's also kind of confusing is that this isn't like a naturally occurring element in the water. There's an actual jar that Marlowe and Talbot are lifting out because you find them lifting it out with a little crane immediately upon this realization because the writers were like, okay, let's wrap this story up. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's wrap it up. There's an actual jar like that a, a gin, that like a genie would be in. So something about the jar is leaking this compound and has been for hundreds or thousands of years at a steady enough pace that the water is still potent with it to the point where you trip balls after a sip of water. Okay. And again, it just doesn't make sense why Marlo and Talbot want this. There's no explanation given as to why they want this or why their particular characters would want this. Marlo is part of a secret organization that's been looking for the ring and in turn, I guess, this location for 400 years. So they want this gin and its power and they've wanted it for 400 years, but there's never a clear explanation as to why. Like, are they just big, bad, evil villains that want to control the world? Do they just want to sell this as some sort of military weapon that can control minds and cause cities to kill themselves and destroy it? I mean... It's just never explained. And what also doesn't make a lot of sense is that Talbot already has a hallucinogenic drug that he's used twice now that we've seen in order to control people's minds and get them to do whatever he wants them to do, which seems like a more useful compound than one that just makes you freak out and start killing people. But regardless, you just have to accept that Marlo and Talbot want this compound and want this gin for some reason. Again, I have a reason as to why I think they were doing all of this that I think can explain why there's an actual jar and why there's this and that. We'll get there. Upon finding them lifting this jar out of this pond where it's been stored, Nate and Sully split up in order to, I guess, get the jump on them as they lift this. They're going to, I guess, murder them and escape that way. 
Not clear what the plan is, but Sully, spotting that Talbot has spotted Nate, jumps in just in time to lift his hand so that he doesn't shoot Nate, killing him, but in turn, and as a result, gets the crap whacked out of him with the butt of a pistol. He drops to all fours, and then Talbot, instead of just like shooting him right there, which he could do if he actually wanted to kill him, which we know was his goal because he just shot at one of them. Instead of doing that, just a quick and easy trigger pull, he just kind of pushes him into the water. I like, okay. <laughs> Again, it would have been really easy to kill Sully here. Like, oh, Sully died saving Nate. That's pretty awesome. But no, no. He falls in the water, is unconscious for some reason. Nate dives in, is able to grab Sully, turns, sees the jar being lifted, and then using some sort of superpower where he doesn't have to deal with the refraction of the water affecting what you see on the surface outside of the water. He's able to shoot the pillar, something this big of the crane, blowing it up, dropping the jar back into the depths of the water, causing Marlowe and everybody to freak out. And this also apparently did enough structural damage to the entire city that the entire city begins to collapse. You get Sully back to the surface, he comes to and is totally fine because of course he is, and everybody starts to try and escape the city while shooting through multiple waves of enemies and platforming your way up and out. Eventually you reach a small chamber where the floor falls out from under you and Nate and Marlowe are caught in quicksand. Marlowe, however, is caught pretty deep within it. Talbot can't save her he's too far away. So it's pretty much up to Nate. Marlo challenges him saying, prove your greatness as she holds the necklace with the ring on it. <laughs> and all the while Talbot is screaming at Nate saying, you can't just let her die, even though he just tried to murder Nate and Sully like 10 seconds ago, <laughs> but whatever. It's like, yeah, that what I did was okay. Cause you guys suck, but it, 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 like, Come on, man, don't be a jerk. Regardless, Nate, because he's a good guy, tries to save Marlowe using his uh, whatever, like, shoulder holster thing that, holster vest, I guess, is what it would be called. It's too late, though. She sinks into the sand and there's no saving her. So you see her hand go into the, the sand as the last thing, and then the ring goes down just after. So... Marlo's dead. Nate and Sully then try to escape the city with a bunch of moving platforms as the entire place comes tumbling down. And this is actually pretty cool. All of these walkways have fractured and have broken apart as the sand is flowing and they're shifting and slowly going over the ledge as you have to jump from piece to piece. It's pretty cool, even considering it looks pretty unrealistic. <laughs> like the sand underneath these platforms is moving really quickly and the platforms are barely moving at all. But still, I, I really like this sequence and I think it's a cool way to wrap up what goes on at this city. However, because we still have loose ends to wrap up, Talbot teleports his way to the top of the city, which makes sense because he can teleport as we found out earlier, and you engage in yet another fist fight with him. That's right, the worst part of the combat system. That's how we're gonna wrap up the entire game. Buckle up. Except Talbot has a knife, so he has an advantage over you. In fact, this actually probably helps because it breaks up the monotony of the fist fighting and the repetitiveness of it, meaning that he will regularly get you in chokeholds or in positions where he's gonna stab you and you have to perform these quick time events to break it up. It seems as though that would actually be worse than just fist fighting, but it actually breaks up how awful the fist fighting is in a way that makes it better. So I'm actually okay with it. Eventually Talbot gets Nate on the ground about to stab him in the neck, but Sully comes in at the last second to save Nate with a carefully placed gunshot to Talbot. However, as we know, Talbot, he's totally fine with bullet wounds. So uh, there's no real effect on him. He just kind of like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> and then keeps going. However, Nate is knocked from the platform while he's trying to catch the gun after a big seismic shift, leaving Talbot and Sully at the top of the platform. You climb your way back up, Talbot's about to kill Sully, and then you shoot him two or three times, whatever it takes. And uh, then this cutscene plays where Talbot all of a sudden is feeling the bullet wounds, so he is mortal, and then he falls and uh, is gone. Nate, Sully, and Salim then escape the city, watching it slowly sink into the sands. 
And that's it. We then jump forward to the airport. Everybody's headed home. Nate and Elena and Sully are in a great mood. Nate and Elena share some interesting and cute dialogue setting up the next game and uh, their their life together, I suppose. It's super cute. And then Sully shows off his new plane, which, of course, he hasn't had for years at this point. And this is also cool because it's going to be used in the next game as well. So it all kind of ties together. And then the camera fades to black. And that is the end of Uncharted 3. Now, okay, now that we're through everything, before we wrap up all of this cleanly, I want to express my opinion on Talbot and what I think happened with this game's story beyond just like having huge sections of it that weren't necessary at all. So Talbot doesn't make any sense at all. And this is not just me. If you look up any sort of description of this game contemporary to its launch, everybody says that the main villain's henchman seems to have abilities that are never explained and doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's not just me all these years later being nitpicky. Listen, it's very simple. He does things that are impossible and that are never explained. Teleporting, he can do it. Surviving gunshots, he can do it. Seemingly able to enact mind control tactics on people, he can do that as well. Now, what I thought they were setting up all of this for was to reveal Talbot as, in effect, either a vessel or a weakened form of the djinn. But no, or maybe. If it is the case, then it's never explained or explored. It's just there's no dialogue. It's like it's missing or they forgot to put it in. I really think that they probably meant for this to be the big reveal at the end of the game, that the djinn had possessed this random dude Talbot, giving him slight powers. And in order to release the djinn's full essence, he was going to need to partner with Marlo and her endless resources in order to fully release the djinn in that jar that they were raising. And then he would effectively gain all of these powers, becoming the full powered djinn, and they would be able to use him to acquire whatever fame, fortune, power that they would need. This would explain how he's able to teleport. This would explain how he's able to survive gunshot wounds and why he can't survive gunshot wounds after the jar falls and presumably is completely covered or broken in some way when everything else collapses on top of it. It could explain everything that happens with regards to Talbot, but this is never brought up. It's never discussed. It might have been the intention, and I think it probably was the intention of the writers, but they never did anything with it. So either they just forgot to put in dialogue that explained that he was actually partially Jin or had the Jin's blessing or power or essence or something, or it was cut because they wanted a more grounded story and they didn't want to rely on this supernatural stuff. So they said, oh, the water hallucinations, it's not actually magical or supernatural. It's actually just chemicals in the water that do it. Okay, yeah, and then there's something in the jar. The chemicals are in the jar, and that's what's doing it. So they thought it was a gin way back when, but it's actually just a chemical agent. Woo woo. But if that's what they were actually doing, then they did a pretty piss poor job of it because they didn't cut out every supernatural thing that he does. Like, not even close. If that was the case, Talbot should just be a henchman who does the dirty work from Marlowe. But instead, they have him still doing things that only a djinn could do. Like, remember the weird raisin dude that looks like he just opened the Ark of the Covenant in the Chateau in France? Well, it's suggested that he had his life sucked out of him somehow, but it's never mentioned again. Granted, it could have been those spiders that we discussed, but this all happened far away from them, and you don't see spiders doing anything similar. So I don't think it was the spiders that did it. This guy might have just pissed off Talbot, he sucked the life out of him because he's a djinn and that's it. But like either way, either the spiders did it or Talbot did it with his superpowered djinn sucking ability, but neither option ever receive any evidence pointing one way or the other. It's just not there. Or once again, the example of Talbot getting shot in the chest, he's totally fine. And granted, this isn't the first time that a shot to the chest should have killed an uncharted character such as in Uncharted 1. Okay, so maybe this is just a thing that Naughty Dog is doing. Every game, somebody gets shot in the torso and ends up being totally fine. That could be the case. I mean, there's Sully in Uncharted 1, Nate in Uncharted 2, Talbot in Uncharted 3, Sully in Uncharted 3, Sam in Uncharted 4. You know what? The more, the more I think about it, maybe this is just a Naughty Dog thing. <laughs> or probably the worst offense, which is when Talbot teleports out of nowhere into a brick wall, walks out, is fine, controls Cutter's mind a little bit, gets what he wants, and then teleports out again. Like, 
It's so stupid. It really seems as though he was written with supernatural powers. They were going to reveal him as the jinn, and then they decided that some point in the development that they weren't going to do that. They weren't going to rely on supernatural stuff. So they cut the supernatural bit and instead put in this grounded ish story of it being a chemical agent that's controlling people's minds. But it was going to be too much work to go back through and redo all of those conversations and moments, getting rid of all of the supernatural elements. So instead they just left them in and never explained them. Because, I mean, think of it, if they needed to rewrite it so that Talbot didn't have superpowers and wasn't a djinn, they would have to go back and redo a significant chunk of all of the motion capture that takes place within Yemen. They'd have to go back and redo sections of the levels in France at the Chateau. They'd have to do a lot of stuff. And it's likely that they just said, eh, who's going to care? Who's going to notice? We'll just leave it up to the imagination and people will fill in the gaps themselves. And... I guess they were right, because here I am all these years later doing it. But anyway, that's Uncharted 3. Some people say it's their favorite in the franchise. I strongly disagree, especially having just played it on stream with all of you guys over on Twitch. It's still really glitchy, even in the remastered collection. I just don't think it's particularly great. It, it just, it's fine. It's fine. But a lot of the narrative stuff I really have trouble forgiving. It's just not great. But let me know all of your thoughts on this game as well as the franchise in general. I want to hear it in the comment section below. Uncharted 4. For many, it's their favorite game in the entire franchise. For others, they feel it represents the over-commercialization of it. It's dumbed down. It lost a lot of its soul from the prior titles. And in this video, we're going to go through the entire game start to finish, breaking down everything it does well, everything it does poorly, and try to decide what it actually is. Is it great? Is it lackluster? Is it just another entry in the series? Or is this something truly, truly special? I feel like I should let my position be known. I played Uncharted 4 first, so this has a special place in my heart. I will fully acknowledge that I've rose-tinted glasses when it comes to this game. This was the very first game I played on my very first PlayStation 4 Slim that I ever bought right out of high school. I was so excited for it, and so it holds a special place in my heart. But it's been years since I went through the game again, and so today, we're going to go through the game and analyze it critically. I've played through it again on stream and then again off stream just for this video so I could analyze it as critically as I possibly could, breaking it down bit by bit. So hopefully you'll enjoy the ride just as much as I have. Links in the description box below for all of my social media. So if you want to follow me, join our Discord to enter to win a bunch of free games like an upcoming giveaway I'm doing for Elden Ring. I'm giving away a couple copies of that on Steam. All you have to do to enter is join our Discord and follow my other social media. It's easy peasy. Go for it. But with that said, enough dilly dallying. Let's get right into it. Uncharted 4, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy. The game opens with Nathan Drake driving a boat through a storm. There's somebody else on the boat with him, but at this point we don't know much. If you have subtitles enabled, you'll see that this character is named Sam, but once again, that doesn't mean much to us. As you drive over the large waves, you'll realize that you're being chased by a bunch of what can only be assumed are bad guys who are taking shots at you, firing explosives, and trying to ram you. After a moment, an explosion goes off, knocking Nathan into the water. This also damaged the boat, so once you get back on deck, you have to take up a defensive position to hold off the enemy attackers while this mystery man repairs the engine. This serves as a very basic combat tutorial to introduce you to the gunplay and also the cover system. Already, we can feel that the gunplay is far more responsive than it was in Uncharted 3. There's been major improvements to the feel of the guns, the look, and even the sound. One other element that I noticed that I actually bizarrely really enjoy is this little crosshair option that you have enabled by default. Basically, when you're firing, a small outline shows where the bullets are likely to land, but once you actually fire the gun, you'll see a small circle show up outlining where the bullet actually traveled. It's very simple. 
It just shows where the bullet trajectory was calculated as going and explains why you might miss some shots even if it seems or feels as though you should have landed them. Of course, this isn't going to excuse or forgive the numerous shooting galleries that we'll have over the course of the game's campaign, but it does help the combat system feel a little bit more fair and at the very least more transparent to the player, explaining why certain things are happening in the way they are with something as simple as a circle on a screen. Nonetheless, I simply enjoy this. I think it feels really satisfying and I like seeing where the bullets go within my crosshairs. But moving on. Eventually, the engine is fixed by this mystery man. You hop back into the cockpit, so to say, and start to travel towards the big island in the distance, which seemingly is your one escape from all of these enemies coming after you. Naughty Dog did a really good job of instilling fear in the player during the sequence because you actually do feel panicked as you drive towards the island, when in reality, there isn't actually a threat here. These big scary rocks, you can try to run into them, but the ship will automatically steer out of the way if you even approach them. Speed is also controlled and the enemy boat's movements are controlled as well. In reality, there's very little threat here at all. You're on train tracks, but the sleight of hand that Naughty Dog has perfected at this point comes out in full force. The player feels panicked even though there isn't a threat because they did such a good job of building the atmosphere and contextualizing everything so that you feel truly panicked in everything that you're doing. And rest assured, this is not the only time we're going to see this sleight of hand employed in this game. Naughty Dog is a team full of experts when it comes to this magic of game design, and we'll see a lot of it here. Eventually, you'll get close enough to the island that a large ship will spawn right next to you, ramming into the boat that you're driving. The boat capsizes, launching Nate and Sam into the water, and the screen goes black. We then cut to a flashback. This is Nate as a child within a Catholic orphanage. We immediately see that he has a black eye, and seems distraught as a nun lectures him about his actions. The nun communicates that she's tired of giving him all of these lectures and that he will no longer be allowed to go on a school retreat. Nate says that he doesn't actually care about that, which the nun insists is actually the problem. It appears Nate started a fight because someone wouldn't give back his book. The two boys bickered back and forth for a while before eventually a fight broke out, which is how he got the black eye. But Nate does say that 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 wasn't all that there was. There was more to this confrontation, but he refuses to elaborate. We will later find out what actually went down that caused this fight to break out, and it reveals a lot about Nate's character, but for now, he leaves it obscure. Frustrated at Nate's inability to admit fault or explain clearly what's going on, the nun declares that no matter what she tries, Nate just seems to be determined to end up like his brother which is, by inference, not a good thing. Now, up to this point in the series, we haven't actually seen anything about Nathan Drake having a brother. In fact, most of the things that we've seen up to this point would suggest that he was an only child, or at the very least an orphan who was left on his own. We saw this in Uncharted 3 with all of the background information we got when we met Sully. And that was at a time when Nate looked only a little bit older than this version of him in Uncharted 4. For anybody paying attention, this will get the gears turning, wondering what happened to Nate's brother. Is Nate's brother dead? Did something happen? Did he get himself in such trouble that he's been locked away in prison? And now Nate's left here all alone. Who knows? Well, we're about to know because immediately upon the nun's exiting of the room, there's a light that flashes through the window, which seems to Nate to immediately communicate that Sam, his brother, is outside, summoning him in effect. So Nate climbs out the window and we get introduced to the free climbing system that, in my opinion, is probably the best part of Uncharted 4. Not necessarily because the system is incredibly robust and features amazing animations and flair that makes the free running system in a game like Assassin's Creed Unity feel like it was simply a Roblox mod, but rather because when paired with the other things that Naughty Dog does so well, namely the set pieces and the incredible vistas and graphic showcases, 
it really stands out from the herd. After all, you can have an incredible free running system, but if the world you're exploring by way of that free running system is bland or uninteresting and flatly boring to look at, there's no real point. It's a wasted feature. After all, a tool is only as good as the thing that you're using it on. And in the case of Uncharted 4, we have incredible vistas, moments of unbelievable beauty and clarity, and all of it is fantastically showcased by way of this very free climbing system. But for now, it starts off easy enough. You basically climb out the window, go across a ledge, climb around, jump around. It's pretty basic. You do have to push through another section of the school or orphanage. It's technically both. It's technically a boy's home, which is a school and an orphanage kind of mixed into one. But for now, I'll just call it a school. And after you go through the window and into the main hallway, you see the father, Father Ryan Duffy, speaking with the same nun that just chastised you. The nun is asking the priest to get rid of Nate, and the priest promises to talk to him in the morning and to not give up on him quite yet. And after the father leaves and the nun goes into the adjacent room, you can actually find the behavioral report form where the events that we previously discussed that led to Nathan's black eye are discussed in detail. And it's here that we see all of the nitty gritty of what exactly happened. Though, once again, the real reason why everything went down and why Nathan freaked out remains a mystery. But we put the paper down and move into the next room, which is our only way towards Sam, because we need to get back out the windows and onto the rooftops. And here, in one of the more subtle story beats, we can actually see the nun that was just chastising Nathan for breaking the rules, being out of control and reckless. She's smoking out the window. It's really subtle, but it just goes to show that nobody's perfect. Even this nun that thinks she's so perfect and beyond Nathan and his behavior, she's breaking the rules too. But setting that aside, we climb out the window and we see Sam really close ushering us towards him. We have some more free climbing and eventually we meet up with Sam and get to have our first conversation with him. It's established that he's the older brother, he's no longer in school here, and seems to be out on his own doing something. We can also see that he really cares about his little brother, even if he's not able to provide or care for him in the way that would probably be best for a boy his age. The two share some light banter as you climb across the rooftops towards a large clock tower. It's not clear where you're going, but Sam makes it clear that he has something he needs to show Nathan, so you push on. Once again, this is in effect just a very large free-running tutorial. Yes, it's contextualized within the story, but the reason that they're introducing the rope and grapple hook mechanic, as well as large jumps across ravines that you have to grab onto small ledges for, all of this is purely to introduce the player to these systems so that they fend better for themselves once you're doing this in the main game. Eventually, you reach the outskirts of the campus, use the grapple hook to grab onto a lamppost, and swing all the way across to what seems to be an apartment building on the other side of the wall and the street surrounding it. Upon crossing and landing at the street below, Sam shows off what he's been waiting to share with Nate. It's a motorcycle. Interestingly, Nate immediately assumes that this motorcycle, or motorbike, I guess is a more appropriate term, is stolen. It says a lot about their relationship and also what Nathan thinks of his bigger brother, Sam. Sam insists that he's a changed man, but Nate doesn't seem too convinced. He also becomes sad almost immediately, saying that Sam only tries to pull these types of stunts when he's trying to make up for something. Sam says that Nate is obviously too smart for his own good, because Sam is trying to make up for something. He says that he's got a well-paying job, but it means that he has to leave for an entire year. Nate, who has nobody left, feels very hurt, obviously, because he feels as though his older brother is bailing on him. But Sam thinks of it much more as though he's going off to earn money so that they can go off and do their own thing, be their own people. Nate also insists that this school isn't the best place for him, and that he'd be better off following his big brother wherever he may be going. But Sam isn't convinced. 
He thinks that this school provides the structure that Nate needs to excel, which is probably true to be perfectly fair. But it's also at this point that Nate lets loose what actually happened that caused the fight to break out, which left him with a black eye. You see, we don't know many details, but what we do know is that Nathan Drake's mother, and Sam's mother in turn, had some sort of serious illness when the kids were very little, like around the age of five. And it was so serious an illness that she was effectively terminal. And it eventually led to her committing suicide to escape the pain and suffering, which was inevitable as a result of this illness. And when Nate and this strange boy got in a tussle over this book, the young boy brought up what is typically considered to be the canonical Catholic teaching as it pertains to suicides, which is that they cannot go to heaven because they have corrupted their own soul in their final act. So, because this little kid had told Nate that his mother was in hell because of what she did to escape this horrific pain, he freaked out and decided to start a fight, which led to him getting beat up, and we can only assume what the other guy looks like, but for all we know, it was a fight that went back and forth and resulted in both kids getting pretty injured. And this is another example of the major shift that's taken place since Uncharted 3. In that game, everything was spoon-fed to you. All of the plot points were extremely clearly and expressly communicated, so much so that they overly communicated a lot of things to the point where there were major plot holes all over the game because they set up so many premises that they could never follow up on. Whereas this time around, they're taking active steps to avoid telling the player every single detail, and they're being much more subtle when it comes to communicating the story at hand. It's one of the great things that Neil Druckmann is so good at. He's phenomenal when it comes to writing the narrative and leaving things out that aren't necessary. And speaking of, we should make it clear the major shift that happened within Naughty Dog right as Uncharted 4 was starting to ramp up in terms of development. Namely, Uncharted 1, 2, and 3 had all been headed up by Amy Hennig, who is a very talented developer, but she's a developer that has preferred much more of the kitschy style. She likes the knee-slapping good time that action movies tend to provide, and much less the dark, gritty, serious stories that, at this point, Naughty Dog is known for. In Uncharted 3, you can start to feel the tension that was at play within the studio as it was being put together. There's a conflict where some of the studio heads seem to want a darker and more grounded story, much more akin to The Last of Us, which would launch soon after Uncharted 3, and others were just fine with the typical kitschy game that they had been developing throughout the previous Uncharted titles. But the result for Uncharted 3 was a game that felt very conflicted as to what it wanted to be. Uncharted 4 had begun its development at the hands of Amy Hennig and the same team that did Uncharted 3. But after the overwhelming success of The Last of Us, a decision was made to make this game much more grounded, gritty, and even realistic. It's not to say that you couldn't have crazy and wild set pieces and bombastic action sequences, but it is to say that you couldn't go and have Nazi zombies or supernatural things all over the place. You needed to make an active effort to explain the events of the world in a grounded way. And the characters needed to be realistic, sympathetic, and the dialogue needed to be of a much higher quality than we had seen in previous titles. Furthermore, the characters needed to have actual arcs between each other and independently. Nathan needed to have an arc over the course of the game. He needed to start in one place and end up in another. Same with the other subplot characters. And they needed to have arcs between each other. Nate and Elena needed to have an arc. Sam and Nate needed an arc. Even Sully and Sam needed to have some sort of arc. All of these things needed to work together. And to be perfectly honest, it seemed as though that was outside of Amy's wheelhouse. After Uncharted 4 had been in development for a couple of years, the team was not anywhere near where they needed to be. 
and Amy was called up to speak with executives at Naughty Dog to discuss the game's direction and where they were headed. We don't know what exactly went on inside that meeting room, but what we do know is that Amy Hennig decided to leave and give up on Uncharted 4 effectively, leaving it in the hands of Bruce Straley and Neil Druckmann, who had just come off of the success of The Last of Us. Funnily enough, Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley didn't actually want to work on Uncharted 4. They had spent so much time working on The Last of Us, a game which they were not certain was going to turn out even half decent, much less the masterpiece that it became. They just wanted to go away and take a break, but they were needed with Uncharted 4, so they said that they would help temporarily to get it back in a good direction and state. They would go take their vacations and come back and potentially help clean up the game towards the end of development. But what inevitably happened was they took over development of Uncharted 4, developed some ideas, and then followed it through to the very end. And this is why Uncharted 4 feels so incredibly different from Uncharted 3. For better or worse, it's different. Some people love the changes that were made. Some people hate the changes that were made and miss the kitschy, light-hearted stories that were told in the previous games. For me, Uncharted 4 was my first exposure to the franchise, so of course I'm a little bit biased when it comes to evaluating all of the games together. But what I do know is that these games rely a lot on the banter that goes on between characters as they explore levels together or move through the world. There have always been cutscenes and plots that interweave with each other even in the previous games, but the quality of the writing was never anything to write home about. Uncharted 4 marked the first time that the game felt as though we were dealing with a story that was worth telling for its own sake. It could be converted to a novel or a film, and it would stand on its own. In other words, it didn't feel as though it had to be a video game to work. Uncharted 1, 2, and 3 all wouldn't work in other mediums. They needed to be video games to work as a story or any sort of entertainment. And all of this isn't meant to be a dig at Amy Hennig. She's a fantastically talented developer and has done some incredible work over the years. But I think it is fair to say that this franchise, in effect, outgrew her. Her type of game design is very specific very unique, as is Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley's. The types of games that Amy puts together, Neil Druckmann and Bruce could only dream of putting together, and vice versa. Amy's great at the classic action-adventure titles, whereas Bruce and Neil especially tried to tell much more grounded, gritty, and mature stories. Again, it's okay if you prefer one of these styles over the other, but the reason I'm bringing it up is so that you can understand why these games feel so disparate. And as we continue going through Uncharted 4, you're going to notice that the game will continue separating itself from Uncharted 3, and it's only going to grow more severe. But to get back to the story, Sam says that he wasn't just trying to surprise Nate with a motorcycle that he got for himself. Rather, he has something much more interesting to share. And that is that he's figured out where all of the documents that their mother wrote and put together have been stored. They were bought by some old lady who's a collector of some sort, and they're being stored in a huge mansion nearby. So they both get on the motorbike and head that way. We then get a slow transition to an early 20s Nate that's fighting in a prison yard. Funnily enough, this is a Panamanian jail which is what Nate referenced in the very opening of Uncharted 1 way back in the day. Uh, pirates. Pirates? Yeah, the modern kind. They don't take prisoners. At least not male prisoners. Wait, what are you talking about? Uh, sh shouldn't we call the authorities or something? Yeah, that'd be a great idea, but we don't exactly have a permit to be here. What? Yeah, so unless you want to end up in a Panamanian jail, we should probably handle this ourselves. But what's worse? You obviously haven't been in a Panamanian jail. Do you know how to use one of these? So a fist fight ensues, and this serves as the tutorial for a close combat encounter. It's pretty straightforward, basically. Punching and strafing. 
it's nothing to write home about. There's also sort of a parry button slash breakout button in the form of triangle, but it's not anything robust. After fighting for a few moments, Nate is handcuffed and led away into an isolation room, or you might call it the hole, a la Shawshank Redemption. Nate seems completely unworried, and at this point we don't know why he's in prison. So far, we haven't had a single event seemingly take place in the present. We seem to have a flash forward at the very beginning of the game, then we had a major flash back to when Nate was a child, and now we have a flash more forward, but still back to Nate in his early 20s in a Panamanian jail. This is one of my frustrations with Uncharted 4. It takes so long for the game to finish setting everything up, it just feels as though they could have done this in a more efficient way. I understand that the writers had to do a lot. They had to introduce Sam as a character, an older brother that bonded with his younger brother. They had to introduce Rafe, the villain of the game. They had to introduce the plot line of the Avery treasure. They had to set up this whole subplot line of the old lady collector in the mansion that explains why Nate and Sam had to go on the run in the first place. They have all of these things going on all at once, and I find it fairly overwhelming. But Rest assured, we're almost through the flashbacks. After being left in the hold for some undefined period of time, Vargas opens the door and leads him through a series of tunnels. Vargas is the prison warden who's in charge of all of this, and it turns out he's really corrupt as well. At the end of this series of hallways, he leads you into a cell that faces the open air. You see, this prison seems to have been built on a cliffside. Part of it is falling apart, and the part that's falling apart happens to expose itself towards a very old prison tower. This old tower, which is partially falling apart, apparently holds some sort of clue that they need to find the Avery treasure. And this is when it clicks together. Vargas has been paid off by Nate, Rafe, and Sam to, in effect, arrest them, hold them in the prison as everyday prisoners so that they can get to the prison tower without arousing suspicion, find whatever they need, and then get out. The problem is Vargas happens to have opened the letter which contained the map fragment that Nate's bringing with him. He needs this fragment to find a series of clues which he thinks will lead him to the next clue for the treasure. They gave Vargas this envelope under the impression that he wasn't to open it and merely hand it over once they got got Nate to this point. But now that Vargas has opened the letter, he knows what they're actually searching for, a $400 million treasure. And now he realizes that he holds all the cards, because if he doesn't let them out, they simply won't find the treasure. So he can begin to extort them for a larger cut simply by holding their release over them. But that'll come up in a moment. For now, we get our first freeform adventure section of the game. This is completely up to the player to explore and navigate. You slide, climb, swing, drag, and pull all manner of things into place to get into the tower. Use the scrap that you brought with you to find a hollowed out rock which contains a broken crucifix. This puzzle you use to find the crucifix, I was hoping would be a little bit more robust, but it's actually remarkably straightforward. Basically, you're going to use the fragment that you brought with you, fold it over, which is a nice way of showing players how they can manipulate objects that they're holding, which will reveal a Sagittarius and Scorpio sign. And the signs correspond with numbers that have been carved into rocks on the walls of the room. You have to total the numbers up, not separate them, and pull out the stone that's marked accordingly, in this case with a 12. This isn't really a puzzle, it's just following A to B to C to D until you eventually find the object. This is something we'll see a lot throughout the course of Uncharted 4, that the puzzles aren't really puzzles. For the most part, there's no active thought required, you're simply following along a set path that the developers have put out. You're just going through the motions, in effect. 
But regardless, you climb all the way back to Vargas. You tell him that you didn't find anything, but you do ask for blueprints to the prison in case you miss something. It's very important that you make sure that Vargas doesn't know you found what you were looking for, because if he knows that, Nate's realized he can hold their release over them. Vargas says that he has a bunch of old files, so he'll look through those for blueprints that could potentially lead to more information about a previously collapsed tower or something that might have actually actually held the clue that Vargas thinks they haven't found yet. But for now, Nate needs to get back into the regular prison population, so he's handcuffed and led back into the prison yard. We now see adult Sam, and this is when I think most players will probably put together who they were on that boat with at the beginning of the game. I don't know if I'm just like a jerk or something, but I really don't think that full grown Sam looks very much like his young counterpart. I mean, I guess I get it with the nose and the eyes. They're fairly similar, but I can't help but feel as though the smoking has done a number on his skin. The point is, Sam was the one who was on the boat with Nate at the very beginning of the game, which sets up a sort of underwhelming premise, as we'll find out shortly, because the big fake out that they're about to pull isn't actually a fake out, because they've already shown us the answer. That there aren't any stakes, it's just a fake out. Nate reunites with Sam and a gentleman called Rafe, who seems to be the useless member of the group, but it turns out he's actually the one funding the whole operation. You see, Sam is the history buff. He knows everything about Avery, all of the history. He studied all of the characters as it pertains to this particular story. He's the expert. Nate is the one who gets his hands dirty, climbing, swinging, doing everything that other people don't want to do because it's not safe or borderline stupid. And Rafe is the credit card. He's the one who has all of the money thanks to a very wealthy family, and he is trying to pursue this treasure because he's, in effect, searching for some sort of meaning in life. It's kind of sad and pathetic, but his character isn't very drawn out beyond that, so that's kind of all we have to go on. It's also important to note that there's dialogue here that explains that Nate and Sam don't like Rafe. They don't even want him to be here. He is just here for his money. And I think Rafe also has picked up on this. He feels like the third wheel because he is. But for now, the group needs to get together, set their differences aside, and discuss next steps. So they go into a large laundry room to discuss things more privately. Inside, Nate shows off the crucifix, which is soon after revealed to not actually be a crucifix, because it shows St. Dismas and not Jesus. The inscription on the cross reads, quote, we receive the due rewards of our deeds, meaning that the figure is the penitent thief, not Christ. Because after all, during the crucifixion as described in the Bible, three people were put on crosses, one on either side of Jesus, who was in the middle, one was a thief who mocked Jesus openly, and the other was a thief that was very sorry and penitent, and this particular individual is known as Saint Dismas, and he's the one reflected on this cross. And it's no mistake, because we're dealing with pirates in this game. So the idea that Henry Avery would view himself as the penitent thief makes sense. Immediately upon this realization that this isn't Christ on a cross, but rather St. Dismas, Sam begins to laugh, explaining that there's actually a cathedral of St. Dismas in Scotland, and the very last sighting of Avery was also in Scotland. So, the team realizes they need to go to Scotland. So, they start to head off to find Vargas and, hopefully, leave the prison. But upon doing so, they're ambushed by a bunch of people that Nate and Sam have thoroughly pissed off, both in their endeavors to, in the case of Sam, gamble, and in the case of Nate, fistfight. A brawl breaks out, which allows you to fight a bunch of these guys with the help of your teammates. It's fine. I don't know. I just don't think these fist fighting sequences are particularly fun. But before it gets too far, Vargas breaks in with a bunch of prison guards, takes everybody into custody, locks them away, and takes our merry trio up to his office. He also finds the cross with St. Dismas on it and realizes that Nate had lied to him. 
he had found something in the tower and he was simply trying to cut him out of what he perceived to be his rightful share. Up in his office, Vargas dismisses the other guards, leaving him alone with the three men. He demands that he gets an equal cut of the treasure. In effect, he wants 25% of the $400 million treasure simply because he's going to let them out of the prison. And if they refuse, he'll just have them killed or keep them in the prison indefinitely. Rafe, negotiating on behalf of the other two, agrees to this amount and says that it's only fair. But when the two shake on it, Rafe stabs with a shiv Vargas in the side. But right before Vargas dies, he's able to fire off his pistol, alerting all of the other guards that something has happened. So now the trio has to escape the prison, which has just been placed on high alert because the freaking warden has just been stabbed to death. It's also established Rafe as a bit of a maniac, Nobody thinks that this was the smart or reasonable plan. In fact, it's very unlikely that he would be able to enforce his collection of this 25% cut of the treasure. After all, if he's stuck being a warden of a prison in Panama, what are the odds that he would actually be able to force the collection of this debt? I mean, it's not like something like this could be enforced in a court of law, that they would go to court and the judge would say, ah, yes, did you make a blood pact with this corrupt warden for a quarter cut of this treasure that is of questionable legality as to your collection of it? I, I don't think that would hold up in court. I think it could only be enforced with a strong arm, and even then, it's really unlikely that this guy, who is pretty um, lacking in power and resources, it's unlikely he'd be able to do much of anything about it. So I'm just not convinced that this made any sense whatsoever, and I don't think Nate and Sam were convinced of it either, which is why they respond in such a baffled way towards Rafe when he does this. It was just reckless for the sake of being reckless. But you know what? It gives us an excuse to escape a prison under threat of gunfire, which is much more exciting. So that's what we do. You free run and fight your way to the edge of the prison, at which point there's one final jump that you have to make before you get to the wall and can escape the prison completely. Rafe and Nate are able to make it across just fine, and Sam is left behind. He makes his leap, but just barely misses, having Nate hold him dearly, keeping him up. But a barrage of gunfire comes out right as he lands on the ledge. Sam coughs up blood, at which point we realize he's been hit at least a few times. Sam loses consciousness, and Nate loses his grip. And Sam falls all the way down past the sheet metal into the darkness. Left with no other options, Nate and Rafe sprint over the wall, through the vegetation, and into the water below where there's a boat waiting. They've escaped, but Sam seems to have been left for dead. And then the title sequence rolls. That has effectively been the introductory section of Uncharted 4. So we're finally done with flashbacks and flash forwards. Now we're in the body of the game. So buckle up. After the opening credits rolls, a 15 years later prompt shows up on a black screen. The camera transitions through a school of fish, at which point it's revealed to us that Nathan Drake is swimming at the bottom of a harbor looking for something. He's speaking with somebody named Jameson as he searches the seafloor for, again, something we don't know. For this being the first moment that we really get to see who Nathan Drake is after the events of Uncharted 3, that is, the version of Nathan Drake that's in the quote-unquote present, this is actually a fairly mundane intro. Sure, we're exploring a mysterious underwater location, and eventually we come across a damaged shipping container, which appears to hold some sort of contents that Nate is interested in, but the tone and pace is markedly less exciting than the previous scenes. This is also reflected in the outright lack of music, there's nothing going on here. And once you go into the shipping container, you see why. All Nathan is doing is collecting cargo that's ended up at the bottom of this harbor as a result of a train crash. Apparently, he's working with some company that does underwater recovery, which makes sense that he would find this job. I mean, after all, he does have the skill set that would lead to somebody being successful in this field. He's resourceful, fit, and likes putting himself in dangerous situations 
Legends, but nonetheless, it's not quite the life that you expected Nathan Drake to be living. Over the next few minutes, you collect some boxes, hoist up the shipping container, and load everything into the center of the shipping container. You then get to ride the crane all the way to the surface, which has to be one of the cooler transitions between scenes that I've seen in a long time. I know it's just going from underwater to above water, but I can't help but feel as though this was done really, really well. And as you're raised above the harbor surface, you can even see repairs being performed on the bridge that the shipping container went off. It's a good touch. And I know it's probably stupid, but one of the things I remember most clearly from the opening of Uncharted 4 was when Nathan takes off this swimming flipper and throws it all the way down to the surface of the boat. I know it's stupid and little, and this doesn't seem like it would be anything of note. He's just taking off some flippers, but for some reason, this little detail stuck with me all these years. Nate offloads the gear, having successfully accomplished the mission, and goes to speak with Jameson, who he was conversing with over the radio. It's here that we get to see what we were actually rescuing. Inside the crates that you helped recover is a bunch of copper. One of the really good details here is just the sheer disappointment on Nathan's face when he sees the copper inside. Surely he knew what was inside these crates before they recovered them. After all, Jameson says that they've been hired by the client, presumably the owner of this shipping container, to recover it. And when they requested that this be recovered, I'm sure they probably communicated what was inside the crates for safety's sake. But even so, Nathan appears disappointed that there's only copper inside the crates and makes a few sassy comments about it. At first glance, you might assume that he was hoping to find treasure inside these crates, but that's not what they're actually communicating to the player here. Rather, Nathan is having these flashbacks to the times when he would recover things, but they were filled with treasure. He knew what was in these boxes when he brought them to the surface, but it's nonetheless disappointing when he considers where he's been before this and what he's accomplished in the past. It's the first sign that he's not happy with this new life that he's found. Jameson said that they're paying good money for the recovery of these items, which would at the very least suggest that Nathan, in turn, is going to be well compensated for it. But even so... This isn't what he wants to be doing. And this is going to be the central theme for Nathan Drake's story arc over the course of the game. He has settled down into this calm life with Elena, and now he's trying to work a relatively normal job. But deep within him is the urge to explore and hunt down treasure. He needs to live a dangerous life in order to feel fulfilled. Or at the very least, that's what he currently needs to be happy. And that struggle between the domesticized life with Elena and the life of adventure that he feels he needs to be happy is going to be the central theme as we go through the following chapters. Regardless, Jameson offers a beer to celebrate the good day's work that they've had. But Nathan, again, somewhat upset that this is where he is in life, declines the offer. He said he just wants to do the paperwork, go home, and crash. So Jameson relents. We then cut to him working on the paperwork in the office, something I never expected to see Nathan Drake doing ever in my life. And Jameson reappears discussing a Malaysia job. Apparently, they've been working on getting permits that will allow them to recover objects at this site. However, it's been a long and hard trudge. There's a lot of money to be made if they can recover the items at the bottom of the ocean where this ship is located, but they don't have permits. And Nathan insists that if there's no permits, it's a no-go. No permits means no go. I can't stress enough just how weird it is to hear Nathan freaking Drake saying he can't do something because he doesn't have the permits. This is so antithetical to who he has been in previous games. But that's not a bad thing. The whole point of this game's story is that Nate is struggling to reconcile this duality in his mind, the life of adventure and the life of domestic bliss. As far as he's concerned, they are mutually exclusive. Either he goes off and lives this careless life, doing whatever he wants to do, putting himself in dangerous situations, and fulfilling that desire for exploration and adventure that he's always had since he was a child, or 
he marries Elena, settles down, has a family, and fulfills that side of his life's desire. Since the events of Uncharted 3, Nate has matured a fair amount. He's setting aside all of the careless behavior that he so clearly and bombastically exhibited in Uncharted 3, 2, and 1, and is now trying to live a life like an adult. And in the next scene, this point is reaffirmed, as Nate explores the attic where he's kept a lot of the trinkets from his adventures. This is also just really cool for the player to see all of these items from the previous games make a reappearance. And it's a good touch to let the player reminisce alongside Nate. And then there's a cute little moment where Nate grabs a toy gun and runs around the attic shooting these little targets. It allows the player to do something that's a little more engaging than just walking around and looking at objects, and also lets them live vicariously through Nate and... I guess more specifically Nate's imagination. And I also have to point out that on several of these targets that he set up in the attic are the faces of the villains from the previous games, which I think is kind of cute. Just the idea that Nathan Drake buys this very nice house, goes up in the attic, makes it his little man den, and then creates these targets with the faces of these obscure mercenaries and crazy people so that he can shoot them with a toy gun. It, it's just funny to me, but also seems very much like something he would do. Over the following moments, we get to explore the house. And again, I've said it before, I will continue to say it. Naughty Dog is really really good at populating these houses such that they feel lived in and authentic. They did a great job in The Last of Us with making that house in the opening feel real and lived in, and they're doing a fantastic job in Uncharted 4 making this house feel real. Everything from the bathroom, which has random containers of Vaseline and tissue boxes strewn about, towels laying on the floor, and a bath rug that isn't lined up perfectly, to all of the meticulously laid out post-it notes that are found at Elena's desk. All of it shows a fantastic attention to detail, and reaffirms just why we all love Naughty Dog's environments so very much. There's a lot of stuff up here for you to find and look at if you choose to, such as a wedding album where you can see that Nate and Elena have married, which up to this point in the game is not something that the player would have known. You could have inferred it from his hand where he's wearing a wedding ring, but if you were to do that, I think you deserve some extra credit. I don't think most people will be able to do that. Once you go downstairs, you can see Elena working on her laptop while sitting on the couch. She's prepped dinner, so you grab the bowls and a drink and bring it over. The two sit on the couch and share in a conversation while eating. Elena is very engaged, but Nate is somewhat disconnected. After a few moments, Elena starts to describe the article that she's working on, but Nate catches a glimpse of a picture that's mounted on the wall. As Elena's voice fades into the distance, we see Nate just stare. Again, he's fantasizing about the life that he feels as though he should be living, or at the very least, a part of him wishes he were living. But it doesn't last long. Elena snaps him out of it and asks if he can tell her what her article was actually about, testing the player and Nate in turn. And surprisingly enough, we're given dialogue options. Now this is the first time that we've seen the game present the player with an option as far as dialogue is concerned. After all, Naughty Dog games have always been incredibly linear, so my initial thought when I saw this back in 2016 was, oh, wow, we have a story with branching options now. That's not actually the case. This is just giving the player an opportunity to try some different options and test the waters. But ultimately, all of these options are wrong and you will get the same scene playing out regardless. As we've said before, this is just an occasion of Naughty Dog giving the illusion of choice to the player. It doesn't matter what you choose, the outcome will be the same. I don't have an issue with this as long as the outcome is worth having. And the phenomenal voice acting and writing of the dialogue that plays out after you make whatever selection you do makes this scene worth it. Elena can read Nate like a book, and she can see immediately that something is off. So she prods him, and when he tells her about the Malaysia job and how he's declined it, she's proud and yet frustrated at the same time. Nate insists that they, as a couple, agreed not to do this type of job anymore. So he's cutting it off. He's not even going to think about it. And she, in turn, presses him 
asking if he should call Sully, who he hasn't seen in two years, to discuss the project. Maybe it's something they could actually pull off, but he wants to shut the whole conversation down. Furthermore, this is also the first time that we hear Sully discussed, so we know that he's still around and will likely make an appearance. Though I suppose it should be noted that Sully was actually teased in multiple of the trailers before launch. But regardless, the two continue their conversation until it stalls out. Elena stands up to do the dishes, but Nate insists that he should do them, or at the very least, they should play for the right to do the dishes. And in what was probably the biggest surprise for me in 2016 when this game launched, we get the chance to play Crash Bandicoot, one of the original games that Naughty Dog worked on way back in the day. And you're asked to beat Elena's high score, but it should be noted that at this point you can't actually do so because it requires an extra life. Again, the illusion of choice. And I suppose looking back, I could have just, you know, Googled whether or not this was possible instead of trying it repeatedly, but you know what, you live and you learn. So inevitably, Elena is the winner, and her reaction is adorable. The two share a kiss, and we flash forward to Nate in what we can only assume is the very early morning hours doing paperwork at the office. And then someone shows up. Sam. This reveal will probably hit the player and Nate just about as hard. It's given little warning and comes out of effectively nowhere. Understandably, Nate has some questions here about how he survived, where he's been all these years, insisting that he tried searching for him, but that all he could ever find were records that he was dead. And Sam quickly casts these assertions aside by saying that he was in fact shot, he in fact shows the player and Nate the scars, but that he was patched up by the doctors at the prison and thrown right back in his cell to rot away. And it's implied that they forged all of those documents saying that he was dead because they wanted to effectively lock him away and throw away the key. Sam then immediately transitions the conversation back towards Nate, and the two sit on this bench overlooking the harbor where Nate's office is located, and Nate retells all of the stories from the previous games. And they poke a little bit of fun at the whole premise of Uncharted as a series as well, with Sam pointing out that Nate has managed to find some of the most highly coveted treasures of all of human history and hasn't managed to come out even a millionaire. Nate says that he's managed to grab some stuff, which he used to pay off, for example, the house and the engagement rings to Elena, which is at which point Nate realizes that he told all of these stories that included Elena, but never mentioned that he was currently married to her. He then says that Sam has to come over and meet her for dinner that night, at which point he realizes that he has to tell Elena which is the first time that the player will now see that Nate hasn't mentioned his dead brother to Elena over all these years. Now, there's two things of note here. For one, he forgot to mention that he was married to Elena, which is a huge thing to forget to mention as you're telling these stories. Now, this communicates in my mind two things. First and foremost, that Nate hasn't fully processed these events, which is why his relationship shift with Elena, specifically that he's married to her now, hasn't really settled in. Because if it had, as he told the stories, he would say that now Elena, who I'm married to by the way, I'll get to that part of the story later on, comes around and does this, this, and this. Instead, he tells these stories with Elena present, but doesn't acknowledge their current relationship status, which again is a major detail to leave out. The second thing is that Nate hasn't told Elena that he has an older brother, and certainly not that his older brother was killed when they broke into a Panamanian prison trying to access a secret clue for a highly sought after treasure. The only explanation that I can think of as to why Nate wouldn't tell Elena that he had an older brother would be if he was highly ashamed of him or if the topic were just so emotionally challenging that he didn't want to broach it. The first explanation makes sense to me. If you're really ashamed of a sibling or a family member, you probably don't talk about them or bring them up 
very often at all. I mean, sure, I could point out that when you're married, everything should be out on the table, but that's beside the point. And the latter explanation, specifically saying that Sam's life and in turn death would just be too painful to address with his wife, I don't find that excuse to hold much water either. What we do know, especially after seeing these two reconnect, is that Sam and Nate have an intense bond with each other. Nate loves Sam and Sam loves Nate. After all, they were orphans and for a long time they were the only family that the other had. So I'm sorry, I just don't buy either of these excuses. And this brings us to the third option which is that this was simply the best that Naughty Dog could do to explain why Sam hadn't been present or even mentioned in previous games, that it was just so emotionally challenging for Nate to bring up that he simply never did. But the problem is there are moments in the previous games when villains would have a very good reason to bring this information up, especially if they did their homework and realized that Nate's older brother hadn't actually died and was still alive. Such as Marlowe in Uncharted 3. It simply doesn't make sense that while she's rifling through all of this information about Nate's childhood, his mother, and personal relationships, why she wouldn't also bring up that he had an older brother who either died in a Panamanian jail, which she could use to hold over his head and mock him with, or if she did a little bit more research, she could have found out that he didn't actually die in that Panamanian jail and was still alive. Information that she could have used to hold over Nate's head to get him to cease the hunt for the treasure, leave her alone, and abandon this quest to stop her. And the explanation, as I mentioned back when we covered Uncharted 3, is just that Naughty Dog hadn't invented Sam as a character yet. So they just didn't mention it because they hadn't thought it up. And this is one of the few occasions in Naughty Dog games where you have to just kind of get over it. Does Sam's existence make any sense considering the first three Uncharted games? No, not at all. In fact, there's a lot of stuff that actively goes against the notion of Nate having a brother and family that he can rely on through his childhood. In fact, in many ways, that actively degradates the relationship with Sully. But setting all of that aside, we're here now. I also feel as though I need to communicate my theory as to why they concocted Sam as a character. For one, I think they like the idea of having flashbacks and flash forwards and then also having betrayal and hidden motives that are so close to Nate and the idea of family that's reinforcing this adventure narrative paired with another segment of his family in the form of Elena pushing the domesticized calm life idea and pursuit on Nate and these dueling goals for his life being constantly presented in the form of family members that he can't escape, I understand why they would want to push those and present those to the player. It makes sense, and the fact that it's family members doing it makes it inescapable. What I actually think happened is that after the overwhelming success of The Last of Us, Neil Druckmann decided that he really wanted to work with Troy Baker again. After all, he's a phenomenal talent and as a voice actor, is unmatched. So, in an attempt to try and lock him down as talent, especially moving into The Last of Us Part 2, Neil Druckmann decided that they needed to sign Troy Baker onto another project to keep him loyal or at the very least present as they started workshopping some ideas for The Last of Us Part 2. This meant that they had to find a role for him to fit in, and because it's Troy freaking Baker, it couldn't be a small spin-off role. He needed to be supporting main cast at the very least. So they created Sam as a character, put Troy Baker in place, and called it a day. But setting that aside, now it's time for Sam to explain what happened over the last decade or two. Sam reveals to Nate that he's in trouble with some sort of 
drug lord who's named Hector Alcazar. Apparently, this was his cellmate at that same Panamanian jail where they tried to escape the first time. We then get another flashback where we see Sam in prison working out, much older than the last time we saw him. Alcazar invites Sam to stand up by the cell door with him and starts discussing things in philosophical terms about the small lives of the guards and all of the inmates' ambitions being limited by their current lot in life. He then asks Sam what he will do when he gets out. And Sam says that if he ever gets out, he's going to search for and find Avery's treasure, which obviously he has incessantly referenced time and time again every time he talks to anybody. We'll find out later that Sam was apparently presented with multiple books by a guard that he had cozied up to. So all he's been doing for all of these years is studying up on the case, trying to find new clues and information as to where the treasure could be. We then hear a distant noise, and Alcazar turns to Sam and says that it's their opportunity. And out of nowhere, a bunch of armed men appear and open the cell door, letting Alcazar and Sam out. Alcazar, the extremely wealthy and powerful drug lord, has called upon his men to free him. They've broken into the prison, blown up a bunch of stuff, and provided a way out. And the implication of Alcazar's comments are that he's going to let Sam out with him if he finds the treasure and can, in turn, provide a cut of it to Alcazar, if not the whole thing. Over the next few minutes, you fight your way out of the prison, going through many of the same rooms and areas that you went through as Nate in the initial escape sequence that we played through at the beginning of the game. I don't mind all of this being recycled. I think it's a necessary evil to show two breakouts of the same prison, you know, who am I to complain? But nonetheless, it's important to note that this is all recycled. What isn't recycled is this last moment as you push up to the guard tower where there's a machine gun going off at you. Eventually, one of Alcazar's men is able to blow it up with an RPG and the tower collapses, freeing the way for Alcazar, Sam, and all of his men to escape the prison once and for all. The crew eventually makes their way to a van and drives off into the distance, leaving the prison behind in flames. In the van, Alcazar offers Sam a drink and asks what's next for him. Sam talks about relaxing and trying to find his brother other Nate, of course, at which point Alcazar shuts him down and asks point blank how long it will take him to find Avery's treasure. Sam gives him a very flip-floppy non-committal answer, making Alcazar stop the van and have his men pull Sam out and hold a gun to his head. The drug lord says that he likes Sam and believes that he could actually find the treasure, but then now he has his doubts. He puts a knife to Sam's throat and asks clearly how long it will take. Sam says six months, and in turn, Alcazar says that people always ask for more time than they actually need with this type of thing. It's almost like he's done it before. So he gives him three months and demands half the treasure upon its discovery. He threatens that if Sam hides the treasure, runs, or goes to the police, he will know and in turn, will come after him. With the rules of the game clearly established, Alcazar pulls Sam up to his feet, gives him water, cash, and directions to the nearest town. Sam asks how he could possibly contact Alcazar when he finds the treasure, at which point the drug kingpin simply says that he'll be there. He then drives off with all of his men, leaving Sam behind. We then fade to Sam and Nate at the end of the story, saying that they need to pick up the trail where they left off, because it's the only way that Sam can survive. Nate says that he and Rafe did try and locate the treasure after Sam's untimely demise, specifically saying that they used Rafe's fortune, or at least part of it, to buy the cathedral in Scotland that the clue initially led them to. Apparently, they combed the place for weeks and found absolutely nothing. And Nate says that Rafe is still looking and searching that property after all of these years, but hasn't found anything either. Sam says that he isn't actually surprised because he's done some digging of his own and found something that Rafe hasn't found. 
And then he hands Nate a paper with an auction lot for St. Dismas's cross, which is intact, unlike the one they found at the top of the prison tower. This leads them to conclude that Avery made more than one cross and hid them all throughout the world. And this leads the brothers to assume that whatever was missing out of their Panamanian cross is located inside this new cross, which is being auctioned off very soon. Speaking of the auction, it's being put on at the Rossi estate, which is in effect a black market auction where crime lords and slimy businessmen from all over the world come to buy and sell antiquities. Nate asks how Sam plans on getting an invitation and outbidding very rich criminals, at which point Sam says that he won't bid on it and that instead they will simply steal it. Nate initially shows a little bit of resistance, saying that he doesn't do that type of work anymore and he's moved on, he's married, he's got a good job and a life and a house. But Sam says that he needs Nate's help as he's the only person he trusts with his life. Nate says there has to be another way, but Sam, using the credibility he's garnered after researching the Avery case for so long, says that there's simply no other way. And after all of his research, this is their only option to making progress. So Nate concludes that this is what they have to do. He pulls out his phone and gives a telephone call to Elena saying that Jameson has just walked in with the permits to the Malaysian job, which of course is a lie, but he's doing this so he can try and save his brother. Now I know what you may be thinking. Why didn't Nate poke or prod Sam at all? You would think he'd want to do a little story verification after not seeing his brother for years and years and years. And I'll say that would be very reasonable of you to request more information. I mean, surely Sam wouldn't lie about something like this, or at the very least, surely there isn't more information that isn't being communicated, right? Well, we'll get to that later. The camera then fades to Sam and Nate in boiler suits on a cliff overlooking the aforementioned Rossi estate. Sam says that there's no signs of Sully, who they've brought in for this job, which establishes, of course, that Sully is going to be here. What's interesting is that Sam does not trust Sully at all, and is actually quite upset that they've gotten him involved, saying that he doesn't trust Sully and that Sully will double-cross them, blah blah blah. We're not given a lot of information on the relationship between Sam and Sully, but we can only assume that when Sully came into Nate's life, something wasn't quite as sturdy as it was with Sully and Nate. While Sully effectively played the role of a father figure to Nate in his early years, it seems as though Sam never made that connection. But I think there's more to this hesitation that we'll discuss later on. For now, just remember that Sam doesn't trust Sully. Setting that aside for now, in the distance Nate and Sam can see a light flickering inside the estate. It's Sully signaling them that he's opened the window and they're clear to come in. So the two push up around the exterior of the state along the ocean. It's also here that we're introduced to a new mechanic, the grappling hook, which is probably one of my favorite gameplay mechanics in the entirety of the Uncharted series. Granted, there's not a lot, but nonetheless, I really like it. You platform around the outside and climb your way all the way up to that window where the light was blinking. The two take off their boiler suits and climb in, dressed to the nines in tuxes. Inside, we see Sully sitting and smoking. Classic. Nate and Sully hug while Sam and Sully share what can only be described as a uh, cold greeting. It's not clear if Sam blames Sully for what happened to him or failing to realize that he was stuck in there all this time, or if there's something more going on here that's causing Sam to give Sully the cold shoulder and not trust him. Again, I think there is something going on here that explains Sam's behavior, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. But it's going to spoil things that happen later, so for now, we'll leave it there. It's weird how they're treating each other and causes a bit of unease between the player, Nate, Sam, and Sully. Regardless, the old man takes the brothers to the mezzanine and shows them that the cross is now out next to the auctioneer, not actually in storage where they expected it to be. In addition, the lot order has been changed by someone wealthy because wealthy people make everything difficult. They find out that the bidding is set to start in about 15 minutes, setting a clear time deadline for what you need to accomplish. Sam throws out that in prison, you wait till the lights go out to get anything dirty done. So 
In this case, they need to do the same thing. The group pulls out the blueprints for the Rossi estate, which they've acquired somehow, and find the electricity panel. They decide that they need to shut off the electrical panel to black out the lights and steal the cross. But, considering there's at least one or two backup generators that will kick in shortly after, they'll have to be very quick. And so, with a clear game plan in mind, they assign duties. Nate will kill the lights, Sam will be the waiter, and Sully will keep an eye on the cross in the meantime. Which, considering that it's just sitting on a table and there's all these other people present, just means that Sully's gonna smoke and drink while the other two do stuff. You gotta love Sully. <laughs> the crew goes downstairs to the main level amongst the crowd and tries to sneak into a back area where waiters are going to and from, but it's locked with a key card access panel. So you pickpocket a key card in what I thought was going to be a more established mini game throughout the course of the title, but it turns out that this is just a one-off in effect. This is not going to be a mainstay of the gameplay system, you're just grabbing a quick key card. And instead of making this a quick time event or just a cutscene, they decided to make it a little bit more involved, which I can appreciate. Funnily enough, if you fail this little mini game too many times, the waiter will eventually walk off and Sam will take over. It's a fun little beat that shakes everything loose compared to what you've been doing up to this point. And it's also a good excuse for some bonding between Nate and Sam, with Sam causing a distraction and Nate pulling off the lift, which apparently is something they used to do a lot when they were kids. After you've gotten the card, you go to the same door with access inside now. Sully hands out earpieces so you can all communicate easily between each other and dismisses the two of you into the inner workings of the building. He turns back to the main hall and walks in where he discovers a woman named Nadine. She greets him by telling him to put his hands in the air in a very suave way. They share some brief dialogue with Sully saying things like he barely recognizes her out of her fatigues, and the two compliment each other back and forth, but with an odd tension. Nadine says it's a relief to see another English speaker, even if he is American and she is South African. And soon after, Nadine leaves to get the two a drink. Apparently they have some sort of history, though unlikely it's sexual, it is at the very least one that has a bit of a tension present. Once she's out of earshot, Sully tells the two boys that she owns an army for hire called Shoreline, and that apparently he's had run-ins with them in the past. Again, whatever that means is not clear, it's left very vague. What isn't left vague is that Sully knows if she's here, something serious is going on. So Nate and Sam push through the bowels of the building, through various wine cellars and food storage areas, even coming upon the guards' mess hall. Once outside, you go through a couple of vistas and eventually pull a ladder down outside of a break area for the waiters. Hanging off the ledge, a waiter sees you and asks you what you're doing, at which point Sam comes out, clocks him across the face, and drags him back inside, having acquired the costume he will need to pull off the roll as the waiter. So now, left alone, Nate pushes on to accomplish his mission, specifically to get to the very top of the complex where he can shut off the electrical panel, allowing Sam to swipe the cross. Soon after, we cut back to the main hall, where we see Nadine and Sully conversing once again. But Rafe comes out of nowhere to begin conversing with Sully as well. Nadine asks when she'll get to meet Sully's partner, Nate, and Sully explains that Nate's out married and is no longer in the business. Rafe then throws in some awkward jokes about Nate being as good as dead if he's not active in the game anymore, and Sully throws back some awkward dialogue, pointing out that Rafe is still running mommy and daddy's business and enjoying all of the profits as a result, even though he hasn't actually accomplished anything himself. It's then revealed that Nadine is working for Rafe, and that's why she's here. This causes Sully much concern because he knows that Nadine's company doesn't get involved in frivolous matters. They are the muscle you hire when you need results. And it's here when everything clicks into place. Rafe knows about the cross and is here to buy it. 
He also probably rubbed some elbows to make sure that the order of the bidding would be rearranged so that he could swoop in and get the cross. And furthermore, he has Nadine here so that she can supervise and make sure nothing goes awry. And Rafe, not being an idiot, also knows that Sully would only be here if he was honestly interested in acquiring something. And the only thing here that would interest Sully in the slightest is the cross. So he tells Sully to cut the bullshit and not to bid on the cross, otherwise bad things will happen, knocking a drink out of his hand and causing a scene. But Sully plays it cool and plays dumb, saying that he's not going to get involved and he's just here to have a good time. The group disengages though, and as Sully walks away, he tries to communicate through the earpiece to Nate that he needs to hurry up. But the communication fails because Nate is on the outskirts surrounded by stone, so the earpiece isn't working. We then cut back to Nate still climbing around trying to reach the electrical room. Also really small detail, I know it's insignificant and kind of stupid, but I found this really cool. This bar that's on the outskirts of the villa that you're climbing up actually bends underneath your weight. So as you cross it, it bevels out and bows under your weight. I know this is a very small detail and nobody else probably cares about this, but it's such a nice little detail that Naughty Dog didn't need to include, but they did anyways. I felt as though it was deserving of some praise. I mean, seriously, what other studio would be like, hey, we have a character climbing across a metal bar. Let's go and add a little bit of strain to it so it bows under his weight. No one else would do that. I mean, other studios releasing AAA games charging the same price as Naughty Dog are releasing games with broken releases, bugs that cause save file corruptions or hard crashes, and Naughty Dog is over here bending metal for sake of detail. It's just another example of Naughty Dog making everybody else look as though they're not even trying. Regardless, Nate eventually finds his way inside the electrical room. You find a crowbar, break into the electrical section of the room, and shut off the power. But of course, he only does so after Sully has messed with Rafe just a little bit to buy Nate enough time to find the crowbar to break into the electrical room. Needless to say, Sully having the gall to bid on the cross while Rafe is trying to buy it pisses him off thoroughly. Once the power shut off, the lights are out for a brief moment, and when they come back on, the cross is gone. Sam has successfully swiped it. Rafe turns. Once he realizes what's happened, Rafe turns and sees Sully going into the cellar and chases him, at which point a guard stops him. But Rafe knows who's responsible now. His enemy is established, and we know that this is not the last time we're going to be seeing Rafe and or Nadine. We're now in full escape mode. The power to the complex is off and all of the guards are on high alert. You climb across several rooftops trying to escape and eventually fire erupts. But Nate is able to narrowly escape inside a very large office space filled with bookshelves and desks. Upon opening the door, he's greeted by Nadine. And I'm sure I don't have to say this, but how did she know to go to this room? Like, how did she know that Nathan Drake was climbing up this area and that she'd find the perpetrator of all of these issues in this room? Like, I get it. You need to set up this little boss fight to show that Nadine is really powerful and that you need to be worried about her. But like, come on. Now, this little fist fight actually caused a lot of drama back when the game launched, mainly because Nadine cannot be beaten here. Now, I don't actually have a problem with scripted fight sequences that give the illusion of choice and variety and player agency while keeping you on strict train tracks. Again, this is just something that Naughty Dog does. They give you the illusion of choice while keeping you on a set path, and that's okay. What isn't okay is that this just doesn't make any sense at all. For one, Nadine being here in the first place doesn't make sense. The power to the entire complex was just shut off and the one object that her boss wanted to buy has gone missing. So instead of searching the people in that room trying to find the object, she goes up to this bizarrely out of place tower to go into a library where 
she'll find something. It's not as though she was watching security cameras and tracked him there. It's not as though she knew that this was the only route he could land at. She didn't even know that Nathan Drake was in the business still. The point is, the writers needed to have Nadine show up here because they wanted to have a fist fight where Nadine could beat up Nate and where she could assert her dominance over him. And the second piece that upset a lot of people that I think is also fair is that Nathan Drake is a trained killer. This is a man who, depending on how you played the previous games, has massacred thousands of highly trained militant guards. People will say, well, Nadine is also highly trained and is militarily specialized in what she does, at which point I would say, well, yeah, so was everyone that Nathan Drake killed in the previous games. And so the only thing that you can do to explain away her dominance over Nate here is say that she's more in practice compared to Nate as far as fighting is concerned. And that in turn, Nate is rusty because he hasn't killed anybody in a hot minute. But I just don't buy it because Nate continues to massacre dozens of people over the course of the next half hour of gameplay. Nate isn't presented to the player as somebody grossly out of practice and out of shape. Rather, he's just as good as he always has been, and the extent of his rustiness is small little dialogue quips where Nate says that he's really tired or he used to be able to jump higher things like that. And this is why I just don't think it's acceptable to assert that Nadine could not just defeat Nathan Drake in this instance, but could utterly demolish him. This isn't even a fair fight. She is throwing him around like he is made of flower petals. It, it's not even competitive. And I hate to be this guy that's bringing this up. I mean, I'm not the quartering. I have a few brain cells to rub together, but I can't help but notice that this doesn't make any sense within the world that Naughty Dog has established. And it was only put in here so that Nadine could show off how much of a badass she is and how much better she is than Nathan Drake at fighting and all things physical. It's not just that she's a female character who isn't particularly likable or interesting, it's that nothing about her would suggest that she is more qualified or better enabled than Nate at asserting her dominance in this fight. If she was seven foot six and weighed 350 pounds or was like Helga in The Last of Us Part Two, that would make sense. And I would not have an issue here because size can often overwhelm technique. But Nadine is a relatively small woman who is certainly fit, but not fit enough to overwhelm a trained mass murderer. I didn't have a problem with Helga overpowering Abby in The Last of Us Part Two because that made sense and was reasonable and it passed the sniff test. Meaning that you look at Helga, it makes sense that she could throw someone around like a rag doll. Nadine, I don't believe it. There is another example later on in the game that more clearly asserts this weird fantasy that the writers seem to have with extremely buff women overpowering men, but we'll get to that later. The point is for now, I just want to make it clear that this doesn't make any sense and seems to have just been constructed as a scene so that Nadine could overpower Nathan. It's again, some sort of weird construction where the writers just wanted to see these buff women overpower men. It it's odd, really odd, I don't get it, and it's not the only time we'll see this. Setting all of that aside for now, Nadine hurls Nate out of the window. He grabs onto the curtain and is able to cling on to a flag post underneath. I guess maybe this isn't for flags, maybe banners would be more accurate. But either way, he grabs onto this and you climb your way across the rooftops again, eventually landing inside the main hall where you started all of this. Here you reconnect with Sam and fight through waves of enemies. And I feel as though I have to mention at this point just how much better the shooting feels in this game compared to Uncharted 3. Not just are the environments much more destructible and interactable, 
but they're also just more interesting to look at. The enemies are smarter and move more dynamically. It's just better across the board. Nate and Sully fight their way through the courtyard, and eventually Sully swings in with his massive, very fancy car through the front gate, and they all climb in, escaping together. The crew goes back to their hotel room and opens up the cross. Inside is a scroll with Avery's insignia on it. It's an image with the inscription, Hodi mecum eres in paradiso, meaning today you will join me in paradise, which is what Jesus said to St. Dismas as they died. In addition, there are also the dates of Avery's birth and his death, and the crew works out that they need to find Avery's grave at St. Dismas's cathedral in Scotland, the same property that Rafe bought. They realize that the reason why Rafe hasn't made any progress is because he's been searching the cathedral when he needs to be searching the graveyard, which is apparently pretty far from the cathedral. Sam and Nate assert that they're going to Scotland, but Sully warns that Rafe is certainly going to be waiting there, and Nate blindly dismisses him. He asserts that they are close to discovering the biggest pirate treasure of all time. Sully rightly points out that this is supposed to be about saving Sam's life and not about finding the big treasure. Realizing that he's been called out, Nate backpedals pretty quickly, saying it's about both because they can't save Sam's life without also finding the treasure, which is what he meant to say. But this is the first time we really see these two conflicting motivations present. Nate initially agreed to help Sam on this mission because he wanted to save his big brother. But now we're seeing that he's losing sight of that and is starting to chase the treasure more than anything. Sully then asks how Elena is okay with all of this and, based on Nate's face, realizes that Elena doesn't actually know that they're out doing all of this. Nate gives the excuse that she simply wouldn't understand and Sully says that he's not giving her enough credit, which is certainly true. The truth is that Nate doesn't want to risk Elena talking him out of pursuing the treasure. He's also burdened with all of the lies and withholdings of information that he's presented Elena over the years, specifically not telling her that he has a freaking brother. But I think at the core of it is simply the desire on Nate's part to find the treasure that he's been fantasizing about for all his life. When Nate says that Elena simply wouldn't get it or wouldn't understand, he's not talking about the need to get the treasure to save Sam's life. He's saying that she wouldn't understand his intense desire to find this treasure. She simply wouldn't understand the obsession. And that is perhaps fair. I don't think she would understand it. And as we'll see in the coming sections of the game, even when she does eventually discover the lie, she doesn't understand why Nate is so incessant on going and pursuing this. It's only later that she starts to piece it together and figure out what's driving him. But for now, Nate isn't going to admit fault or any misdeed. So he gets up from the table, sarcastically thanks them for the input, and leaves to call Elena. As he walks out onto the deck to call her, we can hear him engaging the conversation conversation saying some crap about the Malaysia job, where she thinks he is. Once alone, Sam and Sully share an awkward conversation. It's here that we get to see what they actually think of each other. Sully asserts that he's sorry for what happened to Sam, but that it isn't Nate's fault, and it certainly isn't Sully's fault. He tells Sam that it took a long time for Nate to get out, but Sam says that Nate's chosen to get back into the treasure hunting game because he's made for this kind of life. He's made to be an adventurer, which is perhaps true. He tells Sam that it took Nate a long time to get out of the treasure hunting business and that he's finally where he should be, happy with a wife and house, not risking his life day in, day out for sake of some treasure that they don't even know exists. But Sam is totally unapologetic, saying that he's been pulled back into the adventurer's life because this is what he was made to do, which I think is actually probably correct. Sully follows up, trying to make it clear that he's just keeping an eye out for Nate because somebody has to, at which point Sam gets pretty pissed because this, of course, implies that Sam is not looking out for the best interests of his younger brother, which 
I think the reason this perturbs him is because it's absolutely correct. Sam does not have Nate's best interests at heart, which is why he's doing all of this. And this will be made all the more clear in the coming sections. But again, we'll get to that in just a little bit. For now, just know that Sam isn't being completely honest here. And while we're here, I'll also mention that I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but I never really felt as though Sam was trustworthy. I don't know if he's supposed to come off as trustworthy only for that mask to be ripped off later, or if he's supposed to come off as kind of slimy and scummy throughout the entire game. But to me, he always seemed like a scumbag. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I want to know if I'm alone in this. As Nate re-enters, he tells Elena that the job is just taking longer than expected, which he explains away as actually being the truth because the job, not the Malaysian job, but rather seeking out Avery's treasure, is taking longer than they expected. The crew reasserts that they're all still in for seeking the treasure, even if they disagree on each other's core motivations. So we transition to Scotland, where we see Sam and Nate standing alone, with the cathedral being worked on in the distance. It's also established that Sully is sitting in his plane down on the water, primed for an escape, and that he doesn't want to go navigating all of these caves and exploring graveyards, that he's too old for that. In the opening dialogue, Sully asserts that he really doesn't have a good feeling about this stuff, but he trusts Nate at the end of the day. And so, Nate and Sam begin working their way to the graveyard. The next several chapters will try actively to shake up the monotony of the gameplay that we've experienced up to this point. There will be a lot more navigation vertically, a lot more free climbing, and stealth. Though it should be noted, it is very easy to slip into open combat arenas if you happen to screw up and get spotted. It's also important to note that the next couple of chapters will be spent exclusively with Sam. I was looking forward to this, finally a chance for Nate and Sam to catch up. Maybe Sam would let a few things loose that he had been withholding up until this point. Maybe we would get a little bit closer to the truth of what actually happened back in that prison and how he managed to survive this long. After all, I think most players will agree that Sam is probably withholding something. You can't put your finger on it, but he doesn't come off as entirely honest. Something that I think is probably very intentional, considering the detail with which Neil Druckmann directs these scenes. But unfortunately, the dialogue between these two never really goes beyond general banter or discussions of the general setup of the scene. What I mean is that instead of discussing their relationship with each other and catching up on things that they might not have shared up until this point, they go back and forth explaining why Rafe's men are where they currently are, what they might be doing in this area, what their motivations or goals would be, and why they haven't found the treasure yet. In other words, they spend most of this time discussing basic exposition that's meant to justify this sequence to the player. I can understand why they did it, but just because something is necessary or explainable, it doesn't mean that it is fun or enjoyable for the player. I don't know, it could also be that I simply have played through this game a few times at this point, so this isn't new for me, and as a result the dialogue feels very, very plain and bland, but I can't really evaluate this at this point since I can't re-experience the game for the first time. What I can say is that even after playing through the game all these times through, the game looks fantastic, and the Scottish wilderness, landscapes, and cliff faces are fantastically well realized. The level design feels natural, and as you climb and navigate your way around the cliff tops, it feels very organic. Nothing feels overtly contrived, or as though it was constructed specifically for the purposes of a video game. And that's good, because this section is going to last for a couple of hours, and if it didn't feel natural, this would come off as a real trudge. Speaking of trudges, Nate and Sam push their way around a few cliff tops through a few groups of enemies and eventually fight their way into a small steeple next to a graveyard. It's at this graveyard where they believe that Henry Avery was actually buried. At least this is where his grave marker happens to be. You look around on a few different tombstones, eventually finding the one that matches the drawing that Nate has in his notebook, telling you that this is the place to be. Not to mention it also is like the coolest tombstone in the entire graveyard, which should also have been a dead giveaway, but 
Just pointing that out. In what can only be described as an Indiana Jones-inspired moment, Nate turns the skull inside of the tombstone, something which nobody has done in the hundreds of years this has been here. Immediately behind the tombstone, a series of stone blocks drop into the ground, revealing a stairway into a cavern below. Inside, there's a bunch of sarcophagi filling out the crypt. As far as the two can tell, this crypt has been here far longer than the tombstone was, and the secret entrance was added later to cover cover it up since it contained a clue to the whereabouts of his treasure. We then have a very basic puzzle where we align some beams of light with lenses on the back wall, and upon the successful completion of this task, the doors open wide, revealing a large glass structure behind. We can see three crosses and a cave that are circled with an etching on the glass lens for the window. It's clear this cave is where you're supposed to go. Once again, I could point out how absolutely ridiculous it is for somebody to to hide the secret clues of their treasure in this bizarre rabbit trail sort of way, but this is just part of the territory when it comes to these types of stories and kitschy games. I can look past it because it's fun, but we can still acknowledge that it's patently absurd that somebody would do this. I can understand how somebody would argue that this is how the pirates would protect their treasure by making sure only the people that really wanted it would ever stand a chance of finding it, but it doesn't make it any more absurd. You exit the graveyard and begin pushing on towards the cave. Along the way, you go through a few stealth sequences, which are really, really easy to screw up, which will inevitably lead to a large shootout. I've gotten through a couple of these without killing anybody, but for the most part, it will eventually devolve into a gunfight. There's no hard fail state if this happens, so most of the time people won't reload and will simply fight, clearing out the enemies one by one. I understand why they do this for sake of immersion, that if you're discovered, you simply have to fight your way out of the bad situation, but it's still frustrating that they don't push you harder into navigating these levels stealthily because they are built very carefully to allow you to do just that. And it's something we know Naughty Dog can do. We saw it with The Last of Us and of course with The Last of Us Part 2. The difference is that in those games, if you're discovered, the combat ramps up in difficulty significantly. If you're playing as Joel or Ellie and you're discovered while stealthing your way through a section of the map, you can technically fight your way through, but thanks to the scarce resources and the extreme power with which the enemies can attack you, in many cases, it's it's smarter to just reload and try again, saving your ammunition and resources for an encounter that will actually demand it. But in Uncharted, since these resources are so numerous, especially on any of the normal difficulty settings, even the hard difficulty settings for the most part, most people are probably just going to push through, fighting their way through, collecting new weapons, swapping everything out so they end up right where they began after this encounter. It's not a huge deal for sake of gameplay, but narratively, I think it is very significant. Nate and Sam have a vested interest in Rafe not knowing that they're in Scotland, because after all, they're hoping to sneak in and steal the treasure out from under his nose. Again, remember, at this point, they still think the treasure is in Scotland where they currently are. If Rafe finds out that they're running around killing his men, he will be on high alert and know to look for them. But if they were to go through this entire sequence, completely stealthily, then he wouldn't find out that they were present, he wouldn't know that they were still a threat, and likely would still think that they were out of the game or dead. If this dynamic duo were able to get through this entire Scottish section without being detected, it would serve their interests much better. For one, they might be able to actually swoop in and steal the treasure. And secondly, it wouldn't put their life at danger. And thirdly, Rafe wouldn't know that they would need to return to Scotland to continue seeking the treasure. In fact, Rafe probably wouldn't know that there was anything significant back at the graveyard and would continue just blowing up this cathedral for no apparent reason. In other words, it's incredibly reckless and irresponsible for Nate and Sam to go through these levels tolerating their own discovery. Narrative 
Comparatively speaking, I think there should be a hard fail state if you're discovered at any point during this mission. But unfortunately, this doesn't happen. If you're discovered, Rafe's men radio openly saying that they have two people attacking them, killing them all over the place, notifying Nadine and in turn Rafe, as we'll see in a cutscene in just a moment, and effectively killing any chance that they would have at actually acquiring the treasure without notifying Rafe. And to put a bow on all of this, remember, Rafe owns this property free and clear completely legally. Rafe has every right to be searching this area, blowing stuff up, because he owns the land. Nate and Sam are trespassing. They don't have a right to be here, and that is beyond question. If they were to find the treasure and Rafe find out that they had found the treasure on his property, they would have no legal claim to it. And Rafe, with his countless resources and his ability to demonstrate that Nate and Sam had killed dozens of his men to acquire this treasure on his property, would surely go through the courts to claim the treasure even if Nate and Sam were to find it. There's just no other way of looking at it. It is patently stupid for Nate and Sam to be okay with being seen. The game's writers and designers should not tolerate the player being discovered. They should have a hard fail state, and if you happen to be discovered, you should be forced to restart that sequence and get through it stealthily. For narrative reasons, if you need Rafe to discover the pair, as I think they needed him to do, fine. So be it. You can write that in in a cutscene later when it's beyond the player's control. But to allow the player to play so cavalierly without any regard for what is actually going on narratively in the meta discussion of what's happening within the story, it's just really lazily and sloppily done in my opinion, especially for a Naughty Dog game that usually takes these kinds of things into consideration. Regardless, we continue pushing through, and we start to do some of the hardcore free climbing that we discussed a few moments ago. Here the player will be climbing all over these cliff sides along these really interesting geological formations, and even swinging along ramps and over debris that's been left after centuries of collapse and degradation. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I understand that many people find these free climbing sequences to be boring, bland, and monotonous, but I actually enjoy them. I think the free climbing system, while nowhere near as robust as Assassin's Creed Unities or other games that we've seen in recent memory, is still serviceable and I think relatively enjoyable. I will grant you that a lot of the time it just turns into X mashing, where you just spam the X button to jump along ladder ladders or cliff faces quickly, but I think usually the movement and the actions that Nate performs in response to your inputs feels fair and feels appropriate for what you were trying to get him to do. The worst thing that can be said for these types of games that have free climbing systems is when you expect the player character to do something and they do the opposite, such as in Assassin's Creed when you're running along, expect the character to climb up one wall, but instead he jumps clean off of it, sending you down flying to your death. That almost never happened to me in the multiple run-throughs of Uncharted 4 that I've played. It's always managed to feel fair and very responsive, so I think that's a point in their favor. The level designers also started to mix up a lot of different systems, such as the free climbing, the swinging, stealth combat, and gunplay, such as this arena. In this arena, you can swing around, you can hide in the tall grass, you can shoot people outright, or you can just stealth your way around using these aforementioned assets. These levels are, I think, the most interesting of the entire group, and thankfully, there are many more of them as the game progresses. The opening hours of the game featured very typical uncharted shooting arenas, which were flat, bland, and boring, but these shooting arenas are much more interesting featuring verticality, lots of varied and dynamic movement, and even built-in stealth tool sets and opportunities that you wouldn't expect to be here. While the AI isn't the brightest and you'll find yourself sitting on cliff ledges for extended period of times waiting for an enemy to walk where they need to, I still think that this is a market improvement over the previous games and I think it's worthy of laudation. This same formula of free climb, shooting gallery, free climb, shooting gallery, 
gallery repeats a few times until eventually Nate and Sam find their way into an icy cavern. Inside this cave, the two find a door. Next to the door is a hole in the wall that reminded me of every single action film ever where the hero sticks his arm in and pretends that he's hurt. It, it's such a cliche, but you know what? They had to do it at least once. He reaches in and pulls a lever that he feels on the inside, and the door swings open. Inside the next room, there are a few skeletons and a sign that reads, quote, For those who prove worthy, paradise awaits. For those who prove false, behold your grim fate. But the sign itself was not left by Henry Avery. Rather, it was left by the Rhode Island pirate, Thomas II. Sam says this couldn't possibly be because Thomas II died trying to claim Avery's treasure as his own. Nate points out that these were just stories and that the truth may actually be different from what the stories communicated. Baffled, the team pushes on, eventually finding a very elaborate and yet oddly beautiful puzzle. This puzzle is actually pretty straightforward. Basically, you have to make sure that the bucket is at the very top of this arrangement with the crosses in their proper alignment in the light. I wouldn't say it's difficult, it's just tedious. Unfortunately, that's a criticism that can be levied against most of the puzzles in Uncharted 4. It brings to mind the core question that I think should be at a lot of people's minds, which is whether or not tedium can constitute fun and should be tolerated, or if it is just what it sounds like, a tedious activity meant to pad out gameplay time. I understand that not everything can tie in perfectly with the meta narrative of the game, and some elements of the game's design will have to be just for that, for sake of the game's design. Once again, you can bring into question whether or not this puzzle would actually test the average aspiring pirate and filter out those who weren't worthy, but I think that that conversation isn't really worth having because, again, this is more about challenging the player, padding out gameplay time, and making things relatively interesting and engaging as you explore these caves instead of just having a simple cave path for you to run along. But inevitably, that's what happens. The two continue to push their way through, eventually ending up underneath the main cathedral. They reach a wall as they climb along, and the two, standing side by side, can hear a conversation between Rafe and Nadine through the cracks in the floor. The two share a heated back and forth, where they're effectively arguing which methodology is going to be the most efficacious moving forward. Rafe's or Nadine's? Nadine's method is to blindly blow things up to try and find a large cavern underneath the cathedral, which likely either houses the treasure or a clue that's necessary to find the treasure. Rafe wants to take a much more methodical approach, trying to do things carefully and calculated. In his mind, if you use explosives willy-nilly, you might find the cavern that you need to get into, but if you blow up the cavern in the process, there won't be anything to analyze. Sure, if the cavern is filled with gold, the gold won't mind the G-force or the potential destruction that could come. You could always just dig it out. But if the treasure isn't underneath the cathedral, blowing up key pieces of evidence could lead to the treasure being lost forever. Nadine also brings up an interesting point, such as the cross that was brought to auction, which Sam and Nate stole. Rafe insists that the auction was the cleanest way to get the cross, and that while they could have stolen it well beforehand, according to Nadine, it wouldn't have been the most effective or clean way of doing it, whatever that means. But Nadine points out that this was probably just done to get competition involved. In other words, Rafe allowed the cross to end up in the auction because he secretly wanted Sam and Nate to steal it, which would introduce competition, which would help make progress discovering the treasure. Rafe feels as though he hasn't made enough over these last few years trying to hunt it down, and that he might actually need Nate and Sam's expertise. Rafe rejects this, saying that he didn't think Drake would actually show up, but Nadine questions if Rafe actually wanted to do this intentionally all along, and if he's actually secretly happy this happened. We'll leave the discussion there, but keep this in mind, because when we get to a major plot point that's revealed later in the game, this conversation will have all new meaning. 
I know that's tantalizing and mysterious, but I have to leave it there if we're going to make any progress and avoid major spoilers, so just sit tight. After hearing this conversation, Nate and Sam have a sense of urgency instilled in them. Nadine has just asserted that she's going to ramp up the explosions and try to get to the treasure quickly. She's sick and tired of waiting and probably has heard rumblings that Nate and Sam are probably pretty close. It's unclear at this point if she knows whether or not they are currently on the premises killing her men or if she has heard rumblings that this might be the case, but either way, she has a bad feeling about it. I would say that it would be patently ridiculous for her not to know, considering that they have walkie-talkies and this game takes place in the 21st century, so surely somebody who was shot or injured called for help, but we'll just set that aside for now. There's a lot more platforming, eventually leading to a large open area that contains what used to be a puzzle of some sort, which has long since collapsed. This is actually one of the more interesting areas of this whole series of levels. Levels. It's a puzzle area, but it's one that's collapsed and fallen apart. You can only imagine what it used to be like way back in the day before it broke down. And I honestly wish that they did this more often in this series, that we had the chance to see more of these dilapidated puzzles, because especially when we're dealing with these complicated machines that were built hundreds and hundreds of years ago, sometimes thousands of years ago, it would only make sense that some of these vague puzzles would break down over time. It's pretty ridiculous that they would all be in contact, perfectly functioning millennia later, as we saw in the first three Uncharted games. Seriously, just think about it. What are the odds that every single gigantic stone door that has some vague and obscure locking mechanism would work hundreds or thousands of years after the fact. I understand why they always work for sake of the story, because it would cause a lot of pacing issues if Nate and Sam got all the way to this final chamber and then the door was broken and they couldn't get in. But I think it's important to note that this doesn't make any damn sense, and you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit to get through this. My other issue with this gigantic cavern is that it opens directly to the sea below. It might have been completely enclosed hundreds of years before when this was initially built, but over time it's worn down and now it's open to the elements. This explains why it collapsed and why the puzzle is no longer standing, but it introduces a fleet of new issues, narratively speaking. Most important among them is how has Rafe not come across this? Supposedly he's been searching this area for close to two decades, searching every nook and cranny of the cathedral, of the surrounding land, trying to find this cavern, and now he's brought in Nadine, who has dozens upon dozens, possibly hundreds or even thousands of men in her employ that are mercenaries traveling this land in boats, cars, ships, helicopters, etc., following her orders to find this very place. Are you seriously suggesting that after all this time, these 20 years and Nadine's active efforts, they haven't taken a boat along the coast to see if there's any caverns peeking through? Nobody grabbed a drone and flew in to see this? I, I don't buy that. And in what is, once again, another bizarre coincidence that, of course, is highly construed, once Nate and Sam enter the next room, selecting a coin to open up a projection of Madagascar on the floor that they stand on, Nadine and her men blow their way into the chamber. At the exactly correct time to interrupt their conversation in the optimal way. Nate and Sam trick her into having a guard grab the crucifix off the pedestal, which is actually a trap, which causes the man who grabbed it to fall down to his death. Nadine narrowly escapes, grabbing onto a ledge and escaping out the hole that she came in. As the entire chamber slowly collapses as a result of the crucifix being selected, 
everything begins to fall apart. You climb up this pillar as it's falling apart, swinging in the air freely, and I gotta say, this sequence is actually pretty memorable and well executed, considering how tough it must have been to get this working. The next 10 minutes are a flurry of shooting galleries and arenas as you fight through waves of her men. Eventually, you fight your way through all of the hordes and slide down a rock face to Sully waiting in the plane down below. You climb in as the gunshot rings off, but you're able to take off without issue. Once in the plane, the group discusses what they've discovered and what all of this could mean. The crew agrees that they need to go to Madagascar and that's their next destination. Nate says that the cross that they found was an invitation but the cave was actually an initiation of sorts to test the real motivations of the people that came to eventually join Avery's crew. Stoli properly asks why Henry would have gone through so much effort to try and weed out the unworthy, and Nate says it was probably just to protect himself. After all, Avery was the most wanted man in the world at that time, so he needed to make sure the only people that got to him were those that were actually deserving. In effect, he wanted to filter out the authorities and those who were simply looking for a quick buck. He wanted the true pirates, the people that actually understood how Henry operated and why his goals were, in a twisted way, noble. Nate also thinks that Avery probably sent these crosses to wealthy pirates and that they all pooled their wealth together in a new land, that they would all rule together free from the governance of world powers. This, of course, is known as Libertalia the home of the pirates that they founded for themselves. And this also means that in Libertalia, if found, they wouldn't just be looking at Henry Avery's treasure, but the treasure of all of the pirate lords combined. Potentially billions upon billions of dollars worth of gold and artifacts. Soli, now adequately excited, asks where to and Nate brings up the coin that they took off of the altar in place of the crucifix. On the back of it is the volcano that's next to King's Bay. The crew excitedly heads off for Madagascar and we cut to Elena calling Nate. Remember, she still doesn't know what's going on, but has an inkling that something's off. She asks Nate if he's okay, as there's a bunch of flooding in Malaysia where he allegedly is, and Nate continues to BS, saying that he is okay, but because of the monsoon and the fact that it's monsoon season, all of the work that they're doing has been postponed roughly 10 days. Elena immediately goes to book a flight to go out there and join him, but Nate, obviously not okay with this since he's not actually in Malaysia, insists that he doesn't need her to do that, that she should stay behind, continue to do her work, because they're probably just overestimating the time at the end of the day. This moment is very well executed in terms of the animation graphically and just the performances of the actors. Elena is trying to be supportive, but she can't help but feel as though Nate is lying to her about something, and knowing her and how well she knows Nate, she probably has a hunch that he's off to his old shenanigans again, that there is no Malaysia job, and he's not actually trying to follow Jameson's guide when he says he has to get off the phone. Her face in this last shot is just heartbreaking, and you can tell she's trying to figure out what to do. Don't worry, she is going to come and smack some sense into Nate very shortly. We then cut to the crew in Madagascar. Nate, Sam, and Sully have rented a jeep with a winch on it, and we're going to start going through some of the more open levels that the game has to offer. The goal is pretty simple. We have to push on to the volcano, get up there, and look for some sort of clue that Henry Avery left behind. We don't know what form these clues will take, but we're hoping something will be left behind. Now that we've reached Madagascar, I feel as though I can adequately discuss just how bloated a lot of this game feels. This segment of the game constitutes my least favorite portion of everything that Uncharted 4 has to offer. I find the shooting arenas to be boring, I find the ever refreshing waves of enemies uninspired and flat out uninteresting. And to put it simply, it comes off as far too familiar to the desert sequences in Uncharted 2 than I would consider to be appropriate for a next generation title compared to the last one. The levels have some verticality to them, 
but effectively they're all small arenas that require you to shoot a bunch of enemies before progressing and they repeat this time and time again. The goal for Sam, Nate, and Sully is very straightforward. Reach the volcano, try to discover some points of interest, and discover some long lost clues to the Henry Avery treasure. Simply, they just have to drive to the mountain. But Naughty Dog needed to turn this into a two to three hour sequence filled with all sorts of mindless puzzles, tearing down bridges, and wide open spaces that are initially beautiful to look at, but inevitably require constant double backs to find the route that you're supposed to travel on. It seems to me that this sequence was the proof of concept for what would eventually be the Seattle sequence in The Last of Us Part 2, where you have the entire map of downtown Seattle open to you to explore. It took Naughty Dog years of experimentation to get to the point where they felt comfortable implementing that into one of their main games. Even in The Lost Legacy, which we'll be discussing in an upcoming critique, they were fairly insecure about the wide open spaces. What I can say is that these expansive areas, while beautiful, definitely improved as they experimented more and more with their design. It turns out it's not that easy to design a large open space for the player to navigate and to do so in a way where it's clear where the player needs to go next. You see in The Last of Us Part Two, those large open areas in Seattle were available to the player to go through in any order in which they pleased. You could start at the bank, go to the courthouse, it didn't matter. But on Uncharted 4, you have to continue along a a set path, as is standard for most Naughty Dog games, but they want you to feel as though it's your idea and that you are freely traveling about the base of this volcano. But as I mentioned earlier, I've played this game through a few times, so it's hard for me to maintain an air of skepticism and a balanced view on this because I am familiar with this map and this part of the game. It's not new to me. I know what I'm looking for and I know where I need to go, so every time I engage with this now, it feels extremely tedious. But that being said, I would still insist that even for a new player going through this the first time, it would feel remarkably unguided and confusing. Naughty Dog eventually figured it out, but this was definitely a crash course for them. Now I could go through each of these combat encounters in all of the arenas, but I think it would be remarkably drawn out. So instead, I'll just hit the highlights. For one, there's the introduction of this winch on the front of the Jeep that you're driving. It's actually a pretty cool mechanic, allows you to pull down bridges, doors, trees, and eventually you can even use it to climb and winch your way up this muddy ramp to get back up to the road. But when when you do so, you actually pull the boulder out of place that was sitting on the muddy road and you slide over the cliff, being held up only by the winch. What follows is actually one of the more memorable moments of the game for me. I don't know why this stood out to me and why I remember this so clearly, but the first time I played this game, falling off this cliff was a total system shock to me and ever so carefully driving back up the cliff with the winch holding on for dear life. It stuck in my mind. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the point of these cinematic moments. If they aren't memorable, interesting, and even stress-inducing, there's no purpose to them. They're just filler that's expensive to produce. But this sequence, though fairly simple, just a rock sliding and a car going over a cliff, it's very memorable and I gotta give him credit for that. There's also a few discussions that Nate and Sully share with Sam about Hector Alcazar and everything that went on in the prison while Sam was incarcerated. They don't ask Sam any hard-hitting questions or really interrogate him about his time in the prison. Rather, deciding to leave that unspoken because they're sure it was a difficult time for him and some things just don't need explaining. And yet I'm over here calling BS on that because I think it is very reasonable to question Sam, especially because anybody who looks at this guy is going to get a hint that he's probably being deceptive. At least he's withholding some of the truth. Maybe he does just come off as a sleazeball. Maybe I just don't trust people that look like Sam, but I can't help but feel as though he comes off 
scummy. And I admit it's not scientific in the least, but I asked all of my friends, my wife, and practically everybody else I could get a hold of whether or not they trusted Sam when they first met him in Uncharted 4. And every single one of them said no, I was expecting him to betray Nate or for it to be revealed that he was a doppelganger or something of the sort. If Sam wasn't meant to be scummy and sleazy, this is a huge issue and a major failing on the part of the director and Troy Baker in his performance. To play a character who the director and writers mean to be honest and direct and have him come off as a sleazeball used car salesman is pretty far from the mark. And that's a big issue, especially when you're dealing with a relationship as intense and emotional as an older brother with his younger brother. And on the flip side, if they intended for Sam to be a sleazeball and come off in this way, which I think is more likely than not, I can't help but feel as though the dialogue doesn't reflect what Nate and certainly Sully, perhaps especially Sully, should be feeling at this point. Sully's incredibly streetwise. Sam's story doesn't really add up. And it's strange that even in this moment when they're driving through an expansive Madagascar field, that he doesn't even think to ask a few basic questions. All of that said, Sam says some basic crap about having read a lot while he was in prison. Apparently he was able to get books from a guard that was sneaking stuff in for him, but eventually the guard was caught and he never saw him again. Other than that, not much happens. You push your way up to a tower that's been abandoned for a long time, about halfway up the volcano. Inside, the crew finds out that they need to go to other towers elsewhere on the island. And after they deal with an ambush filled with a bunch of shoreline men who somehow knew to come to this particular area, you decide to split up. The crew uses the coin that they got back in Scotland to determine that it's one of two towers on the island but they can't be sure since the coin has worn down, so it's unclear if it's a trident or a scale of justice or whatever you would call this. So Sam goes to one and Nate and Sully head to the other. We now begin what I lovingly call the E3 section. And I do that not because I'm extremely clever or anything, it's just that they showed this section at E3 back in like 2015, 2016, whenever it was, I don't know. At the time, this was really groundbreaking. Tons of NPCs that all have individual models, clothes, attitudes, animations, poses, you name it, they have it. The attention to detail is off the charts. Not to mention, graphically, it's extremely impressive as you walk through this shop and the hundreds of patrons scattered throughout. And the dynamic animation set as Nate squeezes around characters, I remember, was just absolutely shocking at the time. Let's not forget that it's easy to look back on these games and lose appreciation for what they achieved because we're so used to it now. But the only reason we're used to it is because these guys were pioneers who did it first and did it fantastically well. All of the little details that we've been commenting on throughout the course of this video, such as that bar bending under Nathan Drake's weight or his hands rubbing up against walls when he runs next to them, all were small touches that the artists and developers put in here even though they didn't have to. The game would in large part be exactly the same if they didn't take this extra step to add this attention to detail, to add the dynamic sensors for when Nate's character model is close to a wall and then have an animation trigger where he raises his hand to the wall to brace himself. It's fantastic, and this is what makes Naughty Dog stand out against the rest. This is why everybody says that Naughty Dog games make it look like everyone else isn't even trying. And trust me, there's a whole lot more. It's one of the reasons I love playing back through these games. Every time you think you've seen everything it has to offer, you'll play through it again and notice tons more touches and little details that you hadn't considered before. But at this point, I'm rambling. And yeah, I know, insert joke about that's just how my videos are. I, I know, they're just kind of like monetized ramblings at this point. But anyway, <laughs> after pushing their way through the crowds in the market, Nate and Sully find their way into the large clock tower that is at the market's precipice. 
Inside, we have one of the more interesting free climbing and puzzle sections that the game has to offer. It mixes free climbing with these puzzles because you have to climb certain things in certain ways and time it properly in order to avoid falling or having it reset. Climbing these gears also stands out in my memory as one of the more interesting gameplay experiences I had had at that time in 2016. Once you get up into the inner workings of the clock tower, you'll notice that there are a bunch of bells that you have to ring. This has to be done in a particular order, though I feel I should mention that if you knock out the scorpion first, for example, you don't need to repeat the scorpion if you happen to get the second one wrong. It simply won't work, and then you'll have to continue exploring to find which one you need to ring. This is yet another example of the game not presenting a difficult puzzle, but rather a tedious one. This isn't difficult to figure out, it's just a matter of how much time it takes you to figure out how to get up to the next bell that actually has to be rung in that order. Once you've rung all four bells, the floor rearranges and appears to present the logo or symbol of Henry Avery and the Pirates, telling you that you are absolutely in the right place. Somehow, Nate knows that he still has to ring the gigantic bell at the very top of the tower in order to progress, so he continues making his way up. And there's actually a really interesting moment here where you're at the top of the clock tower and you have to climb outside while extremely high in the air overlooking the entire island. And you have to climb across the clock face with the different hands of the clock providing the hand holds. And what's interesting is once you get on the minute hand, it actually swings under your weight. So you effectively have one chance at this. Furthermore, they aren't arranged in the ideal position when you first climb out the window. So you have to go back in, climb the gears, which reset the clock hands to the correct position for you to be able to climb on them to get across. This is what I mean when I point out that the free running in this game is so much more creatively implemented than the previous game's systems were. Those systems effectively constituted nothing more than getting from point A to point B, allowing the player to engage with a cutscene or some other moment that was triggered by the arrival at that location. The free climbing was nothing more than a means to an end, whereas in Uncharted 4, the free running is in and of itself an end. But setting that aside, once you're at the top of the clock tower, you try to ring it with the same mechanism that you did the other ones, but it snaps off, almost hitting Sully on the ground below. So you jump onto the bell to ring it manually, but it detaches when you do so. And pretty soon the entire clock begins to collapse under its own weight. The bell falls all the way to the bottom, smashing open the floor and revealing the access to the hidden passageway underneath. Nate and Sully have to remove some rubble to open up the path again, but it's not a big deal because the characters can do this when it's convenient for the writers and they can't when it's not convenient, but I'll just leave it there. You know what? No. Games do this all the time, and Naughty Dog especially does it in these Uncharted games, where a pathway is blocked arbitrarily, and the characters decide they can't climb over it, can't go around it, and can't clear it by hand. Until they can, in an instance like this, where they suddenly gain the ability to move a small log out of the way. I'm sorry, but it's always bugged me that these games do this, where clearly there's a fence that they could climb over or squeeze through, but they don't because the writers don't want them to. I'll stop ranting about it now because it's beside the point and it's just an artifact of video games being, well, video games. So I'll just shut up. In the guts of the clock tower, we find a basic puzzle that presents a few symbols with some different signs along the edges, and they have to be arranged and rotated so that they line up properly. It's simple enough. And as the tiles get swapped out, they'll have new symbols assigned to them based on the paintings that are revealed inside each of these chambers that open up once you solve each 
aforementioned puzzle. By the end of this puzzle, Nate will have to keep track of these symbols in his notebook, and he'll even tear out little squares for these puzzles so you can solve it in your notebook before going to the actual puzzle box to do it. I can't express enough how much I love this, I think it's so cool, and I wish they had found more ways to make Nate's notebook useful. The notebook has tons of interesting little tidbits, small quirks, and even artwork that he's drawn. There's so much good stuff in there, but unfortunately, I don't think many players will spend the time that they should sifting through it and enjoying all of the little details. Maybe more puzzles like this that Nate has to conceptually solve within the notebook and then translate it into the actual puzzle box, or maybe just puzzles that have to be answered correctly on their first go, so he has to make sure he has it solved in his notebook before experimenting on the actual puzzle system and mechanism itself. I I'm sure there's many ways they could do this, but I just wanted to point out that I loved that they were able to implement this little system into this large puzzle that everybody will have to solve in order to progress. As you work your way through the puzzle, you'll also call Sam occasionally to ask him questions about different pirates. You send him pictures of the people on the walls, of the locations, and even text him information that tells him what you're seeing and what it could possibly mean. This initially seems innocuous enough, but it will come back to bite them in just a second. After you solve the last puzzle on the puzzle box, it rotates and reveals three separate discs that have an impression on them. So Nate pulls out his camera, takes some pictures of them to send them to Sam, and then records them in his notebook. He takes the pieces of paper and holds them up against the light on the wall, which happens to be lit very conveniently, and discovers the actual location for what they assume is Libertalia. Once they discover this, Nate becomes very excited, as does Sully. He's very intrigued. But Nate gets a phone call, and when he picks it up, it's not Sam. It's Rafe. Turns out he somehow paid somebody off to hack Nate's phone and has been receiving all of the text messages that he's been sending to Sam along with all of the pictures, meaning that he has all of the same information Nate does, but hasn't had to do any of the work. I could go on a diatribe about how this doesn't make any damn sense and how he probably couldn't just hack into somebody's cell phone, but I think there's a more reasonable explanation for how he got these text messages. I will save that for later, though. I know I keep saying that, but I don't want to spoil things in case you haven't played this game before. So for now, just know that Rafe has been getting all of the text messages that have been going to Sam and that Sam has been sending to Nate. Nate hangs up on Rafe, but immediately realizes that Sam will also be in danger soon because Rafe knows exactly where they are. So he commands Sam to destroy his phone and then throws his down to smash it, destroying it. Small correction, I guess I should clarify. It's not clear if he's hacking Sam's phone, Nate's phone, and Sully's phone. The phone that Nate answers is actually Sully's, but it's unclear what exactly Rafe is doing to get access to all of their inter-party communications. Again, I think I have an answer for this later, but we'll save it. Sam is immediately attacked with gunfire at the lower tower, and so Nate and Sully know they have very little time to get to him. So the two race out of the plaza, down the hill, and into the market. And once they reach the base of the stairs, a bunch of gunshots are rained out, and all of the locals run and hide. All of a sudden, this vibrant marketplace is empty and has turned itself into another shooting arena. But just when it seems like another boring bland arena for you to fight through, though featuring some interesting shooting mechanics, such as hiding behind these bags of beans, they actually get drained with gunshots. It's a cool touch that I didn't actually appreciate when the game first came out, but I will say it's very impressive to see this type of thing even nowadays with cover destruction actually implemented in real time, so I think it absolutely deserves praise considering this released in 2006 which, as bizarre as it is to say, was five years ago. Or six years ago if you're watching this in 2022, which is far more likely. And for those of you watching this in 2023 or 2024, hi. <laughs> 
<laughs> what's it like? What's going on? I don't, let me know. I, I'm interested. But at the end of the market, a gigantic armored truck bursts onto the scene and begins to open fire. You run through a couple of buildings to try and avoid its fire, eventually getting on top of a small marketplace shop to jump into the Jeep that's parked in the lot just above the market. And so begins yet another E3 sequence. This was shown off, so it wasn't a surprise to anybody when the game launched, but it also features one of the most wide open environments that Naughty Dog ever created. They actually did create this entire town and they do allow the player to navigate it freely. Though it's important to note, this is effectively just a gigantic ski hill. There's a few basic routes that you can take, but at the end of the day, you're still going down the same hill. What's really impressive though, is all of the destruction and physics that are implemented here, such as catching clothes on clotheslines on the car that drag realistically behind you, smashing through fences, bumping into cars, smashing crates and different carts for local street vendors, and even even once you get down to this bazaar along this street that's filled with baskets and carts full of fruit, not a single frame drops and it performs fantastically well throughout. Granted, I don't have a base launch day PS4 to test this on, but my PS4 Slim that I played this on back in 2016, which was brand new at the time, did hold up remarkably well and didn't drop a single frame itself, though to be fair, I'm sure it was rendering at a severely reduced resolution. Yet another instance of Naughty Dog being able to absolutely perfectly refine the gameplay experience for the player. They have zero tolerance for major frame drops, for bugs, for hitches, and moments that would totally tear the player out of immersion. You really have to hand it to them, even if you don't appreciate their narratives or the way that they tend to design their games or even their culture within the studio. They do very good work, and they are certainly perfectionists. Once at the bottom of the hill, Nate and Sully see Sam riding and trying to escape a gigantic brigade of mercenaries that are chasing him. He's on a rinky-dinky motorcycle trying to get away from them as they openly fire at him with machine guns. Again, I'll just point out, this is a little ridiculous that after a five or ten minute shootout, he wouldn't get so much as a scratch while riding a motorcycle. But once again, this is just something you have to accept in order for these action games to be fun at all. If they were realistic, almost nothing would happen in the entire story. Eventually, the crew reaches the river, which opens up to a bridge, and the road runs out. So Nate throws his grapple hook onto the truck that's chasing Sam and swings holding on for dear life behind the truck as he slides through the mud and grime and dirt and through chickens. It's pretty insane. And I gotta just say, this was wildly impressive in 2016 when it was shown off at E3, and it is still wildly impressive today. If any game did this that launched at any point in the next few years, I think this would still be wildly impressive. The fact that they have the ever-changing environment, the constantly changing platforms as you move from truck to car to motorcycle, what have you, and the fact that it does all of this without so much as dropping a few frames. It is fantastically impressive. Granted, Naughty Dog had a lot of experience with this, even going back to the train sequence in Uncharted 2, but that's exactly why this runs so well. They've done this before, and they figured it out. You try to hold off the mercenaries for as long as you can, eventually taking over a car and getting up next to Sam. The two disagree on which one should jump onto whose vehicle, and they do this just too long, to the point where Nate is T-boned by the truck that was just chasing us through the city and all of those little bazaars. The car flips and lights on fire. So Nate slowly climbs his way out and jumps onto Sam's motorcycle. Sam then hands Nate a gun, which is some sort of fully automatic handheld mini 
machine gun. I can't really tell what it's supposed to be looking at it. It looks like just a fully automatic pistol of some sort, but he opens fire on the truck as it chases you through this dock area. You unload with unlimited ammo on this thing, though it stands to reason that it doesn't actually matter how accurate you are because you're actually just headed to a set destination at the end of the dock. You have to continue dealing damage, otherwise you'll enter a fail state, but so long as you do this, there's no actual threat to the player, even though it feels as though you're in severe and serious danger. Eventually, the car flips, explodes, and Sam and Nate drive off into the sunset, safe having escaped what could only be assumed as imminent death. The crew heads back to the motel, and as Nate walks into the room, claiming the treasure is as good as theirs, he pauses and he sees that Elena is in the room looking at the notes that the gang has collected. She sadly asks how the Malaysia job is going. Nate insists it isn't what it looks like, but it is. Elena, being able to read Nate like a book, says it looks an awful lot like they're searching for Avery's treasure and giving all of the shoreline soldiers all throughout the island Looks like they aren't the only ones looking for it either. Nate admits it kind of is what it looks like, but he says that he can explain, but it will certainly sound crazy. And Elena says, try me, but, uh, well, it, it sounds pretty crazy because at this point he still hasn't even explained to her that he has a brother. I'll just let the following little bit play out because I can't do it justice. So here you go. This is uh, Sam. Sam Drake, my brother. Hi. I'm sorry. I, I thought he had died in a Panamanian Neat. jail, but I was obviously very wrong. He's been stuck in there for 15 years and it's because of me. And the guy who broke him out wants a lot of money, and the only way we can pay off the debt is Avery's treasure. But, but that's the good news. We, we found it. it it's, it's on an island just off the coast. Okay, just stop. Was there ever a Malaysia job? I... Okay. Come on, come on wait. Elena, wait! I don't get you. Look, I, I wanted to tell you. You know what, enough! No, I wanted to, but how could I? I don't know, just say it! <laughs> I had to protect you! That is bullshit, Nate. You just didn't have the nerve to face me, again. I, I knew you would react like this. <gasps> how would you react? You lied to me. For weeks. If you were killed, I... I wouldn't have even known about it. And now you have a brother. Who are you? Come on. I'm me. Come on, it's me. It's different this time. Oh my God. I have to save him. I don't even care about the treasure. Many details. The many look good. on your face when you walked into this room. If you're done lying to me, then you should stop lying to yourself. I got a plane to catch. You do what you have to do. Hey. Hey, what are you doing? Go after her. We're not done here. Well, maybe we should be. What are you saying? I'm saying maybe there's a smarter way to save Sam. Such as? Such as we give him a new identity. We we put him in hiding somewhere. He's I got been contact. in prison for 15 years. He's not going into hiding. Okay, fine. You go after your wife. Sam and I will head off for Libertalia. Without me? Come on, you'll get both of you killed. <laughs> really? <laughs> Kid, I've been doing this for a hell of a long time. I think I might be able to handle- Hey, hand you want to be helpful, Sullivan? Go keep an eye on her. Saying Sullivan instead of Sully.
Whatever you say. You need a hand? I got it. I'll just go so pack your bags. Go take a bath. Now, this whole scene raises a lot of interesting questions, both about Nate's relationship with Sam, Nate's relationship with Elena, and Sully's relationship with all of them. Sully really genuinely cares about Nate and Elena, and I think he's starting to realize that he can't trust Sam. Or, more specifically, he's starting to realize that Sam isn't actually considering what's best for Nate. He just wants his little brother to come along with him to help him find the big bad treasure. Nate is also very, very conflicted. He does love Elena, but he loves his brother too. And at this point, he almost feels as though he's too deep into this. And if Elena doesn't support him in this pursuit, that she's not supporting the real him. Elena feels justifiably betrayed and as though she's been lied to for weeks, which she has. But at the center of all of this, the core problem is that Nate doesn't actually know what he wants or who he is. Sam and Elena represent the two halves of his being. Sam represents the part of him that is adventure-loving, dangerous, risky, really irresponsible if we're being honest, and who loves adventuring and searching for treasure. Elena represents stability, safeness, life, and love, and happiness, and long-term success. She represents everything Nate wants to be about and to cherish, but that he just can't bring himself to embrace and commit to. And I think this relationship between Nate and Elena and Nate and Sam is actually really interesting, but I think it's brought down by the relationship that's already been established off screen between Nate and Elena. And that is that they're married. We don't get to see the engagement. We don't get to see the marriage. We just jump into this in the fourth game with them having already made that huge step together. This type of dispute seems really weird for them to be having at this point in their lives after having gone through the engagement and the marriage. It seems as though this whole plot point would have been better suited if it took place perhaps during their engagement or if the events of Uncharted 4 happened while they were still separate but dating and active with each other and Elena, for instance, really wanted to get engaged and Nate wanted to get engaged and commit to her, but he was torn between that commitment and the return of his long lost brother, Sam. I think it would have added a lot more stakes to the entire dynamic between them. When a couple is married, there's a huge barrier between where they currently are and the total collapse of the relationship because they have the marriage set up. So to get all the way to the point where they would accept that their relationship doesn't work or that they just can't come to terms with how different the other is, Whereas if they were still dating and Nate hadn't fully committed to her yet, the stakes would be really high. If he screws this up too bad, he might lose her forever. And I understand that you could say the same thing even now with them being married, but I think it's different. But I do admit that this is largely, uh, most likely a result of my upbringing and my opinion and outlook when it comes to marriage and that commitment. All of this to say, Nate done screwed up. His wife is livid with him, rightfully so, and he refused to go to her, comforting her and apologizing, effectively saying that they need a break to figure out what they're actually about. Sam tries to be the supportive big brother who constantly pushes his brother into let's be honest, terrible situations that allow him to vicariously live through his little brother. And Sully has made his disapproval very, very clear. So, determined to continue, Nate turns to Sam and tells him to pack his bags. They're going to head to Libertalia and find the treasure 
shutting this down once and for all. We then cut to Nate and Sam driving the same boat that we saw in the prologue, giving us a nod to what's going to happen in the coming moments. But for now, the skies are clear, mostly, and you're driving towards an island, one that you hope to possess Libertalia. Nate is still clearly dejected after what happened with Elena and Sully, but Sam is trying to keep his spirits up and get him excited for the treasure that he's sure they're about to find. The two share a beer, cheer sick Parvis Magna, and Sam tells Nate that Elena will surely get over it when they bring back all of those treasures and riches. Nate, though, knowing Elena very, very well, isn't so confident that a little bit of treasure is going to tide things over. He's worried that he's done this just one too many times, and this might have been the last nail in the coffin. Over the next 20 to 30 minutes, you're going to be exploring this island, climbing up various towers and trying to locate clues that will point you in the general direction of Avery's treasure, or at the very least, of the city that he founded. I wish I could say that this offers the player the chance to engage with some fantastically creative puzzles that break up the monotony of the game, but no. We actually just turn a dial with a big arrow on it when we're at the top of a tower, and then we can see all of these little circular targets pop up across the island, under the water surrounding the island, leading us on a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail path to where Avery wants us to go. I get it, it's a video game, but this just makes absolutely no sense. Why would Henry Avery go to all this trouble to put up these mechanical circles that pull out of the water or out of the land itself, pointing you in all different directions, eventually leading you to the place he wants you to go instead of just directly pointing to where he wants you to go. You can even see the general area you're supposed to head to from this same vantage point. This is purely to pad gameplay time, and it doesn't even make sense in the world. Regardless, you hop in the boat and you follow these signs around the island, taking in the sights and eventually coming into a cave where you climb up a large pillar in the center and come out on the other side within a large cavernous opening. There's some old architecture and it's clear it's been abandoned for a long time, but you're on the right track. The two start exploring, looking for a way in, since all of the bridges and landings have collapsed many, many years before. Eventually, with Nate hoisting Sam up onto a larger platform so that he can look for an area to climb up first. But when he's crossing the drawn bridge, the rope snaps and Sam barely makes it across the other side. The player and Nate, not being able to see what he's doing, become worried as to what's happened to Sam. We don't hear from him, Nate starts yelling for him, and Nate becomes convinced that his brother's gone missing. It's a really small moment, but it's one that shows just how lonely and insecure Nate feels at this given moment. In effect, Nate gave up Elena for his brother and this treasure, at least that's what he thinks he's done at this point. So to lose his brother now, well, it's just another example of how terrible his luck is. But in a reconnection that will surprise absolutely no one, turns out Nate was just overreacting, and Sam was inside the building looking for something that Nate could climb on. Once they're rejoined, the two continue pressing on, climbing up cliff sides, swinging across large expanses, and eventually coming into some very ancient architecture that looks as though it's been sitting there unused and abandoned for centuries upon centuries. Inside, there's a puzzle that you can complete. It's actually one of the more memorable puzzles in the entire game, at least as far as I'm concerned, where you have to line up these shafts of light onto these orbs that you rotate around the room. It still falls victim to the sickness that infects all of the puzzles in this game, and that is that it's not particularly difficult, it's just tedious. Once you know what you have to do, it's not about figuring it out anymore, it's just about tediously going through, rotating the orbs at just the right position so that they line up correctly when they're placed in their proper positions. And that initial step of figuring out what you need to do is basically spoon-fed to the player, because the characters say as much. Once the puzzle is solved, you go on a platform and it raises up to the top of the island. And in the distance, you can see a statue in the same location that you were before, raising out of the ground, with a telescope in hand looking off into the distance. It's a gigantic statue of Henry Avery, and he's constructed it to hopefully direct you in what we can only pray is the final location of Libertalia. 
The two get back to the boat, head back to the original location they were just in, climb up onto the statue and look through the telescope. In the distance, they can see an island that the telescope has in its sight, with the assumption that that big island is where Libertalia will be. With their newfound destination, the two head back to the boat, and then the cutscene from the beginning of the game plays out, with the boat crashing, being marooned on the island, and Sam and Nate being separated. We see a very injured and cold Nate wash up on the shore of the island, again, alone, completely isolated. Nate is clearly injured because he's walking with a limp, and anytime you try to do anything as you explore this level, you're going to be reminded of it, because his movement is extremely slow and he slips constantly while climbing, which is also a result of the rain. But still, Nate tries to push on, eventually trying to climb straight up what is in effect a waterfall and slipping on the handles as the water cascades down his face and the grip holds. Honestly, I'm surprised these Uncharted games haven't done this more frequently. The Last of Us Part II did it all of the time, with mundane traversal such as this being interrupted with bombastic, sometimes literally, events that shook you to your core, making you feel as though you were never safe. Okay. Let's look for an open building, preferably with no infected, or WLF, wolves, whatever. I just think it's very important that games try to subvert expectations in this way. When you feel secure enough in a basic gameplay mechanism, it tears you out of the immersion, especially when the writers are trying to make you feel isolated or in danger or injured in some significant way. In this case, Nate is extremely hurt. He shouldn't be climbing up cliff faces, and he shouldn't be trying to navigate this island alone, but he's still doing it. However, because we know that if you're climbing up a cliff face and you have the hand grips, you are going to make it. There's no real danger here, so the player feels just as secure swinging and jumping and leaping every which way as they would if he was fully healed and perfectly fine. Adding in these scripted sequences where Nate is scripted into falling is actually a great thing in my view. It makes sure that the player can never take for granted these gameplay mechanisms just because they've engaged with them for hours and hours on end. I can understand that some people would find something like this to be a little subversive or even unfair, and I guess to a certain extent that would be correct. It is unfair because you didn't see it coming and you couldn't have prevented it. However, life's not fair, and trying to climb up a cliff face with a broken hand or some other injury of the sort isn't fair either. You're gonna lose and that should also be reflected in the gameplay. The only other thing I'll say about subverting expectations in this way with scripted events is that sometimes it can be overdone as well. When you're constantly subverting expectations and introducing these scripted sequences to introduce some level of fear in the player or concern that they might not actually be okay, the last thing I'll say about this is that sometimes it can be overdone which is what we start to see in some of the later sections of this chapter of the game. Nate starts having these scripted slips so frequently that it actually causes the player to grow numb to it. They're no longer concerned that he's about to fall to his death because the novelty is worn off. In those Last of Us Part II clips that we just played, there was actual danger involved. If you screwed up, you were dead, and you would have to reload, and the character in turn was dead. In effect, you failed. However, when it's purely a scripted sequence, and all that happens is that the player character slips a few handholds and then still grabs on, it's not actually introducing greater danger or higher stakes to the situation. It's just effectively repositioning the character into a new spot with some flashy animations. This, of course, can be quickly addressed with a couple of quick time events to make sure that the player is paying attention. And if they actually do fail the quick time event to grab onto the handhold, then the player character falls all the way to their death. 
it would be really easy to do this, and Naughty Dog does it occasionally, but not in this chapter. Regardless, Nate pushes on, eventually ending up in the heartland of the island, and it's at this point that we're introduced to the climbing pick, which is the last major gameplay element that will be introduced before the game's credits roll. It's not bad, it's actually really fun being able to leap from great distances and just sliding down with this pick carefully and ever so slightly digging into the wall. It's pretty satisfying, but unfortunately it only has an effect on these special spongy surfaces. It can't actually be used on any rock surface or any wood surface or building that you might come across, which is what I was hoping when I first played this game. I mean, just think of the level of exploration and verticality that would be introduced if you could use this climbing pick on any wooden surface, any side of a building, anything at all. It would be so cool, but unfortunately we don't get it. It's just a tacked on feature and tool that they add to the basic free climbing system that's already here. My assumption would be that they developed this towards the end of development, primarily because they realized that the free climbing was growing a little bit stale and stagnant. Most likely they developed a prototype for this, but didn't implement it into the core game because they felt it didn't add enough. And then towards the end of development realized that they needed a little bit more. So they pulled it back out of the drawer. Granted, I have no evidence at all for this suspicion, but it just makes sense in my view. The system is nowhere near fleshed out enough to feel as though it was something that they fully intended to use in the beginning of the game's development, and it's not implemented in the broader scope of the game, which makes me think it was something that they focused on later on in development. But it's sort of beside the point. Over the next hour or so, there's going to be a lot of arenas. These are just jungle areas that you can stealth or fight your way through, filled with all sorts of Nadine's henchmen. These shoreline guys have already made it to the island, fully populated it, and started exploring. They're not just standing here looking around or searching for Libertalia. These guys are standing in very precarious places with guns drawn, walking back and forth, looking for someone or something. I get it. They were probably told to be on the lookout for baddies trying to swoop in and steal the treasure, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense why they're all so aggressively hyperactive. I mean, at the very least, let them be slacking off, sitting around doing nothing until you make a sound or do something to alert them. It just doesn't make sense why they would be so attentive from the beginning, 100% of the time. Again, this is something that The Last of Us Part II greatly improves upon. The NPC placement feels much more fair in that game. Characters slack off, aren't paying attention in given moments, and only become hyper alert when you do something that ushers that behavior on. And I don't mean to keep pointing to The Last of Us Part II as some sort of great trump card. See, well, you should just stop playing Uncharted. You should go play those games. That's not what I'm saying. I'm Merely pointing out that these are issues that even Naughty Dog identified and corrected in their subsequent releases. But back to the game. Nate fights his way through waves and waves of these enemies, through countless jungle arenas trying to find Sam. He's previously spotted him in the distance thanks to a reflecting mirror, so he knows he's alive and well, he just has to get to him. They share some dialogue and Nate seems to have come to his senses. He recognizes that they're going up against an army, especially after the last few fighting arenas which were extremely stacked against you. The enemies had sniper rifles, machine guns, RPGs, countless grenades, and seemingly endless reinforcements. There's nothing that they can't throw at these brothers. They are literally two guys against an army. Nate's dejected and wants to give up, go back home, and try to salvage what's left of his relationship with Elena. But Sam insists that they're so close they can't give up yet. And in what is probably the most staged event in any of the Uncharted games, in the middle of this argument where Nate wants to give up and move on, he looks over Sam's shoulder and sees something behind him. He moves the vines aside, and behold, it is the sigil of Henry Avery. 
Yeah, in the middle of this argument, in the middle of a gigantic overgrown jungle, they just happen to find one of the key markers of Libertalia, which reignites the flame in Nate and makes him realize they're so close they can't possibly give up. Having completely forgotten about his concerns, Nate pushes on with Sam, and they start to explore the ruins of what seems to be a 16th or 17th century city. Most of the buildings have collapsed, but it's clear this is a city, or at the very least remnants of it. Eventually the two find this crate, they climb up it and out the window that's above it. Looking forward, they see it. Libertalia. And I gotta say, this is a fantastically well-realized city. It is very well constructed, feels like an actual place that you could live and explore. It's very, very well done. I will say it because I'm a nitpicky jerk, this falls prey to the same exact ill that every other Uncharted game to this point has had when it comes to the magical land or city or treasure that you're hunting. It's in some isolated, far off land, but once you get there, it's open to the elements for anybody to see with a plane or a helicopter. Short of arguing that straight up magic is what's been hiding it all this time, there's very little excuse why this wouldn't have been found, especially because the buildings that are still standing are so massive and intact. I get it, some people might say that the leaf overgrowth would make it look like it's just a forest from the air, or something of the sort, but I just don't buy it when it comes to Libertalia. Literally anyone with Google Earth or a pair of binoculars on a commercial airliner flying in this general area would be able to see this. Like, for real. Look at that. It does, however, explain why Shoreline has been able to arrive so much quicker and completely populate the island and every square inch of it since their arrival. They figured Libertalia must be somewhere in these islands. They probably took a plane overhead, saw this massive city, and landed all of their men in here with helicopters and ships brought straight to shore. Makes sense. Definitely a better way of doing it. Nate and Sam have to fight their way through the city, however, because they can never take just two minutes to enjoy themselves. Props to the level designers, though, this is actually one of the more interesting arena set pieces that they have in the entirety of Uncharted 4. It's large, there's tons of cover, different angles for enemies to shoot you from and for you to shoot them from, lots of tall grass for you to hide behind, and even a lot of these large open areas that you can swing across to get to new vantage points. And they managed to pull all of this out in terms of gameplay while also having constructed a city that feels believable and as though it's actually collapsing around you. It's really, really well done. Eventually you get past all of the mercenaries and walk up to what looks to be some sort of court or magistrate building. Outside there are countless corpses with big barricades made out of furniture and bodies strewn throughout. It looks like the colonists were trying to raid the treasury and that they met head to head with the soldiers that Avery had hired to protect it. We don't know details, but it seems as though this pirate paradise wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And it looks as though there could have been a very good reason why all of these people tried to get their money back. And when you push into the treasury, your worst fears are confirmed. It looks as though the treasury was emptied many, many centuries ago, likely by the very pirates that established this city, which is why the colonists tried to raid it. They found out their money had been taken and outraged tried to get it back themselves, only to be killed in the line of fire while trying to break into the treasury building itself. But not giving up hope just yet, Nate and Sam look around to try and gather clues. And there's a bunch of stuff, such as on the walls, all of the paintings of the pirate captains that you followed to get here are written words like thief, which one can only assume was done by the angered colonists. Put two and two together, 
it seems very reasonable to suspect that these are the very same captains who likely stole the treasure for themselves out from under the noses of the colonists. So you decide you need to push up to the neighborhood where these pirate captains lived themselves, because if they stole the treasure, they're either going to have kept the treasure with them, or there will be clues to its whereabouts nearby. So to get a vantage point, you climb to the very tippy top tower of this building, and you get what is... I think the best view in the entire game. In the distance from the crow's nest, you can see just on the other side of the river, the neighborhood where all of the rich and powerful pirate captains lived. With your newfound destination, the two begin climbing their way back down the tower. And because this is an uncharted game, they're attacked. This is actually a really cool sequence and one of the most impressive action sequences in the entire game. You race down the tower, but as you do so, you're attacked with RPGs, incessant gunfire, grenades, everything that they could throw at you, which slowly starts to tear the building down eventually actually succeeding. The whole thing slips and falls under its own weight. Seriously, this makes that whole building collapse sequence in Uncharted 2 look like it was developed by toddlers. Like, so much more impressive. Granted, it's on much newer hardware and they could get away with a lot more here, but it's just so impressive. You gotta give them credit. You fight through waves and waves and waves of enemies as towers and buildings collapse around you. It's done so well and it doesn't stop for like 15 minutes straight. It's just pure escapism entertainment at its finest. I love it. But all things must come to an end. So Nadine shows up. She proceeds to kick the ever-living crap out of Nate and Sam together for a solid five minutes. And I have lots of thoughts on Nadine, her character, her role in the franchise, especially in The Lost Legacy, where they tried to set her up as a coming companion or protagonist herself in the franchise. I have lots of thoughts. I'm not going to get into it too much in this video. I've already touched on it a bit. So for now, I'll just say this doesn't make any sense. She was able to hold off Nate. Okay, maybe she's some sort of super powered fighter. But the fact that she could hold off Nate and Sam in a life or death situation and fight just doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. These guys are two serial killers who are very experienced in hand to hand combat. I, I just don't buy it. Regardless, the trio falls to a platform below and Rafe shows up himself. Guns drawn, he approaches and Sam takes Nadine hostage, holding a gun to her head. He tells Rafe that he'll kill Nadine if he insists on approaching further, but Rafe calls his bluff and says that it's just not his style. Proven right, Nadine is released. And Nadine, obviously livid that this man just played with her life like it was nothing more than a small bed in Vegas, she's ticked off, for lack of a better word. <laughs> And it's here that we get the big reveal that I've been alluding to for the entire video at this point. The big reveal. You see, Sam hasn't been completely honest with you. It looks like he also hasn't told Rafe exactly what he's told you, because Rafe seems just as concerned and freaked out at the revelation that Hector Alcazar is the reason that Sam and Nate are trying to find the treasure. Quickly putting two and two together, he reveals to Nate what actually happened. You see, Rafe is the one that broke Sam out of prison because he needed help finding the treasure. So he went to the guy that he figured knew it best. He discovered somehow that he was still alive and wasn't actually killed in the prison escape and uses his connections to get him out. This was apparently two years before this and they've been out searching for the second St. Dismas cross ever since. Only in the last few months did they decide that they needed Nate to get involved as well. Or rather, Sam decided that he needed his brother's help to get the treasure. So Sam showed up saying that he had this deal with some sort of drug lord that got him out of prison in exchange for the treasure, otherwise he'd be killed. And this actually explains a lot. It explains why I think the player should be feeling a little suspicious of Sam, especially early on. He comes out of nowhere for no reason whatsoever, and his breakout story doesn't make a lot of sense, 
but this also introduces a lot of other issues as well, such as the complete lack of double checking that occurred on the part of Sully and Delena. I get it, Nate loves his brother, and if his brother showed up saying simply, I got out of prison and I need your help because some guy's after me, he might just take him at his word. But Sully especially doesn't like Sam to begin with. We know this from very, very early on, based on the dialogue between Sam and Nate discussing Sully when they're breaking into the gigantic black market auction. All it would take would be a quick Google search of the name Hector Alcazar to realize that he was killed in a shootout. Any large drug dealer or criminal who's killed in a large shootout would probably make basic news or even a mention in the funnies. The idea that Sully, Elena, and Nate himself never thought to even Google the name Hector Alcazar is just a bit of a far stretch for me. Maybe I'm too much of a zoomer, but I know when somebody tells me the name of somebody I haven't encountered before, who's some sort of public figure or criminal or mastermind of some sort or another, if I want to learn more about them, I'll just Google their name. So for Nate, who doesn't know about Hector Alcazar or no details about him, it makes sense that he might Google his name to see a picture, to know who to be on the lookout for in case he shows up somewhere where they're searching for the treasure. But no, he apparently never does this. He just takes it on blind faith that his brother's being completely honest. And he coincidentally doesn't search for any information on Alcazar the entire time they're searching for this treasure. And what makes it even more frustrating for me is that I think the writers were even aware of these conflicting motivations when they wrote the original dialogue at the Rossi estate. Because if you remember when we went through that earlier, Sam looks extremely worried the first time he sees Sully. And I think he's extremely worried because he's really concerned as to whether or not he's looked up his alibi and story, or whether or not he was in Panama at the time of Nate's break out, or even whether or not the prison itself had a massive breakout that included Hector Alcazar. And it explains why the second Sully greets him warmly, clearly indicating he has no dirt on him at all, and that he's just glad to see him, Sam looks extremely relieved. I don't blame him. I'd be relieved too. Obviously, this revelation brings up a lot of questions about the true motivations behind Sam's actions and Nate's as well. He thought he was helping his brother, and he was also searching for the treasure, which was a good perk as well. But now, he realizes he's not actually helping his brother, and that his brother is likely just using him to get to the treasure to enrich himself and his newfound business partner, Rafe. But before he has time to fully process it, Sam seems to have a change of heart. He doesn't want to do this anymore, he wants to get everything out on the table, but Nadine, still pissed off that she was almost killed for a gag, insists that this has to come to an end. And when Rafe raises his gun to shoot Nate once and for all, to use Sam to just find the treasure himself, Sam jumps in front and takes the bullet in the shoulder for Nate. But in the process, Nate's pushed off the cliff, falling presumably to his death. But no, he just flips around, is unconscious at the bottom, and somehow Elena shows up to find him and nurse him back to health. Don't ask me why or how this works, but it happened. We then get to continue the flashback from earlier in the game, after Nate is broken out of the orphanage by Sam to go and head to this mansion that possesses some of the items belonging to Nate and Sam's late mother. The house is beautiful, and the crew starts exploring it. It seems like it hasn't been lived in for quite some time. Everything is dusty and piled up along the walls and in front of doors, so it's safe to assume that you're alone. There's tons of historical artifacts you can find, helmets to wear, things to interact with, and it's just a fantastically realized house. I mean, I gotta give it to Naughty Dog. Their environment artists in these games have just outdone themselves time and time again, and this is another example of just fantastic work. You can really take your time as you explore the house and take it all in slowly, but what's clearly established is that these two are not here to steal things or to just rummage around and cause chaos. They're here looking for their mother's 
journals, and items. They don't want to steal anything that they don't consider to be their rightful property as the children of the deceased. Eventually you find an air vent, you climb into a locked office room with an adjacent bedroom that has a hospital bed and tons of pills surrounding it. It's clear whoever lives in this house is very, very ill or perhaps was. There's a huge pile of mail by the front door, so it's safe to assume if they were ill, they might not be ill anymore, if you catch my drift. Inside the office, there's a white box underneath a desk, and inside is the journal that belonged to Nate and Sam's mother. They start looking through it, but soon after, a woman holding a revolver tells them to stop. Very little is revealed to us about this old woman, but what is told to us is that she's extremely sick and also that she knew your mother. She's a collector of sorts, as she puts it, and she considered Nate and Sam's mother to be one of the most brilliant historians she had ever encountered. When she realizes who you two are, she puts the gun down and apologizes. However, she's already called the police because, of course, her house was being broken into. There's a little bit of dialogue that they share, and she says that you can keep the journals. But she tells you to get out the way you came in because the police are here, and she'll handle them. But, of course, it probably would be best if these two young rapscallions weren't wandering around the house while she's claiming that she simply misheard some strange noises in the large house. And I can't believe I'm about to say this because it's probably the stupidest plot point in any of the Uncharted games, period. And I know I've probably said that about other plot lines too, especially in Uncharted 3, which had a lot of them, but I'm going to stick to it for now. The woman drops dead. <laughs> yeah, she just has like a massive heart attack while standing up here. She's dead and yeah. So now, looking like a couple of murderers, the two climb out the window of the house and up onto the roof, trying to make their escape. And what follows is probably the most stilted and awkward escape sequence in any Naughty Dog game that I can think of. Seriously, the cops are parked just below. It's pretty well lit. Their sirens are blaring and so are the lights. And somehow they don't see these two climbing on the building out an open window and onto the roof. It, it's really weird to me. And then in the following sections, as more police arrive, you actually will drop down into the garden area and you're chased one-on-one -on -one by these officers who have guns and tasers and flashlights and still somehow stop right before you get to them and allow you to escape. It's the most stilted and awkwardly put together escape sequence in any of these games, I'll stand by it. I just think it's it's really poorly done. I can't stand it. And of course, the fact that it's set in motion by one of the most contrived plot points in any of these games with this woman randomly dropping dead, it's just one of the worst moments in any of these games. It's really unfortunate. And it's not like this doesn't have large implications. Because this woman was found dead in her house and you two are the suspected burglars that caused her death, you have to go on the run now. This is how Nate and Sam got their start. How Nathan Drake became Nathan Drake, because they literally chose to change their names after this happened. This woman's death randomly at this awkward moment is what set into motion everything we know as Uncharted. Listen, I'm not asking for much. I'm just asking if you're going to give us the backstory of a character, the foundations of who they are, don't make it so freaking stupid, <laughs> please. Regardless, Sam and Nate decide they need to change their names and that they are going to choose the name Drake in honor of the great explorer. We flash back forward to the present day where we can see Elena patching up Nate. He's been telling her this story, giving her the complete truth and background of his life with his brother, Sam, and how they got started on all of this. Over the next few moments, there's some light dialogue exchanged where Elena still isn't sure if she can trust Nate, but she loves him and she's just glad that he's okay. 
they have some stuff to work through, but for now they just need to figure out where Sam is and get him out of there. It looks like Elena was brought here by Sully on a plane. Somehow they figured out exactly where the island was that Libertalia was located. Again, probably because they had a freaking plane and they could just see it. And they decided to drop off Elena to go looking for Nate in the massive island, likely following the large explosions that were being set off while you fought all of the shoreline people, and she just happened to stumble on Nate's body in the river below. And so, while things are still tense and awkward, you know what you have to do. Find Sam, get back to Sully, and get out of Libertalia. Rafe and his freaking army can have the treasure just so long as everybody gets out alive. So we continue to press on through the following levels with Elena as our sidekick, sharing some awkward dialogue and banter as they try to work through all of the countless lies that Nate has levied her way. It may not be the most exciting chapter of the game, but I think it might be one of the best. The next half hour or so isn't about the gameplay per se. It's more more about Nate and Elena catching up while doing some light puzzles and navigating to get closer and closer to Sam. But fundamentally, this isn't a section that's meant to push the player with challenging gameplay systems or combat arenas. There will be a couple of those towards the end of this chapter, but for now, it's more about giving the player a break and Nate the chance to catch up with Elena. The two help each other get a couple of old elevators from Avery's time working again, and they eventually get their hands on a jeep that they can use to navigate greater distances more easily. Then you combine the two and you get the jeep onto the elevator and lift it up top so you can drive straight up to the front door of the Henry Avery compound where all of the rich people hung out together. Right before you take off, Elena pauses and talks to Nate, making sure that he understands just because he thought he was protecting her doesn't mean that what he did was right. They're supposed to be a team, a partnership husband and wife, and they should be able to tell each other even the most difficult things because that's what this is all about after all. Nate acknowledges this and then the two hop in the car and you drive slowly up this long winding road with light music playing and nothing more. It's just a calming drive through this meadow that's meant to give the player a chance to think about what's going on and also give Nate and Elena a small break from being the center of attention but all good things must come to an end. You find a bridge leading into the neighborhood, but the second that the Jeep sets on it, it starts to collapse and eventually fully disintegrates underneath the weight of the car, dropping you into the waterfall beneath. You clunkily bounce along some rocks as you drift closer and closer to the falls, and at the last minute are able to winch your way up onto a tree and narrowly escape death. Even though they just survived a near-death experience and Elena helped pull Nate off of the cliff, Nate has something else on his mind. And I'll just let this section play out because I think it'll do it better justice than I could just reciting it. Huh? So much for the car. <laughs> Come on. I wasn't trying to protect you. It's just, I, I made a promise that I was done with this life. We both did. Yeah, but I broke it. I didn't tell you because I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of losing you. I guess I was uh, protecting myself. You know? We have a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. We should keep moving. Having come to this newfound resolution, Nate and Delena are in a good place. So you push on up to the Avery households, but for now it's going to be a lot of navigating through some rough jungle and across some waterfalls and jungly areas. Yes, I just used the word jungly. Don't at me. 
As you get closer and closer to the rich people's neighborhood, eventually you come across a large pile of bodies, and then you reach the outside gates, which is surrounded by gallows and different areas where they've displayed the bodies of colonists who tried to raid the neighborhood. It's clear whatever rebellion went on, the pirate captains didn't respond well to it and wanted to quash it and make an example of all of those who rebelled. And this is made all the clearer by the signs that are placed beneath the bodies. Most of them reading Digna Factis Recipimus, which in Latin translates to, quote, we receive the due rewards of our deeds. It's basically the fancy way of saying, ex go and give it to you. And if you asked for this, you shouldn't be surprised that you got the punishment you did. Undeterred, Nate and Elena eventually find a way to climb up these gallows and cages into the city, which has been aptly named New Devon. Most of the city has, at this point, flooded and collapsed. There's the remnants of huge and luxurious mansions, but most of it's underwater at this point. In the distance, you can see the mansion, which you can only assume belonged to Henry Avery himself, since it's the largest and most ornate. And looking through some binoculars, you can see Sam, Rafe, and Nadine ushering themselves into the palace. So you know where you're headed, and you'll begin exploring the remnants of the city as you work your way up. You do encounter some guards here and you can engage in combat, but I think it's more likely that the level designers were intending you to approach these situations much more stealthily, especially considering you have Elena now. Thankfully, they leave it up to the player, so you can engage violently if you want to, but I insist, I think that the stealth way not only makes more sense narratively speaking, but it also feels much better in terms of the levels that they've designed here. It's not to say that it's going to be easy to go through these areas stealthily, but it does feel like that's what you're supposed to do. As you explore the city, you'll go through multiple mansions from other pirates as well, and there's all sorts of cool lore items that you can discover in each of these mansions. In addition, letters written between the pirate captains that talk about the political intrigue and the things that were going on behind the scenes, the tensions that you wouldn't have heard of in the old stories. Everybody just assumes that pirates will be pirates, but they don't tend to think about the pirates' feelings or emotions. I love stuff like this. It's taking a character that seems very monochromatic and one-dimensional, like a pirate captain, and humanizes them. It makes it much more real. And once again, it just reaffirms for me how badly I want Naughty Dog to tackle a pirate game in this way. Over on my Luke Stevens Clips channel, where I publish highlights of my live streams so that you can watch them even if you didn't make it live, I do have a small video snippet from one of our streams where I talked about my dream game that I want Naughty Dog to make one day, about Anne Bonnie and the Golden Age of Pirates. If you want to hear all of my thoughts on that and see that video, I'll have it linked below. Also, make sure to subscribe to that Clips channel so you see all these highlights even if you don't make it out to Twitch. Eventually, you stumble onto a dining room, and inside are a bunch of bodies sitting at the table, still wearing their outfits and their wigs, and each of their places are marked with sigils, the sigils of the pirate lords. These are those who founded Libertalia. They were poisoned here, right where they sit, and they haven't moved in hundreds of years. But there's two pirates missing, Thomas II and Henry Avery. It looks as though those two men betrayed all of the other pirate lords to take their treasure for themselves. It's the quintessential example of extreme greed. The pirate lords stole all of the money from all of the colonists, and then when the revolt was squashed out and everybody was made an example of, the pirate lords had to deal with each other. But the pirate lords couldn't trust each other because they were, well, pirates. So, they started fighting amongst themselves, and to try and subdue everybody, Thomas II and Henry Avery invited everyone to Henry Avery's dining room to settle things once and for all. But shortly after arriving and sitting down for dinner, they were poisoned, and Thomas II and Henry Avery, it appears, were left with all of the treasure for themselves and only each other to deal with. But once again, it doesn't take a genius to assume that it probably wasn't that long before Thomas II and Henry Avery started looking at each other questionably. 
But the importance of this scene isn't actually just Nathan going on and expositing about everything that went on here. It's actually about Elena's face as she watches him do so. While he's going on and on about everything that happened here, she can see his passion. She understands that this is what keeps him going. This is what drives him. And in his heart, deep, deep down, he's a treasure hunter. This is what he does. This is what he loves. And this is who he is. He can love her and want to do what's best for her, but for her to ask him to abandon this part of himself would be to ask him to change fundamentally who he is. And I believe it's in this moment that she realizes she doesn't actually want that for herself or for Nathan Drake himself. Adventure has always been a part of his life and it's been a part of hers as long as she's known him since the very first game. There's nothing they can do to change that. And I think she's finally accepting it and she can start working with him to get him to accept it himself and perhaps do it in a more responsible way that doesn't ask him to commit so many atrocities or to do it in such a careless, dangerous way. Invigorated with their latest discoveries of what happened here, Nate and Elena push into Henry's mansion, and inside you see a ton of Shoreline guys, and of course, have to deal with many of them in a large shooting arena that takes place at the grand staircase in the foyer of the building. The level designers decided to throw several large, heavily armored machine gunners at you in addition to lots of snipers. I don't know, I just don't find the machine gunners very fun. I get it, it's supposed to be that you like target weak points, it shoots off the armor and then you can go and deal damage at their weakened spots. But the gunplay in Uncharted 4 is nowhere near robust enough for this to feel fair and engaging, and instead they usually just feel like large bullet sponges and nothing more. So I, I know I'm perhaps in the minority with this, but I really dislike whenever they try to make a level really difficult and just throw two, three, four of these guys at you. It just feels like they're trying to pad out the level. After everybody's been cleared, you head into Henry Avery's office, where you can see that Sam and the Shoreline people, most likely Rafe and Nadine, were just recently here. You can tell this because Sam left behind a couple of clues, such as his lighter, which he dropped on the floor, to tell Nate when he showed up eventually that they were here and that this is the right place to look for some sort of secret entrance. So you start screwing around with everything from the globe to the armor on the wall to pictures that are hung. Elaine eventually touches the globe, specifically where Libertalia is supposed to be, and a large spiral staircase opens under your feet. So you descend it. It's now that you'll begin descending down this large cavern and you'll get to navigate some interesting puzzles as well. There's this one with a bunch of platforms that are laid out with some muddy footprints on them to tell you where you need to go. This is where Sam and the Shoreline people crossed having all of the clues that they needed to solve the correct layout and way to approach it so you can bypass solving the puzzle yourself and just follow their muddy footprints. However, one of the paths is collapsed, so you do have to do a little bit yourself, specifically climbing up this pillar and climbing through some smaller caverns which probably weren't supposed to be here and are just the result of age and slowly collapsing ruins. I guess this section shakes up the monotony of all of the jungle areas we've been exploring for the last like four hours of gameplay, but it's just not interesting to me. So many games have caves and bodies and rib cages that it just doesn't feel interesting or unique to me anymore. Furthermore, there's a ton of these bodies which are rigged with explosives. If you get close to them, they set off large explosions, injuring the player or potentially killing them if you're too close. It seems like this was once again a result of the infighting between Avery and Thomas too. Avery strung up a bunch of Thomas's men and Thomas strung up a bunch of Avery's men and as a result, they were forced into these mummifications and turned into booby traps themselves. Is it a bit of a stretch narratively? I would probably say so, but I get it. It looks cool and, you know, pirates will be pirates, so I guess we can just forgive it and move on. You eventually discover a flare on the ground indicating that you're in the right place and you're following the track once again. 
So you keep pushing on, eventually running into more shoreline people, fighting through some more shooting arenas, and at this point you're probably feeling pretty fatigued. This last act of the game carries on very long, and there's not a whole lot that happens when you look at it on paper. Compared to the sections earlier in the game when there were constant narrative updates and beat shifts, this section has carried on an uncomfortably long amount of time. And it's not quite over yet. You keep pushing through, solve a quick puzzle, the same one with the floor, but this time you have the clue, so you have to go and figure out which way to go. And just as you think you're safe, you find a large door. You put the key you have in to the keyhole, turn it, and even though Elena warns you it's a trap, a trap goes off. Now Nate and Elena are captured, and you quickly realize you're running out of time, because one of those mummies lights up in the distance. It starts to explode, and then every other mummy in the room begins to ignite and detonate. So you start swinging. You grab a sword from another body that's hanging nearby, cut yourself down, and start running through the tunnel to try and escape. It's very Indiana Jones, and just when you think you're safe, this happens. When I first played this, I was like, no way, she's dead. <laughs> it's just like old times, huh? Lena? Lena? Hey. Hey. Lena, come on. Lena. Lena. My hero. Oh, no, you didn't do that. <laughs> I know, right? Dick move. Elena pretending to be dead. I, I just, like... I get it, it's kind of funny, and I guess it makes sense that they play with our emotions like this, but it it just, I didn't like this. <laughs> I've been very transparent since we started doing these Uncharted videos. I really like Elena. The one character I don't want them to kill off in these games is Elena. And when this happened to me the first time, I just about freaked out. So I'm very glad she's alive, and I don't like them toying with my heart. Having escaped the caverns, you can see a large shipyard below. And this is probably my favorite section in this act of the game. It's just really interesting visually, at least as far as I'm concerned. It's still a shooting arena. There's a lot of verticality. There's free climbing mixed with your grapple hook. It's fine, more of the same, but the only thing I think it has going for it is just how visually unique it is thanks to its setting. But even that is pretty short-lived because you're gonna be moving out of the shipyard pretty quickly. With Elena's help, you fight your way through waves and waves and waves of heavily armored enemies, and this is probably the clearest indication you're nearing the end of the game. Whenever Naughty Dog in these Uncharted games feels like they're running out of ideas or they don't have anything else to throw at the player before the game is over, they just start slapping tons of enemies at you at once and calling it a day, and that's certainly what happens here. You reunite with Sam, who has managed to break away from Rafe and Nadine somehow, and you fight through yet more enemies. Waves and waves and waves and waves. And just when you thought you would have had enough, there's an armored truck that shows up. Just like in Madagascar, it starts driving through buildings, chasing you through the streets, and using its fully armored turret to attack you incessantly. There's nothing you can do here, you just have to run away in the correct direction and quickly enough on your first try. Otherwise, you die, reload, and you get to try again. And this is my least favorite section of this act. It's just tedious trial and error. If you take a left instead of a right, then you're just screwed and you have to reload, even though there was no way or clear indication of where you were supposed to go. It's just kind of lame. Eventually you reach a dead end, find a couple of RPGs, and launch them at the vehicle, blowing it up, at which point you see that Sully is actually right here. So you climb up to him and then the whole squad is reunited. Nate, Elena, and Sully are very resolved in just leaving the island, leaving the treasure, and moving on. It's not worth risking their lives once more going up against this army. But Sam, this is all he's known his entire life. 
For the last 20 years, this is all he's been thinking and dreaming about, and now he's closer than he ever has been. He's not going to just go home. And Nate can understand this. After all, this is part of Nate's personality as well. But it doesn't change that it's very stupid. So Sam runs off, saying he is sorry, but there's nothing he can do. This is who he is. But Nate insists that they just shouldn't do this. They can't do this. It's not worth it. After all this time, he's finally gotten out of prison. He has his freedom. He can move on and it will be okay. Sam begrudgingly initially agrees, but after a quick moment or two while trying to get a large ramp unlodged so you can get down to the plane below, Sam and the rest of the group are separated. And when this happens, Sam simply says he's sorry he got everybody into this, but that he has to see it through. So he runs off into the forest and Nate is left with, in his mind, no choice but to hunt him down and save him. Elena gives Nate her blessing, understanding this is also who he is after the conversations that they had in the preceding sections, and Nate runs off to begin chapter 21, A Brother's Keeper, to save his brother and hopefully get the treasure. There's a bunch of quiet navigation, swinging across cliffs and using your grapple hook to navigate across large caverns, and it's actually quite peaceful. I really like this section, and it's beautiful to boot. After about 10 minutes of climbing and swinging, you find your way inside a cavernous area within the mountain. There's a bunch of water and, naturally, caves. It looks as though this is some sort of interior harbor where Henry Avery and Thomas II were able to store their ships and treasure before taking them out onto the open ocean. In other words, their ships would be protected in here and the colonists wouldn't have ready access to them. In the distance, you can see Henry Avery's ship. Looks like you found where the treasure is, but Nate is not the first one to get here. Rafe and Nadine are already here and loading up their boats with gold. Nadine is there and is speaking with Rafe and insists that most of her men are dead at this point and the ones who aren't dead have actually left the island or begun to escape. Makes sense, they're dealing with a couple of homicidal maniacs outside. I don't blame him. Furthermore, Nadine says, very importantly, I might add, that Henry Avery rigged the ship and the entire cavern to explode with tons of explosive booby traps if anybody were to get close to the ship. So she says she's taking what she can get and leaving, just abandoning it. And Rafe insists that if they do this, they will have effectively wasted all this time, money, and the lives of all of her men, which is kind of true. But I also don't understand why Rafe couldn't just leave for a little while, come back with a bunch of explosive specialists who can disarm all of the booby traps, and extract the gold safely. I don't know why he has to do it right here, right now. Like, why can't he just pose up a couple of his men to watch for Nathan and Sam and then come back in a week or so with the correct teams? And this is going to come up a little bit later in the game where I think it doesn't make sense how they handle this, but we'll leave it there for now. Nate breaks away and starts swimming towards the ship, but as he approaches, he sees a massive explosion go off in the bow of the ship. From this, he infers that it must have been Sam that broke onto the ship, got a little too close to something, and set off the explosive booby trap. So he races in. But once you enter the explosion hole that's left behind, it's one of Shoreline's men who set it off. It wasn't Sam. So you make your way into the hole to look for your brother. It's filled to the brim with gold and treasures galore. This is where all of the treasure from all the pirate lords was collected and deposited. I will say it's pretty impressive, and... There's certainly enough treasure here for many pirate lords to be arguing and fighting over it. It makes sense. Eventually, you find your way down into the cargo hold itself. And once you go in, you see Rafe with a gun drawn and Sam collapsed on the floor underneath a big wooden beam that's collapsed on top of him. Nate insists he just wants his brother. He doesn't care about the treasure and Rafe can have it all. But instead of letting them go, Rafe insists on finishing this once and for all, whatever that means. Nadine also shows up seemingly to help Rafe, but she double crosses him as well, pointing to the characters on the floor. It's there we can see Henry Avery and Thomas II collapsed, still in their garb, 
with swords through each of their chests. They killed each other. She points out that everybody who's obsessed with this treasure gets what they deserve, and she doesn't want to be one of those people. So she's leaving. She closes the door behind her and leaves Sam, Nate, and Rafe in the treasure hold to die. She says she doesn't care if they die, but, I mean, she closed this door, and Rafe pounds on it but can't get it open, so I think it's pretty safe to say she was trying to kill all of them. Again, I, I just don't get why she's supposed to be a likable character. Like, imagine if Nathan Drake did this to somebody in a cutscene, so it's narratively canonical to the series. And then we're supposed to be like, yeah, he's, he's a totally good guy. I, I don't know. I just, I can't stand Nadine. I'm sorry. But now, sufficiently agitated, Rafe starts to lose it. He grabs a sword and begins to attack Nate ferociously. This starts a small mini game of sorts that's going to act as the finale of the game where you have to dodge left or right based on the attack that Rafe swings at you. It's really clunky and the fact that we haven't had to do this before in the game makes it feel even more out of place. Uh, trust me, I much prefer this to another shooting arena, but if they had some sort of mini boss or something earlier in the game that implemented this same gameplay system, I think it wouldn't have felt like such a weird out of place moment. Even so, the two fight it out with the swords for the next couple of minutes, trading damage and almost killing each other multiple times. But after a few moments, it seems as though Rafe finally got the better of Nathan. He's on the floor, staring down the sword of Rafe. However, Rafe is standing underneath a gigantic bag of gold treasures that's hanging from above that's tied with a rope down right next to Nate. So he swipes it, cutting the bag, and it falls square on Rafe. I don't think we have to question whether or not he's okay. He's, uh, <laughs> he, he's, he's gone. Running out of time, Nate jumps up to try and help get the beam off of his brother, Sam. Sam insists that he should just leave and save himself, but Nate isn't going to let him do that. So he looks around and he sees a cannon. He shoots it off into the side of the hull itself, flooding the compartment, which seems like a really stupid move because it's going to start drowning his brother. But he did it so that the water would help lift the log since, you know, wood floats usually. And sure enough, he gets his brother out from underneath the beam and they're able to escape through that same hole in the hole. You then come out the other end and you see a light at the end of the tunnel, literally. As the ship slowly burns and capsizes, you swim ever so fast towards the light as everything collapses around you. The duo just barely escapes as the entire cave seems to collapse in on itself, and Elena and Sully are out there waiting for them when they arrive. The crew gets on Sully's plane, takes off, and leaves. I will say, it's always struck me as odd that at the end of these games, they act as though the treasure's just been lost and there's nothing they can do. I get it if an entire city collapses into a freaking desert. It makes sense that you wouldn't be able to easily recover this, but you know exactly where Henry Avery's treasure is. All of the booby traps that were supposed to go off just did, and now all you have to do is get back into that cavern with a couple of scuba divers and you will be collecting the treasure that's worth billions of dollars. There's really no reason I can come up with that this crew would just abandon or forget the idea of this treasure. It doesn't make any damn sense to me. Even if the cavern itself collapsed, the cavern collapsed on billions of dollars worth of treasure. If ever there was a reason to try and evacuate a collapsed cave, that would do it. But I get it. We need resolution and everybody needs to move on, living happily ever after. So Nate, Elena, Sam, and Sully share their goodbyes. Sam says he's going to work with Sully on trying to chase down some more treasures. Nate and Elena seem to have completely recouped their relationship and decide that they need to settle down once and for all. We flash back to the Merino where Nate's place of employment is located. Jameson walks in very chipper and happy, saying that he's just achieved his retirement and that he's selling the place. 
Nate's obviously confused, you think he would have heard something about this, but he seems genuinely happy for Jameson. He asks him who's buying it, and Jameson says, well, you are, and he tosses him the keys. Baffled, Nate jumps up and runs outside, only to see Elena standing there. She's coordinated this whole thing. So it turns out that they got the permits in that morning for that Malaysia job that was supposed to be so lucrative, but that was illegal, which is the only reason that Nate didn't want to do it. However, with these permits, they could stand to make millions upon millions of dollars, being the only ones permitted to go out to that site. So Elena made some calls, got the permits pushed through, and went and contacted Jameson to purchase the business. When Nate asks how she could possibly afford to buy this business, she says that she found some coins in her jacket pocket. The same jacket that Sam had snuck a bunch of coins in before they left. Looks like he filled up a bunch of pockets with gold coins before they got off of the ship, and so she can sell those and use them to pay for the business. Nate fairly asks, after all of this, what happened to living a normal, quiet life? Why is Elena suddenly okay with doing this? And she says it's just who they are. It's what they're supposed to be doing. And when they were out on the island and she rescued Nate from near death, she realized that she also missed the adventure that he had missed for so long. This is who they are. It's what they should be doing. She also points out that she can grab her cameras out again and perhaps reboot the TV series that she was trying to film in the very first game, which is kind of a cool tie back. And sure enough, that's exactly what they do. The camera fades to black and we come back in on a television set. We get the chance to play Crash Bandicoot one more time. But when you finish it, the camera pans back around and it's not Nate or Elena. It's a young girl sitting on her bed with a dog. You explore the house a little bit, finding some notes and tidbits scattered throughout. Even this letter with a picture pinned on the back of it showing Sam and Sully. Though I will point out, Sam and Sully are notably older in this picture, something that made me a little melancholy. Like, I get it, they're aging and this is a flash forward, but it's still kind of sad to me to see Sully so old. Oh, I'm going to tear up, I'm moving on. There's also some fun little tidbits in this note, such as this little bit, which says that they've lost the bet to both Sam and Sully, 12 whole months and counting with no smoking whatsoever. And they're in Cuba, for God's sake. It's, it's cool to see that they're doing well, they kicked smoking, and it, I just liked this. I thought this was great. You eventually wander outside the house and realize you're on a beachfront property in what you can only assume is Costa Rica or some other tropical Caribbean paradise. When you run over to the guest house over in the distance, you see a bunch of articles, news clippings, and magazine posters hung on the walls, mentioning all sorts of adventures and treasures that have been discovered that thanks to the pursuits of Nate and Delena. You can also find another magazine, specifically Adventure Life, which shows a picture of the very girl you're playing as, and it's titled Treasure Hunting, It Runs in the Family, suggesting that she is part of this family. And if you're not getting it by now, this is Nate and Delena's daughter. She's the newest generation of treasure hunter, and these are all of their collections and awards. You can find a wardrobe, open it up, and inside there's a bunch of artifacts from all of the Uncharted games, including the Cross of St. Dismas, a creepy skull, which might look familiar to those of you who have been watching these videos, and you can even find Nate's notebook filled with all of the detailed recordings of his adventures. And you can also find this picture, which is one of the original marketing material proof of concept pictures pictures from the original Uncharted game of a very young Nathan Drake, Elena, and Sully. It's awesome. But then you hear something outside. So she quickly throws everything down on the bookcase, closes the cabinet, and turns around to see mom and dad, Nathan Drake and Elena. They're notably older, probably 15 to 20 years older, and they can tell that she's broken into all of their goodies here. So they decide it's time to have the talk, where they share all of their adventures and what they've been through. Apparently, they've kept all of this secret all this time because she wasn't ready. But now is time to share the details of how they met 
and how they got to where they are today. So Nate takes his daughter outside and begins telling her all of these stories. Elena stays behind and puts the picture of the crew back in the first game back in the notebook. She walks away and the screen fades to black. And that is the end of Uncharted 4. And that's Uncharted 4. I want to spend this last section of the video just speaking kind of off the dome about the game, my overall impressions, thoughts, what's changed since it released, and what I think the lasting legacy of the game is. Because when I first played this game back in 2016, it was utterly mind-blowing. Every aspect of it, graphically, in terms of the gameplay, the fact that they were able to transition so smoothly from cutscene to gameplay, at the time that was utterly groundbreaking, and it really did make it look like Naughty Dog was miles ahead of the competition, and in many ways they were. But as I've had some time separated from the initial release of the game, and we've gone through it again for this video, I can see a lot of the shortcomings and a lot of the issues with the game. I think there's a lot of issues with how they lean so heavily on shooting arenas, but that's been an issue in the franchise since its first entry. As we've gone through all of the games in the franchise for this series on Uncharted, it's become very, very clear that these games have their design rooted in mid to late 2000s game design. And that's why for some people, when they play even the newer games in the franchise, they still get that nostalgic uh, scratch to that itch where it's sort of a flashback to when they were playing games when they were younger. And I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. Uh, at least the first couple times I play the game, but eventually it gets very, very tedious and I don't like it. So, uh, I, I have to point that out because it's a constant thorn in the side of anybody who's playing through these games is that the level design, while it can be interesting visually and stimulating in terms of navigation with the grapple hook that's introduced in Uncharted 4, for instance, it's still at the end of the day, shooting arenas and waves upon waves of enemies. And even when you're fighting waves and waves of enemies because of the way that Naughty Dog designed the gunplay in Uncharted from the first game, you're expected to constantly swap between weapons instead of picking one that you like, one or two weapons that you really like, and just replenishing ammunition for each of those weapons. Uh, you're constantly expected to juggle and bounce between 15 different weapons in the span of half an hour of gameplay. And for some, that keeps the gameplay interesting and engaging because you can never rely on one weapon above and beyond everything else. But as far as I'm concerned, it's just more tedious than it's worth. I would much prefer the route that they took with The Last of Us Part Two, for instance, where you can have a set number of weapons that you can upgrade over the course of the game so there's a sense of progression and so that there's reasons to explore the levels with perhaps new attachments or cosmetic options for the weapons you're using to be found in the levels, which is something that I think they started to play with with uh, Uncharted The Lost Legacy, which we'll be talking about in the next critique. Uh, of course, with all of these collectibles scattered throughout the levels. But in Uncharted 4, 1, 2, and 3, that's just not something they play with. You pick up a pistol, you empty the clips in it, and then you throw it by the wayside and go and find the next weapon to use. And as far as I'm concerned, it's just... It's... It's too boring. It's uninteresting. I know that some people have arguments for why they like the weapons constantly swapping in and out, that it's more realistic or that it encourages the player to navigate the levels and actually go and uh, land on the same location as the enemies they just eliminated so that they can swap to those weapons. I can see all of that being true, but to me, it's just not a great excuse. It doesn't change the fact that it is uninteresting and bland to me, and it feels too arcadey for a modern title where you're constantly swapping weapons out. It's just not my thing. I acknowledge that it's more of a subjective opinion compared to an objective opinion, but it's just not my favorite. I don't like it. There you go. <laughs>
<laughs> but the real bread and butter of Uncharted 4 is the story. And this marks the first major shift in the Uncharted series in narrative approach. In Uncharted 3, we started to feel this shift developing where Amy Hennig, the game director and one of the brains behind the operation over at Naughty Dog back at the time of Uncharted 3, 1 and 2, she started Uncharted and is really the brains behind the operation. She loved the kitschy, campy design of those stories. She loved the Nazi zombies. She loved the werewolves. She loved the Wendigo. She loved all this crazy stuff uh, that sort of implied supernatural effects, but with naturalistic explanations. So there's supernatural things going on, such as the djinn in Uncharted 3, but it has this naturalistic explanation in the form of this chemical that's being emitted from the jar. But it was so poorly implemented in Uncharted 3 that they imply that there's supernatural stuff actually going on um, where characters are teleporting in and out of locations, where they're surviving direct gunshot wounds, and they just never address it. And it really made Uncharted 3 especially feel unfinished, feel overly campy, and like the narrative was just an afterthought, because in many ways I think it was. In Uncharted 4, Amy Hennig was sort of welcomed to leave the development early on after they had spent probably a year in pre-production and after The Last of Us found amazing success. And Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley, who of course started The Last of Us and saw that game through to its completion, came in to sort of pick up the mantle and to carry on the development of Uncharted 4 after Amy Hennig and the leadership at Naughty Dog decided that they were going to sort of part ways. And originally they weren't supposed to see the game all the way through to its conclusion, but they did because they realized it needed a lot of work and it was going to be hopefully really amazing when they got it all the way through development. Um, and if you want to learn more about the development of Uncharted 4 in much more detail than I can go into here, I highly recommend Jason Schreier's books. Um, he wrote Blood, Sweat and Pixels and Press Reset, both of which are phenomenal books if you're interested in game development and how these titles get put together. He did all sorts of interviews with these guys, so highly highly recommend you check those out. But one of the things discussed in those books about Uncharted 4 and the development thereof was that Naughty Dog wanted to make an active effort to focus on inter-character relationships and develop those relationships over the course of a singular game. And we saw that in spades when it came to Uncharted 4. There are story arcs all over the place, whether it's with Sam and Nate, whether it's with Sam and Sully. They start out as sworn enemies at the beginning of the game, and then they end up being business partners by the end of the game. Or we see it, of course, with the relationship between Nate and Elena. There are character arcs all over the place, and it is so refreshing compared to Uncharted 3, Uncharted 2, Uncharted 1, where everything was approached in the same way as a kitschy, campy action adventure movie from the early 2000s. It's fun, it's lighthearted, but there's nothing there. It's like a junk food game in its purest form. It's just popcorn and candy and Skittles. There's nothing of substance. It's going to be enjoyable, but in a week, you're not going to look back on it too fondly. It's like, oh yeah, that was pretty good. And then you're going to move on. And I think this is in the same vein as a lot of the criticisms levied against Uncharted 4, which is that it was way more serious than the previous games were. And for some people, especially diehard fans of the original trilogy of Uncharted games, it really felt like it was the last of us with an uncharted coat of paint. It was really serious and they tried to be gritty in a lot of ways. And that just lost some of the soul of the original games. And while I can understand and appreciate that initial evaluation, I can't fully agree with it. Because as far as I'm concerned, Uncharted has always been a little silly and lighthearted, especially the early games. They had a lot of ridiculous stuff in them. But Uncharted 4 is still pretty lighthearted. It's not very serious. The stakes are not very high. The only characters they kill off are ones that they introduced this game for the sole purpose of killing off. Um, even when they imply or suggest that there are high stakes, such as every other occasion in the franchise when they suggest they're going to kill off a character, Naughty Dog bailed at the last second, whereas The Last of Us has no problem with killing off beloved characters. That's not even a controversial thing to say at this point, especially after the release of the second game. So 
as far as I view it and as far as I'm concerned, Uncharted is still unique in the lineup of Naughty Dog titles. They approach it very differently from The Last of Us. They don't take the world as seriously. They don't take consequences of the actu- of the actors and of the characters as seriously. It's totally separate. So while I can understand people seeing the increased graphical fidelity, the focus on cinematic set pieces and big budget movie uh, elements, I can see that and see the comparison drawn between Uncharted and The Last of Us, but I think that's really where it stops. The only comparison that's fair is to say that the budgets have increased and they're both really cinematic uh, approaches to video games. That's really where it ends for me. So to criticize Uncharted for being like The Last of Us, I don't think is fair. If anything, I don't think Uncharted 4 is similar enough to The Last of Us to really excel as far as gameplay is concerned because it's still approaching its gameplay systems in the same way that they approached it back in 2007 2009 and it's just not that interesting to me anymore at the time the gameplay was good enough for uncharted 2 for uncharted 3 but in the modern day and back in 2016 for uncharted 4 i just don't think these games have aged very well But all that kind of brings us to the lasting legacy, um, the lost legacy as it were now, the lasting legacy of Uncharted 4. I still love this game. I still think it's phenomenal. I think there's a lot that it does really, really well. And I've played this game into the ground, so I understand and I can admit that perhaps some of this is just fatigue at this point. But after playing through the whole Uncharted franchise, I really have started to pick up on just how similar all of these games really are at the core. They share the same basic plot line of Nate with Elena and part of his crew going to find some sort of treasure. And then over the course of the story with all of these struggles, he defeats the bad guy who wants the treasure for some amorphous, ambiguous reason to fulfill some destiny they feel they have um, or to, to, find wealth and power for themselves, even though all of the enemies are already wealthy and powerful at the start of all of these games. And then over the course of the journey, Nate realizes the treasure doesn't actually matter. What matters are his friends and his family in the form of Sam and in the form of Elena in the case of Uncharted 4. The games are all the same story. They're likable characters. The stories are good enough. They're silly and campy. But there's just not a lot of meat on the bone at the end of the day. And even though Uncharted 4 tries to add a lot of meat to the bone, it's still just not much in comparison to some of the other narrative experiences we've had in games in recent memory. It's still great, still a good game, but certainly not anything that I think is truly revolutionary in the industry. Nothing that I would say uh, will sort of end up in the history books of the most influential games in history, but still really good. And as far as a finish to Nathan Drake's storyline, I think it does a really, really good job, especially the ending bit with his daughter and seeing uh, Nathan and Elena having sort of agreed that this is what their life needs to be. This is what's important to them and they can't change who they are, so they might as well embrace it. I thought it did a really good job. You see everybody is happy and healthy at the end of the day. It's just a feel-good ending to a story that a lot of people were worried would end in Nathan Drake's death and demolishment. And I'm glad it finished the way it did. I think it was a good send off for this character that a lot of people really love. But now that we're done with Uncharted 4, we arrive at the Lost Legacy, which is what we'll be going through in the next critique. And this game is one that a lot of people love. A lot of people, such as myself, find it utterly lackluster, uninteresting, and borderline bad because the characters that the developers try to force down your throat and make likable just aren't likable at all. But that's a story for another time. Uncharted The Lost Legacy 
It is the most recent and apparently final entry in the Uncharted series, at least for a good long while at this point, and it originally started as a major DLC expansion for Uncharted 4, though eventually it grew so big and large in scope and price that they decided to just release it as a standalone game, though admittedly they did release it for about 60% of what most AAA games release for, partially because it was originally pitched as a DLC for Uncharted 4 and partially because it's very short, running in around 8-9 to nine hours for most players. Graphically, the game is very impressive, definitely a quality proof of concept for The Last of Us Part II, which would come just a few years later. The color work is phenomenal, the sound design is great, and the animation work is top notch. It really is hard to find things to criticize about it on a technical level. Even now, going on five years after this game's release, I, I don't know what it is. Recently, I've been going through these games from like the 2016-17 era, it feels like yesterday, but they're like six, five, six years old. It's blowing my mind. Like Breath of the Wild was five years ago. That's not okay. <laughs> Somebody do something. Stop it. The Lost Legacy also featured the largest map or open arena yet seen in a Naughty Dog game, which also was to prepare the team for the large open area in Seattle in the opening hours of The Last of Us Part 2. With this large open level, the game also started to experiment with level exploration, rewarding players for looking in every single nook and cranny with different collectibles which is certainly a welcome change from the tight corridor design of Uncharted 4, though it's important to note that there are still no special weapons to be found or gear to be equipped. The gameplay is the same as Uncharted 4 with constant weapon swapping and ammo depletion, and there's not much reason to explore the levels and find collectibles other than doing it for its own sake. So if you're not the type of player to go and hunt down all of these little trinkets just so you can say you platinum the game, there's not much reason for you to do it. But the core of this game is comprised of its protagonists and its antagonist. The Lost Legacy does so little different from its predecessors that all it really has going for it to make it feel unique in the series is a pair of brand new main characters, namely Nadine and Chloe. Obviously, these two have been in the series before, Chloe being one of the fan favorite characters from the original trilogy. Nadine, on the other hand, has a lot of baggage from Uncharted 4. Not only is she not likable or interesting in the least, but she presents numerous narrative problems as well. In Uncharted 4, she's effectively just a big muscly woman who kicks the main character's ass repeatedly before bowing out of the story at the last minute. Now this normally wouldn't even be an issue if the villain's sidekick happened to be really uninteresting and poorly developed. There's only so much time to spend on character development anyways. The problem is that Naughty Dog seems so insistent on making the player like her that it feels very contrived and desperate. With the release of Uncharted 4, Naughty Dog even seemed genuinely surprised that people criticized Nadine as an underdeveloped character. And so, in The Lost Legacy, it's good to see them attempt to correct this, spending a lot of time sharing stories between Nadine and Chloe back and forth about their childhoods and backgrounds. And we'll go into some of this in this video, but for now, let's just say I don't think they pull this off. Nadine's just not a good person. <laughs> like, whatever you want to say about Nathan Drake, Ludo narrative dissonance aside, he is a mass murdering psychopath. I think we can all agree on that. But if we look at the cutscenes, which for most people is how you determine what's canon in these types of games and stories, Nadine is not that at all. Spoilers for the end of Uncharted 4 real quick, but Nadine at the very end of Uncharted 4 literally leaves Rafe, Sam, and Nate to die in the belly of this ship that's on fire and surrounded with explosives. She locks the door and leaves them with no means of escape, as far as anybody can tell. In fact, the only way they can escape is when Nate takes an old cannon that thankfully is still loaded somehow and shoots a hole in the hull of the ship. Say what you will about Nathan Drake, I don't think he would ever leave three people to be engulfed in flames when he could have helped them escape or given them some second chance. It, it's just unfathomable that they do this with Nadine and then are like, why don't you like her as a character? 
we tried really hard. I said, you really didn't, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you. She left these people to die, even though they really weren't a threat to her. <laughs> like, she's just not a good person. Now, Chloe, on the other hand, is as great as ever, even though I think they should have killed her off in Uncharted 2 since they set it up and signaled it all over that game. I'm still glad that she's here. She's witty and does a great job of carrying the narrative of the game on her shoulders. Though, I think it is important to note, I don't think she's as good a protagonist as Nathan Drake. But to be fair, it took four games for Nate to reach his full potential as a character. So, considering this is only our second exposure to Chloe in any meaningful sense, I still think it's very impressive that she plays so well on screen. All told, I just think Naughty Dog has run out of ideas when it comes to Uncharted. And I think over the course of The Lost Legacy, as we go through the whole game in this video, you'll start to see that it's just more of the same. At this point, there's not much more that can be done other than giving the franchise a break, waiting for technology to develop further, and then coming back to the franchise with a fresh set of eyes in a few years time. The Lost Legacy is not bad. It's just not great. And in a series that regularly hits it out of the park, that's actually a major failure. In effect, this is exactly the same as when you can point at a major AAA blockbuster movie that rakes in hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue at the box office, but is still considered a commercial flop because they expected it to do so much better compared to its peers in the AAA blockbuster space. It performed well, but it underperformed. It's possible that both of those are true at the same time. It's just a matter of perspective on who's evaluating what a good performance is or what it means to perform well and who's determining what it should have done given all of the factors involved. Lost Legacy isn't a bad game, but compared to the expectations of the Uncharted series, especially after Uncharted 4, it fell short of expectations and was, therefore, a failure. The game still has memorable moments, the most notable of which for me was when I climbed to the top of the central tower in the large open section, and once atop the precipice, if you stand still, Chloe will actually start to do yoga poses and the camera will slowly pan around her. It's a nice, calm moment in a game that's otherwise about nothing more than mindless shooting and arenas. And in my mind, the other notable element would be Chloe as a character and as a protagonist. I think she's really good. And I really do believe that she could grow to be just as beloved as Nathan Drake over the course of a few subsequent games that push the boundaries in different ways. But as of right now, I really believe that Naughty Dog needs to take some time to rethink how these games should work and what they can be. Because right now, it feels like they're just flat out of ideas. And of course, when they've settled on what the next generation of Uncharted will look like, we fans will still be here eager to engage with those games and give them a shot. It's just, I think, gonna need a little time. Now, I wanna go through the whole of The Lost Legacy to look at it and break it down piece by piece, just like we've done for the previous four games in the franchise to wrap this whole thing up. Problem is, the narrative isn't that interesting compared to the narratives in Uncharted 4, 3, 2, and even 1. It's certainly an afterthought. And in terms of overall content, this game is much closer to Uncharted 1 in size and scope than it is to any of the others. So it's a little weird. So instead of delving into all of the minutia, which had comparatively little thought put into it compared to Uncharted 4, we're gonna keep a broader view of the game, go over it more generally, and discuss the broad strokes instead of the individual, uh, I guess, hair strokes, follicle stroke, whatever that would be. Broad strokes instead of the small whatever it would be. And if you want to enter to win a few upcoming AAA games over the course of this year, uh, just head over to our Discord. Links in the description box below in my link tree. Follow all my social media and everything. Um, all you have to do to enter the giveaways is be a member of the Discord. But if you follow the other social media, I would greatly appreciate it. That's it. Buckle up. Here we go. The Lost Legacy. So the game effectively has four main acts. 
the prologue, what I'm deeming the exploration section, the next chunk, which I will call the big puzzle and elephant, and the finale. In terms of settings, we effectively have three. We have the prologue setting inside this city. We have the jungle and rainforesty areas in the middle two acts. And in the finale, we will spend most of our time following a train around a bunch of tracks and fighting it out in a rail yard. Compare this, of course, to the scope of previous games in the franchise, and it will seem markedly reduced, but I don't want to dwell on all of these little nitpicky details because I just don't think it's fair to criticize The Lost Legacy heavily for being smaller in scope than its older brother, especially because Naughty Dog came out charging less for this game than Uncharted 4. So to come out and be like, see, they went to Madagascar and Scotland and then they went to the Caribbean and they did all this stuff. I just think that's a stupid criticism to levy. So I'm not going to do it. I just want to make it clear. We're talking about a game that is much smaller in scope. So don't get your hopes up expecting something significantly uh, larger on the scale of Uncharted 2 or 3 or even 4. The first thing you'll probably notice when playing The Lost Legacy is that they introduce you to Chloe right away and you're exposed to a lot more color and contrast compared to the previous games. Uncharted 4 was certainly not an ugly game, but in terms of art direction it felt fairly bland. But in The Lost Legacy they really flexed their artistic muscles here. This opening section is mostly meant to introduce the player to the political frustrations and conflicts going on within India and the city more generally. There are a bunch of insurgents around the city and Indian military soldiers that are trying to keep everything under control. We don't get to find out much right now, but this little girl shares a good amount of information for us to set up the story. We also don't know what Chloe's trying to do at this point. Again, it's kept very, very vague. And instead, we just have to roll with the motions and go where the game wants us to go until we find out why we're doing any of this. So we hop in a truck and go across the river to end up in what seems to be the war-torn section of the city. We're then shown a picture of a red door at the end of an alleyway, which tells us where we need to go. Though it's important to note that these levels in the opening section of the game are extremely narrow and linear, so there's not actually actually going to be any question of where you're supposed to go. As you walk through the alleyways, you see some of these insurgents breaking into people's houses, holding them at gunpoint, beating and shooting people who resist, and it really sets the stage. There's a significant sense of fear and anxiety within the heart of this portion of the city. You make your way through a couple of guard checkpoints, learn how to stealth take down some enemies, and to crouch behind cover. Eventually you come up on the red door and are introduced to the lock picking mechanic, which is extremely basic and very, very forgiving, but it's not a big deal. You work your way to the top of the building, and when you open the door at the very top of the stairwell, you push your way through some of the clothes hung on the clothesline in front of you. And when you come out to see the city landscape before you, it's all on fire. There's also this really cool shot with a fire jet coming through and dropping some bombs on the city below. It's very bright, very vivid, almost beautiful if it weren't signifying many people's deaths. This is one of my frustrations, though, early in the game. There's really no context given that's significant about the conflict within the city and country of India here. We just know that there are insurgents trying to overthrow the government, and that seems to be what's going on here. I recognize that many people won't care about this, and they'll just accept that they're fighting a bunch of unnamed faceless soldiers out in the world. It doesn't matter why they're fighting them or what their motivations are, but I personally really appreciate when I understand the motivations of the villains and the people that I'm fighting against. But back to the rooftop. A few soldiers show up and start attacking Chloe. You fight your way for a little bit, but you seem to be out of your league which is precisely when Nadine shows up. If you went into this game cold without having seen any of the media or press or even the game cover, this would be a total surprise. Chloe and Nadine working together is one of the more strange collaborations that I've seen in recent memory, but you know what, if it works, it works. 
After the pair takes down these soldiers, they start to catch up on where they're at in their mission. Nadine starts talking about a man named Asav. It says that it took her weeks to track him down and that he's very unpredictable. Chloe throws in some dialogue about him being just another warmonger with no war to fight, meaning that he's just like a trapped bulldog that wants to piss somebody off, so he has some reason to fight. But that already seems to be admitting that he doesn't have any genuine motivations or interesting backing to anything he's doing. And spoiler alert, Asav is going to be just that, a bland, uninteresting villain with no genuine motivations to any of his actions other than the bland, I'm evil because I want to be powerful and my evil behavior causes me to gain power and that's about it. And it's unfortunate because in a lot of these smaller games or spin-off titles, you can usually justify going a little bit crazier with the writing or trying out some really unique and novel things. But in The Lost Legacy, they played it more safe than I think they probably have played it since Uncharted 1 came out. At least in that game, they had Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, granted, they were Nazi zombies, but still. The other thing that's established in this initial conversation between Chloe and Nadine is their different temperaments. Nadine is incredibly serious and very difficult to work with. Chloe is perhaps overly relaxed and very akin in her approach to... Nathan Drake. And here, two things are also established. Most players are probably going to like hearing Chloe talk and interact with this world much more than they will enjoy hearing Nadine talk about it and navigate it because she's sort of the Debbie Downer of the group. But secondly, it also establishes her character arc. Nadine, over the course of this story, is going to slowly loosen up and learn to be a little bit more carefree in how she approaches these things. Sure, it's predictable, but I don't think it's actually a bad thing to have a plot point that's predictable as long as it makes sense for the characters. It's when you have a predictable plot point that has no basis in the character's motivations and doesn't make any damn sense at all that we have a problem. But the two establish where they need to go next. Specifically, they need to get to Asav's main office because they need something out of there. Chloe spots the office with a pair of binoculars and the crew knows where they need to go next. So you start navigating over the rooftops, eventually landing on this rooftop, which has a crate that you can push to allow Nadine to climb up a nearby ledge. So you pull the crate out and drop it down below, but it actually crashes through the ceiling of this building and nearly kills Nadine in the process. Chloe gives a little oopsie daisy and Nadine replies, oh, Sorry about that. How about we avoid crates from now on? Okay, good deal. And sure enough, for the rest of the Lost Legacy, we're not going to be using crates really at all. It's something that was used a ton in Uncharted 4, but I think they received enough pushback or criticisms because it felt really overdone in that game. But this time around, they're self-aware. Naughty Dog's like, yeah, we get it. The crates kind of suck and it's a little stupid. So don't worry about it. No more crates. And sure enough, they stick to it. Ever persistent, the crew pushes on, eventually climbing all the way up the side of the building to Asav's office, which is filled with all sorts of antiquities. There's pots, paintings, statues, mosaics, everything you could possibly imagine related to Indian culture and heritage. Most notable to these two, however, is a lockbox. Once you pick the lock and break into it, you find a small circular device. But before they have time to figure out what it is, some armed men break in and Chloe slips the disc into her back pocket right as Asav enters. Now I'm gonna let this section play off because I'm going to talk about it and I want you to evaluate it just as critically as I am because I think I'm picking up on some stuff but I don't wanna overly read into it. So instead I'll just let it play, let you form your own opinion and then I'll offer my thoughts on the back end. Here it is. Oh. Time to go. Nadine Ross. What a pleasant surprise. Ah, ah, careful, brothers. This tiger's got claws. A soft. Oh, all these years. 
And you haven't aged a day. You're too kind. <laughs> Are you looking for work? I hear that Shoreline's under new management. Temporary setback. Nothing I can't handle. Of course, of course. Pity though. My men and I could use someone of your caliber. Why are you here? I mean, this... This isn't your area of expertise. It, it is a nice collection, I must say. Chloe Fraser. Collector of antiquities. A thief? You're working for a thief. Sir, we have a situation. I'll be right there. The disc. Oh, right. About that. At first, I mistook you for just an average rebel. Oh. But you have managed to find the Hoysala Empire. That's not bad. Their greatest treasure. The task of Ganesh. Now that's not an easy find. What are you doing? Three Persian invasions, three separate wars, and all these years later, no one has found it. We're close. You're lost. And the only chance you have of even narrowing down its location is to find someone who can help you crack this artifact. Someone with an extensive knowledge of Hoysala society. Exactly. An expert in their culture and history. My rates are reasonable. A parasite who exploits our struggle in order to fatten her pockets. Hmm. So that's a no? Felt like a no. <laughs> You've got balls. I like that. But I don't need any more so-called experts. Shoot them. Throw their bodies in the river. No need. Now, clearly, there's some relationship between Nadine and Asav that's not discussed further. There's some history here. Some Uncharted fans seem to think that Nadine and Asav had some sort of romantic relationship previously that ended badly and caused a lot of tension. Others think that Asav previously hired Shoreline and that's how he got to know Nadine back when she was running it and leading it in its heyday before it basically collapsed at the end of Uncharted 4. You know, because Nathan Drake killed everyone. The reason I wanted to play that for you is because I feel like there's some sort of strange sexual tension going on here. But but I can't tell if that's just me reading it into the situation or if it's actually there. So let me know in the comment section, maybe hashtag tension or something so I know that you are referring to this. But let me know in the comment section what you think of this situation, if you think there's something more there or if I'm just reading too much into it, because I think it will color the rest of their interactions for the rest of the game if we know the answer to that question. Regardless, right after Asav orders their death, Chloe kicks over a table with a lamp and starts a fire, which allows them just enough cover to break out the window on the back end and bust out onto the roofs below. What follows is a pretty elaborate chase sequence through the rooftops down to the river below. Before they reach the bottom, though, the two pause and have a brief conversation. Nadine's pissed off because she feels like Chloe was about to sell her out to Asav to get her off her back to save the 50% cut that she owes Nadine. 50% cut of what exactly we're not sure at this point, but presumably it would be worth a fair sum. It's also here that Nadine reminds everybody of what she did at the end of the last game. She says that the last man who betrayed her and double-crossed her ended up dead, which is true because she's referring to Rafe. He did end up dead. But part of the reason he ended up dead is because she locked him in the hole with a murderous psychopath in the form of Nathan Drake, leaving him to die. I get it. Rafe was a bad guy. Bad guys often die in these types of stories. Whatever. But it doesn't change the fact that what Nadine did was objectively awful. Setting all of that aside, the two race down and eventually get into the river below. 
Apparently, Chloe has hired a boat to pick them up once they get to the water beneath, kind of expecting that this type of thing would happen. And sure enough, once you end up in the water, we cut to black and come back in with the two on a small skip that's going down the river. Now, this offers us a brief moment of respite from the rest of the combat and violence that surrounds this story. It's just Chloe and Nadine talking in the back of this boat. A bunch of exposition is given here, namely that we are trying to find the Tusk of Ganesh, which is an ancient artifact which presumably holds a lot of power over the Indian people as a monolith and as an item of significant historical and cultural value, but also it probably is worth a good amount of money if it could be verified as the actual Tusk of Ganesh. We also find out that Asav is after this same tusk. Why? It's not exactly clear, but the answer isn't that satisfying even when we do get it. You see, Asav is the leader of one of the insurgency groups. He's the guy that's trying to overthrow the Indian government and take control of all of India. He feels entitled to it based on his lineage, and he feels as though it's his destiny. However, his fights with the Indian government haven't been going well at all. They're effectively at a standstill, but he's slowly losing power as he loses his men and his funds and resources are depleted. So he's desperate for another option. In this case, he's trying to find the Tusk of Ganesh because he feels like it could actually be used to harness power over the Indian people, recruiting more to actually fight his battle with him and motivating them to fight even harder because with the Tusk of Ganesh, he would effectively be proven to the Indian people as the true heir of power, the one that should be in control of the country. Now, once again, this is just another example of a bad guy being a bad guy for bad guy's sake. There's nothing that interesting about his motivations or what he's trying to do. It's just that he feels he should be powerful. He feels like he's entitled to it. And so he's going to do evil stuff to make it come out his way. It's just not interesting. I'm sure it doesn't have to be said, but the most interesting and captivating villains are the ones that you strangely find yourself agreeing with, even in a dark, twisted sort of way. You can agree and sympathize with their diagnosis of the problem, but you disagree with the prescription. In the case of Asav, there is no agreeing on the diagnosis or the prescription. He's just a bad guy who's crazy and is bad because he's bad. But there's a whole other element to his plan to overthrow the Indian government and take control for himself. But we're going to get there in a little bit. For now, just know that we're all trying to find the Tusk of Ganesh and Chloe's trying to find it first. In addition, Chloe and Nadine talk a little bit about their backgrounds. During these opening sections, we find out that Nadine has separated from Shoreline at least temporarily. Shoreline is still operational somewhat, but it's currently under the control of her former lieutenant, somebody that goes by the name Orca. It seems as though the humiliation that the company suffered at the end of Uncharted 4 was just too much for Nadine to retain control over the group, so she was welcomed to leave. We also find out a little bit about Chloe's father, specifically that he's the one that started this search for Ganesh's tusk, and that most of his research is being used by Chloe to find it. It seems that he passed away a while back, but Chloe refuses to discuss this much further. But that's about it for now. We then reach chapter three, and it's here that we begin what I would consider to be the second act of the game, which is the broad exploration portion. There will be a lot of free climbing, a lot of driving this Jeep around, and clearing small enemy encampments that are filled with shoreline mercenaries and Asav's henchmen. This portion of the game was talked up a lot in the marketing for it and in the development. This portion of the game was talked up a lot in the lead up to the release. Basically, it is the largest single level in any Naughty Dog game ever created, though I do believe this record was broken with the large open area in Seattle in The Last of Us Part 2, though as far as I could find, Naughty Dog has neither confirmed nor denied this, but having played both of them recently, I think Seattle is actually a little bigger. And in terms of game design, it's actually pretty straightforward. 
In this large open area that's surrounding a central pillar tower, you have to go to each of these marked locations, clearing them, which effectively partially clears the way for you to continue. It's only once you've cleared all of these encampments that you can fully unlock the door to allow you to progress. And I will say, after playing through this portion of the game three times for this video alone in the last month or two, it's really proved to me that an open world Uncharted game isn't what we were all hoping it would be. You see, there's a reason that Uncharted games have been very, very linear in the past, with tight corridors, large set pieces, and carefully scripted moments. It's because these games at their core are basically interactive action movies. They aren't about open world exploration, they aren't about careful open world design, or extreme amounts of interactability within the worlds that are crafted. And furthermore, it's a question of expertise. Naughty Dog is really good at those cinematic scripted linear moments. They're not very good at open world design. And that's okay. What Rockstar is phenomenal at doing is what Naughty Dog is weak at doing. And what Naughty Dog is phenomenal at doing is what Rockstar is weak at doing. Though, to be fair, Rockstar seems to be good at pretty much everything at this point, except for remasters. So <laughs> it's perhaps not the best example. It's like I mentioned during the intro of the video. Naughty Dog just isn't great at encouraging players to explore the levels, especially in Uncharted games. There's no reason to look in every nook and cranny unless you are a collectible hunter, and even then, most people will find this boring. Crafting worlds that you want to explore simply for sake of exploring them is incredibly difficult. It's why a game like Breath of the Wild is so amazing, because it is so difficult to pull that off. I admire Naughty Dog trying, but it just doesn't stick the landing here. This whole section just felt like a poorly put together, gigantic shooting arena instead of an interesting portion of this Indian wilderness for me to explore. Chloe and Nadine tried to banter back and forth to keep it lively and interesting, with some exposition being revealed as they go, but it's not enough to save it in my mind. Furthermore, most of the dialogue between Nadine and Chloe is related to their daddy issues. And I don't mean to dismiss them as characters, but I'm not joking. It's Nadine discussing how Shoreline was her father's company and how she sort of resents him for leaving this in her lap, even though it's all she's ever known and all she's ever really cared about. And Chloe never really got over the death of her father and is searching for this treasure, both because she wants to keep it out of Asav's hands, but also because she wants to see her father's task through to the end. I know it's purely subjective, but I just don't find this particularly interesting. Even the plot line in Uncharted 4 relating to Nathan and Sam's mother wasn't particularly interesting, and Naughty Dog didn't pretend as though it was. It effectively served just as a quick passing explanation for why Sam and Nate had to go on the run originally from the orphanage and everything that they had been doing up to that point. They didn't try to explain away the actions of Nate and Sam through Uncharted 4 with that myopic explanation and motivation. I mean, seriously, imagine if they were searching for Avery's treasure just because their mother at one point dreamed of finding it. It just would be a lame reason to go through all of this trouble and to massacre all of these people, instead giving them the motivation of trying to save Sam from this recently deceased drug lord that actually works. It's urgent, it's immediate, and it's with somebody who's alive and present that you're interacting with. So it feels much more real as a motivation than something that's based in a character that we've never met and never will. The other major issue with this section of the game is that it relies once again on the large shooting arenas that I've criticized for pretty much the entirety of the time that I've been critiquing these Uncharted games. Naughty Dog's approach to weapon variety variety in Uncharted is to give you these disposable weapons that run out of ammo quickly that force you to swap to a different weapon that a different enemy had been carrying. 
and it sucks. I get it, it's meant to encourage dynamic gameplay, you're constantly swapping weapons so it keeps things interesting in theory, but it just doesn't work for me, especially when you're trying to implement these big open levels and encourage exploration within them. Having set weapons like in The Last of Us Part Two or the original Last of Us game would be so much better because you could explore the nooks and crannies of these levels to try and find crafting materials to improve these weapons or different weapons entirely that could add a new flair to your approach to each of these combat encounters, such as discovering a sniper rifle or a grenade launcher that has very rare ammo, but that you can save for select encounters that are particularly difficult. I get it, not every single game needs to be The Last of Us or needs to be an action RPG, but there are certain mechanisms and mechanics that just work better than others. And in this case, the approach Uncharted takes screams 2006 in my mind. It's just bad and feels outdated. There's no other way I can put it. And I could rant about it for an hour, but I think I've proven my point, especially if you've watched all of my critiques on the Uncharted series up to this point, in which case you'll be sick and tired of hearing me complain about this. But far and away my favorite moment in the entirety of The Lost Legacy is this moment right here. You can climb up this central pillar at the middle of this open world area. You have to go to this broken door, climb up it at just the right angle, and then climb around this chipped out portion of it. But once you do so, you can actually climb onto the very tippy top of the tower, and when you stand here, the camera will start to pan around Chloe. It's pretty cool. Chloe will even throw out a line of dialogue saying that she could stay here all day. So I decided to take her up on that, just taking in the view. And I discovered that if you actually just sit here and do nothing for about a minute, Chloe will actually start to do yoga poses. She sets her gun and everything else down next to her and starts to do these poses as the camera pans out and slowly circles her. It's beautiful, it's peaceful, it's calming, this is far and away the most memorable moment in the entirety of The Lost Legacy for me. I loved this. It just goes to show you, sometimes the best thing to do is to give players a break and just allow them to take in the art and the scenery that you've presented. You don't need to fill every nook and cranny of the game with violence and combat. You can take a breather and it's okay. And often those breathers will be more memorable and enjoyable for the player than the non-stop adrenaline rush of gunfire. But when we finally have had enough, we move on. After you've cleared all of the encampments in this area and collected whatever collectibles you want to find, you can move on. And it's here that we enter the third act of the game, which I refer to as the big puzzle and the elephants. This is because the only two things that are really memorable or interesting in this entire act of the game that spans multiple hours is a big puzzle and a bunch of elephants. There are some other events that take place, such as Asav getting the jump on Chloe and Nadine in this area. It leads to a brief fist fight. I mean, I, I get it, he is a mercenary, so it makes sense he's good at fighting, but he just wipes the floor with Nadine and Chloe, like it's not even close. And again, normally I wouldn't have an issue with one boss or character beating up another character, but in the last game, Uncharted 4, it was established that Nadine could take Sam and Nathan Drake on by herself single-handedly and kick their asses. Nathan and Sam Drake are very fit and very, very experienced in combat. The idea that she could wipe the floor with them so easily was kind of ridiculous. And in this game, we have Chloe and Nadine once again fighting Asav, and he wipes the floor with them. It just goes to show that Naughty Dog isn't actually too concerned with what makes sense in terms of combat in these cutscenes. They're more concerned with what serves the narrative purpose for that given moment. In Uncharted 4, they needed Nadine to kick Sam and Nate's ass so that she would be justified as a worthy companion to Rafe and somebody that deserved attention in the grander scheme of the story. And in this case, they have to show that Asav is an actual threat and on a more metaphorical level that Nadine and Chloe are outmatched. But there's two main set pieces in this act of the game. The first is with an elephant. You find one trapped underneath some rubble. Apparently the explosions that Asav is setting off caused some part of this 
ancient structure to collapse on the elephant it's not really clear but what is clear is the elephant is stuck so Nadine and Chloe push it off and free the little guy you then get to ride on the elephant as Nadine very excitedly spits off a bunch of animal facts as you ride through this calm solemn section it is one of the more humanizing moments for Nadine she seems to be a little bit of an animal nut and it's cute to see Plus, I mean, what other game have you played where you can ride on an elephant with your friend? Like, what has that ever happened? <laughs> but the entire moment is almost completely spoiled by yet more discussion of parental issues. Again, I get it. There's actual trauma here. Chloe is very sad that her father was mauled by bandits who raided his camp. I get it. It makes sense. But it doesn't change the fact that we haven't met Chloe's father. We don't know who or what he was. And on the most basic level, there's no reason to be emotionally torn apart by this. We can empathize and feel bad for her that her father died. But in terms of motivating the player, it really doesn't do much. If we were given a couple of cutscenes or flashback sequences where we got to meet her father and see them interact, that could have done loads to make this work far, far better. But instead, we just have to imagine it, and that's just not very effective in terms of implementing this character into the story. Instead, it just feels like a construct that's been placed here to lazily justify Chloe's actions, which is, in fact, all that is going on here. But enough complaining about daddy issues. You reunite the elephant with the rest of his family, take some pictures, and move on to yet more shooting arenas, eventually ending up in a large area that's filled with the big puzzle. Once again, something I've brought up with every single one of these Uncharted games at this point, there is a large set piece that's hidden underground but is exposed to the elements and the open air, which begs the question why it hasn't been found up to this point. In this case, it's a gigantic gilded statue which is opened up to the forest above. Now, in this case, we are in the middle of a dense jungle, and this comparatively is a pretty small opening in an otherwise very dense jungle, so I can actually justify this one why it wouldn't have been found in all this time, because effectively you would have to be directly overhead in a helicopter or something to be able to spot this. But again, I just have to mention that Naughty Dog does this all the time, where they have a big gold gilded whatever open to the elements, easily visible from above, and then they're like, whoa, it's amazing, nobody's found this yet. Yeah, you're damn right it is. Admittedly, this is a far less egregious example than in Uncharted 4, for instance, when Libertalia has been searched for centuries and centuries, and it turns out it's completely open to the air with huge buildings and mansions visible for all to see from the air above. It, it just doesn't make any sense how that possibly went undiscovered for any period of time once air travel was invented. Anyways, we set the arms of this statue at very specific angles. Doesn't require any brain power whatsoever. You're just turning dials and jumping from platform to platform within a set amount of time. It's not particularly engaging, but hey, it, it works. But once all of the beams of light are aligned properly, the puzzle is solved, but just in time for a sob to show up with a bunch of armed men. There's then a large shootout, but inevitably Chloe and Nadine end up at the very bottom underneath the statue. A sob captures them, puts them in handcuffs, and introduces them to their friend, Sam. Yeah, that's right, Sam Drake. Turns out he's been working with the sob all this time, but as a double agent, Chloe helped him get a job with Asav as his historical expert, who Asav has been referencing through the entire game up to this point. Asav thought that Sam was going to help him discover the Tusk of Ganesh first, but in reality, he was actively sabotaging their efforts. In effect, he was a mole working for Chloe and Nadine the whole time. He would send Asav on wild goose chases, so he would waste time, money, and resources on frivolous pursuits, giving Chloe and Nadine more time to discover the treasure for themselves. Though it's probably fair to say that Chloe didn't tell Sam that she was working with Nadine or vice versa. But I'll be honest, 
When I first played through this game, and even today, I can't come up with any other reason that they would have brought Sam into this story other than that they felt that Chloe and Nadine weren't doing a good enough job to carry it through to the end. If they just wanted to introduce another character, why not just introduce another character? Sam really doesn't serve a narrative purpose in this game, he doesn't have a significant role whatsoever, and in large part, he mostly just acts as comic relief, giving mindless banter back and forth to give a couple chuckles as you go through the ending act of the game. I'm sure Naughty Dog would say that they just wanted to bring Sam into the story because he's a loved character from the previous game, but it feels overtly contrived in my mind. The fact that Chloe and Nadine happen to meet up and work together is already a little bit of a stretch for me, but then to suggest that they also got Sam Drake involved is just another straw, perhaps just a little bit too far for me. But regardless, he's here. Asav takes the group through to the next chamber, which presumably holds the Tusk of Ganesh. And over the course of about five minutes, you'll solve a quick puzzle where you rotate some circles into a bigger circle, which ends up being a disc with a picture on it, which then you can use to arrange the statue in the right way so that you don't get decapitated by this ax. Then a little holder pops up and reveals the Tusk of Ganesh. Asav takes it and leaves these three handcuffed to this post to drown and die. They set off a bunch of explosive devices, but Chloe brought a lockpick, of course, because she's been lockpicking this whole game, and starts to get Nadine and Sam free from their shackles. Just in the nick of time, she's able to get the handcuffs off of everybody, and they swim to the surface, narrowly surviving. And I have to ask if I'm alone in doing this, whenever I'm playing like a game or there's a movie where the characters are underwater for an extended period of time, I try holding my breath for the same amount of time to see if it's possible. I will say when this happened, I tried holding my breath for as long as Chloe did. I managed to, I, I survived, but bear in mind, I was sitting with a controller in my lap, so it wasn't quite the same as actively swimming and trying to pick a lock with the impending threat of death. So it's not quite the same. But if you did this too, if, if you're one of those people that holds their breath during movies and games when characters are underwater, let me know so I know that I'm not totally insane, okay? I appreciate it. <laughs> Once at the surface, the group realizes that Asav is off for some sort of weapons deal, presumably to sell the tusk, though this isn't known for certain. Sam just says he overheard Asav talking about some deal at the train yard, so the group realizes they need to get to the train yard. Sam and Nadine share a little bit of dialogue as well. It appears Nadine is really pissed at Sam for some reason. Sam is thanking her for saving his life and being very courteous, but Nadine is not having any of it. Bear in mind, Nadine's the one that left him for freaking dead. Like, I, she's the bad one in this situation. She should be apologizing to him, asking his forgiveness. But no, it's like, no, Nadine's right. She's she's very upset with, with Sam. It doesn't make any sense at all, but she's very upset. But now we head into the finale of the game. We have our full trio and the group heads towards the train depot. There's a lot of light puzzling and yet more shooting arenas, but the finale of this level is with this helicopter that you have to shoot down. For some reason, it hovers just within reach of your grappling hook instead of high up or far away from the gunfire and RPG shells that are coming in. But you know what, beggars can't be choosers. And in the back of the helicopter is actually Orca, the lieutenant that took over Shoreline from Nadine. Turns out Asav left the Tusk of Ganesh with this guy. So you take the helicopter down and Orca is left sitting outside of the helicopter, bleeding and dying, but still holding the tusk. He gives the standard bad guy speech where he explains in detail everything that's going on for no apparent reason. He and his Shoreline crew brought a big old bomb to trade for the Tusk of Ganesh, which presumably would be very valuable if sold to the right collector or governmental agency. It seems that Asav traded the Tusk, which would have held political power over the people, for a large bomb which holds, well, more direct power over the people. You see, it seems as though Asav wants to blow up a big portion of the city 
nearby because he thinks that will motivate a bunch of people in the city to join his forces in overthrowing the Indian government. In other words, he wants to set up a false flag operation similar to what Hitler did in Poland in 1939. It sets off the bomb in the market of the city, kills thousands of civilians, but can blame that bomb on the government and say that if the people of the city want to prevent this from happening again, they should join his forces and fight the government which caused this to happen. Even though, you know, it was him all along, but... They don't know that. What commences is basically a reskinned version of the sequence from Uncharted 4 in Madagascar, specifically the section when you're running away from the tank and trying to get to Sam as he's chased by hordes of enemies. And it's also mashed up with the train sequence from Uncharted 2. It sort of is a victory lap of Naughty Dog Uncharted game design. All of these big set pieces and impressive technical accomplishments are put forward here, and it's done just as well as it was before, and that is to say very, very well. And I wish there was more that I could say about it, but it really doesn't do anything notable or interesting in comparison to the previous games. It's just more of the same. Again, the tale of the tape when it comes to the Lost Legacy. Chloe and Sam do stop off to try and divert the train onto a different set of tracks that will lead it away from the city. And they succeed in this, but it diverts the train towards a bridge that's partially collapsed, meaning that the train is just going to go straight off the edge. Even so, the crew continues to push up towards the front of the train to try and get to the bomb. Once there, they meet Asav and have a fist fight which ends markedly different than their last one. Asav gets the ever-living crap beaten out of him and eventually they kick him so hard that he backs into the bomb. It falls off the stand that it was resting on and falls on his leg, trapping him in the train car with the bomb that's about to go off a giant cliff. So then you run trying to escape the train as it slips off the tracks into the river below, narrowly escaping and grabbing a beam with your grapple hook. As Chloe and Nadine hang with Sam catching up from the train track behind them, the bomb that Asav bought goes off, incinerating him and causing many fireworks for all to see. Though I hate to be this guy, this bomb isn't that big. They said this thing would kill thousands, and I get it was underwater partially when it went off, but this really isn't that big of a bomb. I've watched Mythbusters when they blew up that cement truck. I've seen what a real bomb can do when properly implemented, and this thing surely was more powerful than that cement truck bomb in Mythbusters. So I, I just don't buy that they would be able to be this close and be totally fine if that bomb presented any significant threat to any number of people. It's just really underwhelming. I don't know how else to put it. This, this explosion is just underwhelming. Regardless, the crew then sits on the train tracks overlooking the city, confident they've just saved the day, and they're left with the Tusk of Ganesh, so they got everything they possibly could wish for. It is a nice change of pace from the previous games, when Nathan Drake never seemed to get any amount of treasure out of any of his escapades, even though he was successful in tracking it down. And then the credits roll, and that's the game. There is a brief post credit scene where we see Chloe, Nadine, Sam, and the little girl from the very beginning of the game eating pizza. This is a reference to the very beginning of the game when Chloe said that if this little girl helped her get into that truck to cross the river, she would give her pizza when she returned. And so it's a good touch. Tell you what, when I get back, pizza's on me. Deal? Deal. And then we go to black and the game is over. And that's The Lost Legacy. There really isn't that much to say about it. Although this video is very long at this point, I grant you, it's just more of the same. I think it tried to do a few things interestingly by putting these characters together we never expected to see together, like Chloe and Nadine, Sam and Nadine, Sam and Chloe. And in that pursuit, it's relatively interesting, but it doesn't change the fact that I think Nadine is painfully uninteresting as a character writ large. It's not because she's a woman. It's not because she was introduced in Uncharted 4 in a rushed way. I think it's mostly because she's a mercenary and mercenaries tend to just not be very interesting as characters. It's as simple as that. And over the course of this game, she eventually gives up all care for Shoreline. At the very end of the game, she even says that she's walking away from it entirely, which shows at least some 
character arc has taken place. And so I'm confident in a future game, if they gave her another shot, now that she's just a treasure hunter, she could actually end up being fairly interesting and she could be somebody who loosens up and is a little more fun to engage with. But at the start of the game and for the majority of Uncharted The Lost Legacy, she's very stiff and doesn't engage in any sort of fun or playful way like Nate did, like Sam does, like Sully does, or Elena does. She's just stiff. And in comparison to Chloe, who is very loose and similar in approach to Nathan, which is why they work so well together in Uncharted 2, it just comes off even worse because you're constantly reminded at how stiff Nadine is. And Sam is, well, Sam. He's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with him, but his presence in this game just feels very contrived and like it was put together to help carry the game across the finish line. And I actually have a theory for why Naughty Dog is constantly putting uh, Troy Baker's characters into games, even when they don't seem like they are particularly appropriate or that they naturally come out of the story. And I really think it's just because they love his performance. Specifically, Neil Druckmann loves Troy Baker as a performer, and I don't blame him. Even though Troy Baker, as far as NFTs are concerned, seems to be a few lettuces short of an allotment, for lack of a better term, he does perform very, very well. He did very well in Uncharted 4 and, of course, The Last of Us Part 2. But what seems to be the case is that Naughty Dog likes Troy Baker so much that they effectively want to keep him on the payroll so that he doesn't go off and do other projects when they need him. So they just keep him involved in everything they do. So he's constantly at the studio, available for reshoots, re-recordings, whatever else they might need to do, which is why they put him in Uncharted 4, because then he's present. And as they're working on The Last of Us Part 2, early production stuff, he can be involved in present there. Whereas if they did The Last of Us in 2013, didn't bring him in for Uncharted 4, and then brought him in for The Last of Us Part 2, we're talking easily five, six, seven years between the time that he would be working with the studio from one project to the other. And I just don't think they want to do that. So they sort of force Troy Baker into these roles, even when that role doesn't make a lot of sense in the story. Sam, as a character in Uncharted 4, was contrived seemingly to give Troy Baker a character to play in the game because they wanted Troy Baker in the game. Everything about his character doesn't make sense in the context of Uncharted because he's never mentioned in the first three games. In fact, there's lots of evidence that there was no brother ever planned in the franchise prior to Uncharted 4 because characters such as uh, Marlowe who have a vested interest in bringing this information up, especially in that scene where she's revealing all of the information about Nate's life and his mother and everything. She never mentions a brother, even though she definitely would know about that if he existed at that time in the creation of the games. So he was created just for Uncharted 4 to give Troy Baker a role to play so he could stay on the payroll as far as I'm concerned. I get it. It makes sense as far as a business is concerned, but it doesn't change the fact that these roles just feel contrived in comparison. He's fine in The Lost Legacy. He's Sam Drake again. There's nothing wrong with Sam inherently, but it does feel contrived. It feels like they just wanted to get Troy Baker in another game so he could get a quick paycheck in between Uncharted 4 and The Last of Us Part Two, so that they could keep him happy at the studio and involved. And for the record, it's not just Troy Baker that Naughty Dog seems to do this with. They also seem to have done it with Laura Bailey because she's a great performer and they want to keep her very close to the studio and actively involved in all of their projects as well because they brought her in to play Nadine and, of course, Abby in The Last of Us Part Two. And there was a whole scandal, of course, when they found out that Laura Bailey was playing Nadine Ross, who is a South African uh, character with dark skin. Laura Bailey does not have dark skin, of course, so that brought up all sorts of questions. And uh, 
I, I'm not going to delve into it here just because I don't think it's the point of the video. Whatever you think of that as far as voice acting is concerned is uh, up to you and your opinion. I haven't put enough thought into it to really form an opinion myself, to be perfectly honest. But I do know that there was some heat garnered when The Lost Legacy came out and when Uncharted 4 was originally revealed to have Laura Bailey in it because the performer for Nadine is not dark skinned, but plays a dark skinned character even so. Doesn't mean that Laura Bailey is a bad actress. Quite to the contrary, she's phenomenal. I think most people who hear her voice in Uncharted as Nadine will not connect her to Abby in The Last of Us because they sound and act so differently. And that's the job of an actress. So props. But the point is, they seem to do this thing with actors that they like time and time again, where they have a performer, they want to keep them close to the studio, they want to keep them paid, healthy, and happy, so they find roles to help them out. And lastly, of course, they did it with Nolan North, who plays Nathan Drake, in between Uncharted 3 and Uncharted 4, giving him the role of David in The Last of Us as an in between those games to give him a quick paycheck to keep him healthy, happy and provided for. And I think this is part of the reason that we end up with like five actors and actresses playing 95% of the roles in this industry. And it's because the individual roles and performances don't tend to pay a whole lot, certainly not enough to like live off of for three years until you get the next project. So you end up with voice actors who are doing tons of projects and work. Um, and even then they seem desperate for money to the point where like Troy Baker will do a partnership with an NFT company for a quick paycheck, even though it will actually lead to the uh, obsolescence of his career and his work at the end of the day. It's stupid. That's beside the point. The point is it doesn't seem to pay very much. So the studios need to keep their actors and actresses that they like working with very happy and close to the studio for future big projects they're working on. So they throw them all these little bones and create roles or call them ahead of time to try and find a way that they can implement them into the game, which is exactly what happened with Nolan North in The Last of Us. Apparently, Neil Druckmann approached Nolan and said, listen, we have this, this character. Um, can you give me some voices that you might do for him? Here's what he's like. He described David, sort of this compound leader who's also willing to provide for his people however he can. Probably leads to cannibalism, but the player doesn't know that quite yet. And they workshopped voices from there until eventually Nolan provided the, the kind of soft and, and unconfident, but soft spoken and sort of Weasley voice that we ended up with as David in The Last of Us. And that worked. You got the role. All of a sudden we're good to go. So it's something they've done a lot is the point. But setting all of that aside, The Lost Legacy is a really interesting title at its core. It's just kind of weird because it started as a DLC where they could explain away and justify the lack of original content and mechanisms as, well, it's just a DLC. It's that game, but an added story to it. And that's fine. I totally understand that. But when you release it as a standalone title and treat it like a standalone title, though a cheaper one, I think people naturally will expect a little bit more. They'll expect something that involves a little bit more effort, something that brings something new to the table. And we just didn't get that with The Lost Legacy. It is through and through a continuation of everything that the first four Uncharted games did. It refuses to do anything really different. And even the final act is comprised of a few staple events from the previous games. The train sequence, the car chase sequence, big puzzles, nothing new. The narrative itself isn't particularly interesting, with Asav basically just being a big bad guy who wants to do evil things for evil reasons. He wants to rule India and is willing to do whatever it takes to accomplish that end. And while I can understand a character wanting to do that, it doesn't make them interesting. Just because you can explain it in the story doesn't mean that that thing you've crafted is interesting. It's something that so many people who I've seen in the comment section seem to completely miss and look over. It's like when I criticized the writing in Death Stranding, how certain elements of it were just bland and boring. And that was clear to see. People said, well, there's an explanation in the game's story or in the game's world for why that happened. It doesn't matter. 
If it's uninteresting, it's uninteresting. I can write a story that's perfectly justified with all these weaving motivations and intentions that's about paint drying. And that's all the story is about. It makes sense in the world. It's justified in the world I've crafted, but it's still boring. It's up to the writer to create situations that are captivating and that draw the viewer in. And if they fail at that, that's on them. It doesn't matter how well it's justified or explained in the world or if the motivations make sense or don't. If it's uninteresting, it's just uninteresting. So like I said at the very beginning, I think The Lost Legacy isn't bad. It's just okay. And in a series and a franchise that's known for pushing the boundaries and doing crazy things that nobody saw coming, that's really disappointing. Even if it is just a DLC, even if it is a spin-off that costs less, it's still disappointing. While I think it was a fun experiment, I think it was just that, an experiment. And it failed largely to demonstrate that the series can currently continue on without Nathan Drake and without any significant changes. Naughty Dog needs to take some time, probably five to 10 years off of this franchise to reevaluate and come up with what the next generation of Uncharted games really looks like and plays like. Because everything we've gotten to this point, while it's been fun, has been played out and drawn out. And I think they need to come up with something fresh. And as I said at the top, when they do so, we fans will be here eagerly awaiting and ready to play. But in the meantime, we'll just have to sit and wait for whatever comes next. And there we have it. Eight something hours later, that is the full Uncharted series critique. Hopefully you enjoyed it or got something out of it. Uh, I appreciate you watching all of this. Like I said, it's been a long time coming. We've been working on this for two years, so it's a little crazy to be done with it now. And with Naughty Dog apparently not having any plans to return to Uncharted anytime soon, this probably is the last time I'll touch Uncharted for years to come, which is bizarre. Um, but, you know, if you love something, you got to let it go eventually. So maybe it is for the best at the end of the day. I don't know. It's it's kind of conflicting because I enjoy Uncharted. But going through all of these games again for these videos, I guess, led me to shining a light on some of their eccentricities, some of their shortcomings, the things that people don't remember when they look back with rose-tinted glasses. And while I appreciate the experience of going through the games again, sometimes I do wonder if I'm asking for trouble when I go back and, and critique these games, because it does sort of spoil it. You look back on something that you remember really fondly, and then you go through it in a, a context like this or content like this, and you realize it's not as good as you remember. It has a lot of issues, and it can sort of spoil that memory to a certain extent, because you play through Uncharted 3, you remember loving it, and then you look back on it and you're like, wait, there's so many things don't make any damn sense at all, and there's so much crap in there, and same with like Uncharted The Lost Legacy or Uncharted 1 and 2, and to a certain extent, I agree that you know, what some people have said in the comments where they point out and say, well, you just got to appreciate these games for what they are. You need to not expect too much. They are junk food action uh, movie games at the end of the day, and that's all you should really expect. But, you know, it, when you recognize an issue with something, usually you can't unsee it, and that's kind of where I'm at now. I love Uncharted. I still love these games. Um, at the time I'm recording this, the film hasn't come out yet, so who knows how that'll be, though I don't have my hopes up uh, based on what I've seen so far. It just seems like Uncharted is sort of at a, a brick wall, and Naughty Dog doesn't know what to do next, Sony isn't sure what to do next, and usually that's an indication that it just needs time. It's like I said at the end of the Uncharted uh, Lost Legacy critique, I think they just need to put it on ice, wait for the technology to improve, and more importantly, wait till they get some new ideas. And I, I'm not sure if Uncharted needs a reinvention or if they just need a fresh set of eyes, I'm not sure. But, you know, they've had at this point five major releases 
And that's a good run for any franchise, whether it's a film or a novel series or video games. That's a lot. So at this point, you know, I would say Naughty Dog should continue to to sort of chill out and rest on it and reevaluate in the future. Because at this point, as bizarre as it is to say, it's already been five years, going on five years, since The Lost Legacy and six years almost since Uncharted 4. So it's been a while since they've touched the franchise. Um, but I think it's going to be another five, six years before we hear anything. They're doing this remaster collection, and I think that's their way of sort of capitalizing on the finality of the series as it stands, and they'll move on. Uh, especially because I don't think Sony would give the franchise to anybody else to do spinoffs. I think it is Naughty Dog and just Naughty Dog. And as far as we know, they are working on a new IP and on a Last of Us remaster in the meantime. So it'll be interesting to see where the series goes. But for now, I think it's probably on ice and we won't see anything more moving forward but that's just my two cents. Let me know what you thought of all of these. Let me know if you like these huge series projects and perhaps most importantly, if you have a recommendation for what series we do next, because of course we did uh, Batman Arkham. We did all of those games, did that whole series critique. And then we did this project, which has been massive. Uh, and when I started this, I mean, when I started the the whole series critique that uncharted one video i was still in college i was in my last semester of college i uh, was desperately trying to get a job in corporate finance or commercial real estate i eventually did get that job uh and i worked in that for a while but in the last few months uh you know i've i've moved to doing youtube full time i'm making more doing this um, my dream job than I even did while I was working in commercial real estate. And I'm, I'm living my dream thanks to you guys. And I'm very thankful for that. And it's, it's weird to have a project that I've been working on since that beginning point all the way through to where we are now. It, it's a little weird because I can remember making that Uncharted 1 video and where I was in life. And I, I filmed that in my college house that I had like three or four roommates in. One of them was always like living off with his girlfriend. So he was a roommate, but not really. Uh, and I can remember like the house was kind of crappy and there were huge stains on the carpets and it, it was kind of gross but it was a college house so you get over it and uh, my studio was in the corner of my bedroom I had like my desk and my computer and the cameras and lights and everything set up and then literally on the back side of the desk was my bed there was no room to walk between the two because the room was so small. Uh, and it was always so hot in there because the lights were these giant bulbous things. I have the LED panels now, which are much better, but uh, the room was always boiling. And it's just crazy to think back where we were when we started this project and to see where we are now at the end of the project. Uh, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it's been two years which is wild. A lot has happened in the last two years, but we're done with it now. We are setting Uncharted to bed and we're going to leave it probably for a while. So now it's on to the next thing. And what exactly that will be, I'm not entirely sure. I would like to try and tackle Half-Life, but what I've realized is Half-Life, for whatever reason, makes me sort of motion sick when I try to play through the original games. It's weird. I don't know why, but something about the movement it makes me motion sick when I try to play it. So I'm not sure how far into those games I will get. We'll have to evaluate that. I don't know if I'm the only one that's experienced that. I guess I'm out of luck. But if you've ever experienced that, let me know and maybe you have a, a solution. But uh, beyond that, we've talked about potentially doing the Elder Scrolls series. But of course, those are huge games and those are very difficult to tackle in any meaningful way nowadays uh because like uh, talking about Skyrim is extremely difficult because Skyrim is so many things to so many people and a lot of what it is to people isn't what it originally was meaning that through mods and through 
uh, the creation club, it, it can be almost whatever somebody wants it to be. And so when you critique the base game, people look at it and it doesn't really have a lot of weight because their experience with the game was so custom tailored through mods that your critique of what Bethesda intended the game to be isn't worth very much. So I'm not sure if we'll tackle that. I don't know if, if you are interested and you think I should tackle that, let me know in the comment section below. But I mean, those these games were like 10 to 20 hours long. Um, the early games were only like six hours long. So it was approachable to do Uncharted in a critique like this. But something on the scale of Skyrim or Oblivion is is a bigger project and that would probably take a good long while to get through but then again this is my full-time job now so it's if ever there was a time to do it this would be it uh, but i'll stop rambling at this point uh I, I will leave it there i really appreciate you guys watching if you've made it to the end of this video you are you are crazy. <laughs> you are out of your mind. Um, I really appreciate you getting all the way through this. I, I, I truly do. Um, if you made it all the way in a comment, do like hashtag I made it in, in the comment, just so I know that you made it all the way through. And I'll know that you're a, a real team player. Uh, I'll, I'll pay special attention to those comments. But Beyond that, I, I just appreciate you guys. Thank you for making this reality. Thank you for helping make this project a reality. Thank you to all of the patrons. Thank you to the sponsors who have made this uh, something viable. You guys are absolutely wonderful. And if anybody gets the reference on my shirt, we can be best friends. If you uh, if you <laughs> have been staring at my shirt, like wondering what the hell does that mean? I'm gonna man up all over myself. Uh, if you know, comment it and I'll also give you a, a like, a, a, maybe a heart. I don't know if I spotted in time. Thank you for watching. I love you all. I will see you in the next video. Again, let me know your recommendations below. Hugs and kisses. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.